to control the events of the today. Today's events would be subdivided to five sessions. Leaf plates are with you. And I heartily, uh, respectively, I welcome to Dr. V.K. Jain, sir, Professor, and Dr. Professor Atu Bhasana, sir, for chairing the, this session. Please, sir. Good morning. Uh, I welcome you all to this interesting CNE. And the first topic is a uh, very common uh, fracture we all face among pediatric age group. It's supracondylar humerus fracture. Uh, to begin the proceedings, I would call Dr. Abhishek Saha to come up and uh, has his words on supracondylar humerus fractures in children, how to avoid missing the diagnosis. Good morning, everybody, respected seniors. It's an honor to be in AIMS Cohort on your invitation for uh, presentation of this topic. And uh, before I start the presentation, I would like to stress on what exactly uh, we are trying to achieve over here. Main thing that we need to do is we have tried to keep the talk as crisp as possible for, with, because the talks are mainly targeted towards our postgraduate students and uh, senior residents and people who are into the general practice of orthopedics. So I'll start with uh, the initial uh, introduction, we all know that supracondylar fractures roughly account for 60 to 70 percent of elbow fractures in children. There's a high risk of neurovascular injury and compartment syndrome, and that is why it is imperative not to miss the diagnosis in these cases. There, are a varied, there is a varied clinical grades, and the differential diagnosis of this fracture, if I go into the details, the differential diagnosis is lateral condyle fracture, elbow dislocation and transpicial separation. I've mainly pointed out all these three fractures mainly because these are the commonest fractures which are, mic which are missed with supracondylar fracture. Now, just to put in uh, the fracture, uh, you all must have seen uh, supracondylar fractures in your practice. The lateral condyle fracture make it a point that it is mainly the tenderness on the lateral side, which is diagnostic <laughs> of a lateral condyle fracture, as well as the swelling in a supracondylar fracture is far more than what we see in a lateral condyle fracture. Elbow dislocation is very rare. So when you get a supracondylar fracture or you are suspecting an elbow or technically when you get an elbow injury in a child, don't think about elbow dislocation first of all. You should think about a supracondylar fracture. Coming to transpicial separation, this is again common in the younger age group. That is roughly one to three years of age or in the neonate or in the neonatal age group, less than one year of age. So these are the three things. We have started with the differential diagnosis. Just to put in your mind that imagine that the patient has come to you. These are the three things which should be in your mind. But since I've already mentioned the supracondylar fracture is the most common fracture. So when a, when a child comes to you with a elbow injury, the first diagnosis in your mind should be supracondylar fracture, not only because it is the commonest fracture, but also because the complications of a supracondylar fracture or the damage which a supracondylar fracture can do is far more serious than all the other fractures mentioned here, except for elbow dislocation. 
we all have gone through this image in our textbook. The, when the patient is presenting to you, these are the commonest images that we have. This is the x-ray. This is the skin condition, though it is present in severely displaced fracture like the x-ray. I have kept the x-ray by side over here just to impress on you that such kind of skin puckering or such kind of skin damage or the echinos that we see is normally seen in this type of highly displaced fractures. And we all know about the S deformity or the deformity in which it becomes very accurate. So these are the three images which should be in your mind when a patient with an elbow injury comes to you and when we are suspecting a supracondylar fracture. Now, age-wise diagnostic point, the spectrum is quite varied. It is pretty obvious to near impossible. There, there are the grade one supracondylar fracture, according to Cartland uh, classification, we have got uh, people uh, or we have got patients with, who have been missed initially and then the fracture went on to displace and the complications happen at a later date, which, uh, are, which is technically a big problem for us. Lesser the age, more difficulties are encountered. And we, once the child is of three to four years of age, we should make a persistent effort to diagnose it clinically by examining the patient. So the fat pad signs I'll be elaborating in some time and the two point sensory and dilated motor inspection should also be included, included in the diagnosis because these fractures are associated with uh, nerve injuries and vascular injuries. Now, one to three years, the uncooperative child not roughly increase the diagnosis, but we should rely on our clinical skills, tenderness around the elbow, as well as the various, uh, like we should try to take the history uh, from the parents. Transpicial separation should be in our mind, as I mentioned in my first slide, that transpicial separation, which mimics supracondylar fracture, which is commonly misdiagnosed, as a supracondylar fracture should be in mind. The treatment of a transpicial separation is a little bit different from that of the supracondylar fracture. Child abuse, yes, we should uh, also take note of that in this age group because most of the time this type of injuries happen because of fall, uh, either because of neglect from the parent or because of the child falling from the lap of the parent. Infections, yes, this is another important differential diagnosis. We have to keep this in mind as well because septic arthritis of the elbow is also a differential diagnosis in this age group. And we normally encounter the septic arthritis of the elbow in this age group more commonly than beyond three to uh, beyond the three years of age. Coming to the fat pad sign. So we are going step by step. First of all, we try to create a mental impression that what to look for without going into the x-ray and the other details. Now the diagnosis or how not to miss a diagnosis will be totally focused on the radiological science because that is the main investigation which you have in your hand when the patient presents to you in the emergency. So there's the fat pad signs. Now the main thing in the, in the fat pad sign is the anterior fat pad might be present or the anterior fat pad sign might be present in even a normal patient. That is one thing which you should keep in mind. The anterior fat pad sign is not a diagnostic feature of a elbow injury or supracondylar fracture, provided it is not well pronounced like what, what you can see over here. The main is the posterior fat pad sign. In case of elbow injuries, you will always get a very prominent posterior fat pad sign. This is the thing which you should look in a supracondylar fracture. So here you can see that the anterior fat pad sign is also visible. As well as you can see the posterior fat pad sign also to be present. So this is pathognomonic of a elbow injury, most likely to be a type 1 supracondylar fracture. If there is no fracture line visible. One of my cases, as you can see over here, the AP x ray does not look much sinister. But in the lateral view, you can make out that the fat pad sign, both the sides, is prominently, and you also have a small chip over here, 
Had the chip not been there, it would have been a little bit more difficult to diagnose this fracture as a type 1. I'll not go into the treatment and other part of it. I've kept it for Dr. Faisal will be pre presenting that when he starts the CRPP, so I've kept it for him. But these things are normally treated with bracing. Coming to the, according to me, the most important diagnostic point or the most important uh, diagnostic criteria in a supracondylar fracture, which is the anterior humeral line. Now, in as you can see, the anterior humeral line over here should transverse the mid, middle one third of the capital. Less than four years, it can be a little bit more anterior, a little bit more posterior. But in after the age of four, roughly, it becomes very uh, diagnostic feature, which uh, is uh, technically the it should uh, pass through the middle one third of the capitulum in this age group. So this is the first case. Now in this case, we can see that if we have a look over here in the lateral X-ray, we can see that the anterior humeral line is not passing through the capitulum at all. So this is an extension type of injury. The anterior humeral line not only helps us in diagnosis, diag uh, diagnosing the commonest variety of supracondylar fracture, which is the extension type. Here you can make out that we have the flexion type of supracondylar injury. It's a little bit older child. We can see the majority part of the uh, capillum going a little bit more anterior. So it helps us in diagnosing that fracture as well. I've uh, intentionally omitted the operative pictures. We did put some of reducing it, we did put gave us this was the final image that we got. The other angle uh, also helps in diagnosis which is the Bowman's angle and uh, the uh, no humeral angle. Now the Bowman's angle has got a far more important role in the treatment. Once we have fixed the fracture, then the Bowman's angle is far more important because we always try to restore the Bowman's angle post fixation but it also helps us in the diagnosis. So this is now coming to some of the cases. We have the low supracondylar fractures. This is again a young age group, roughly around two and a half to three years. We have the displacement, which we could see over here. So kindly appreciate that uh, here the Bowman's angle is totally disrupted. a little older case again we can see over here that the there's overriding of the fragments and the bowman's angle is totally disrupted so this is actually a way to diagnose the fracture because in a way if you have a proper understanding of the bowman's angle then you can definitely uh, assess the so how would you please sum up fast yeah one minute sure so this is again, Bowman's angle was restored. So we continued with the conservative uh, management and the, the grossly displaced fracture, which we see in supracondyla in the cases, again, the Bowman's angle is disrupted. Treatment also becomes easier with this parameters in mind. Other, ima other imaging modalities that we have, roughly uh, the oblique views, I would discourage that because you will displace the fracture even more if you take, try to take an oblique view. A lot of the people, they suggest that you should take an oblique view just to assess in the absence of an MRI or a CT scan. MRI, yes, sometimes in type of fractures like the flexion type of deformity that I saw, showed it's essential to have a uh, fracture uh, to, to get an MRI just to assess. And also in case of when we are suspecting a neurovascular uh, injury, then to assess the vascular vascularity, it might be essential to get an MRI. CT scan is absolutely not indicated and angiography and Doppler for assessing the vascularity is uh, indicated case by case basis. Open fractures are also there. And uh, I think these things are very obvious rather than uh, talking about it because we can easily see the amount of displacement and these are open fractures again in case. So I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Desert now. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sir. You have nicely stressed on pet pet signs. Supracondylar fracture wounds, occult fractures. Now I would uh, invite Dr. Faisal for close reduction percutaneous spinning in such fractures. How do he does?
how does he do to kindly stick to time oh, honorable director sir a respected head of department my seniors and my dear colleagues a very good morning to all of you uh, today i'll be speaking on the close reduction and percutaneous spinning for fracture supracondylar humerus how do i do it so before moving to the main topic i'll i would like to give a brief introduction about uh, fracture supracondylar humerus which is the most common elbow fractures in children and most commonly it occurs in 5 to 7 years of age uh, extension type uh, the mechanism of injury is fall on outstretched hand and uh, flexion type direct blow to the elbow uh, occurs due, uh, and it leads to flexion type of injuries so moving on to the pediatric supracondylar humerus fractures which is the most common surgical pediatric fracture which frequently requires surgical treatment uh, to avoid complications and displaced fractures are unstable and they require reduction and stabilization to heal in appropriate ligament alignment so broadly it has been divided into two major types the first being the extension which is the most common and it is uh, around 95 to 98% and the flexion type is uncommon which occurs in 2 to 4% it has been divided into gartland classification type 1 being undisplaced which is uh, treated by just simple immobilization and a long arm cast is given for 3 to 4 weeks type 2 there is sagittal angulation but the posterior hinge is intact and it can be uh, diagnosed by the anterior humeral line which has been mentioned by my colleague type 3 is complete posterior displacement there is loss of posterior hinge and in type 4 there is instability in extension and flexion and there is disruption of the post uh, periosteal sleeve so this is a uh, tubular representation of uh, the basic treatment which is uh, done according to the type in type 1 the uh, uh, type 1 only long arm cast is required for 3 to 4 weeks in type 2 coronal if there is coronal or ang uh, rotational angulation then it is type 2b and crpp is uh, um, required and in type 2a if the anterior humeral line in intersects the capitulum a long arm a long arm cast is applied for 3 to 4 weeks and the patient is kept on close follow up and if the anterior humeral line does not intersect the capitulum the patient is kept on a close follow up and uh, later on if uh, the displacement occurs uh, again close reduction and percutaneous spinning will be required and in type 3 and type flexion type close reduction or open reduction is required so the timing of operative treatment basically depends upon the uh, fracture pattern and the displacement the distal neurovascular status neurologic function distal to the fracture the soft tissue swelling and any associated fractures type 2a type 2s can be safely treated as outpatients in a delayed manner and type 3 should be admitted for monitoring if the surgery is delayed so now moving on to the main topic which is the close reduction and percutaneous spinning technique first of all the or setup should be suffice there should be a proper c arm or an arm board and uh, in inward inversion of the cm should be avoided as it increases it increases the radiation doses and the patient has to be placed uh, over a lead apron so starting with the close reduction the first step is longitudinal traction is given to reestablish the length with or without the milking maneuver and then sequentially rotation and coronal plane uh, correction and the sagittal plane correction is done uh, which i'll be discussing in the later slides in detail so this is a uh, uh, this this sign is uh, called as the brachialis sign which occurs due to the impingement of uh, brachialis muscle uh, over the proximal fragment of the uh, uh, of the supra, of the supracondylar humerus fracture and post reduction it disappears so there is a rule of uh, thumb in which uh, the thumb points in the direction of uh, initial displacement of the distal segment so some papers say that if the if the displacement is posterior medial the uh, uh, the the uh, forearm should be uh, kept in pronation uh, in pronation it tightens the medial soft tissue sleeve and the vice versa is uh, for the posterior lateral fragment in difficult type of close reductions uh, the uh, uh, the elbow should be kept stable and the cm should be uh, rotated uh, in the uh, uh, direction where the where the image is required 
and joystick pins are used in the distal fragment to help and to help the control and to manipulate the fragments so uh, as my colleague spoke about the acceptable alignment there are basically four parameters first being the anterior humeral line which should in intersect with the capitulum the second is the baumann's angle which after re reduction should be more than 10 degrees and third and fourth being the medial and the lateral pillar both the medial and lateral pillar should be intact so ideally uh, uh, what the uh, authors have advised is that one point minimum k wire should be of 1.6 mm to 2 mm both the columns should be engaged that is either that is the lateral and medial columns and uh, the pins should be uh, applied in a divergent fashion the greater the, the pin spread the greater the stability so the pin construct should be spread wide uh, at the fracture site and both columns should be controlled the lateral column is controlled with the pin along the metaphyseal flare and the medial column control is with the lateral base pin and after after putting two pins the uh, uh, the uh, construct is checked in the ap and lateral views if the construct is found to be stable then the third pin is not required so after the stable reduction and pinning we do the ap and lateral views and uh, uh, if required we go for stress views otherwise uh, in all the cases stress views are not required if the reduction is uh, found to be stable Uh, unattempted repeated stress views are not required so the post op care is uh, uh, in the type 2 the patient is can be treated as outpatient in type 3 monitor monitoring is required for 12 to 24 hours neurovascular frequent neurovascular examinations should be done and compartment should be checked so uh, i now i'm going to demo demonstrate the uh, a case of a 7 year old male patient who presented to us with fracture supracondylar humerus So this is the general setup of OT in which the patient is placed supine uh, with a board and a proper functioning CM is also is a, is the main essential for performing close reduction and percutaneous pinning. So the first step is uh, uh, the longitudinal traction uh, is given uh, in which the counter traction is provided given against the axilla and first the alignment uh, is done in the AP view. so after applying the longitudinal traction for few minutes uh, check the ap view uh, in which uh, 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 the um, uh, to see that the fragment is uh, reduced in the coronal plane so also check for the uh, 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 the posterior medial and the posterior lateral cortex whether they are intact or not and if the posterior if, if the if the chunk is on the posterior posterior medial aspect or the posterior lateral aspect the opposite pressure is applied to the elbow while the Uh, uh, while the limb is placed in extension so after satisfactory alignment in the ap view now we move on to the uh, lateral view and check the jones view and see the displacement in the sagittal plane so the first picture which uh, from the left side we can see that the fragment is uh, 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 still unreduced so what we do is that in uh, uh, in um, the elbow in flexion only we try to align the views by Uh, uh medial or lateral displacement so after uh, after correction of the medial and lateral displacement we again see the views in the jones view and the lateral view the reduction as looks uh, uh fine so now we move on to the next step that is the pinning technique pinning methods of medial or lateral entry pins so to maintain reduction uh, we can either put a uh, put uh, do a taping around the uh, elbow or we can place a towel beneath the elbow so the acceptable parameters as i mentioned is the baumann's angle the anterior humeral line and the intact medial and lateral columns now moving on to the pinning technique first first and foremost multiple entry pins should be avoided the lateral pin insertion should be done the preferred uh, technique for crpp is to uh, to put two lateral k wires so the first k wire should be held against the lateral condyle and the trajectory should be checked in the ap and the lateral views once two pins has been applied check the coronal alignment by extending the elbow and if the reduction is found to be unstable then pass another pin so uh, engage sufficient bone in both the proximal and the distal fragment the uh, the proper method is that first the first pin should cross uh, the fracture medial to the olecranon the second pin should cross the fracture lateral to the olecranon fossa and if required for additional stability third pin can be crossed through the fossa 
which provides four to four cortex pro purchase. Then reduced capitulum normally lies anterior to the plane of the fracture and the pins should always be slightly anterior and it should be angulated 10 to 15 degrees posteriorly. So now uh, moving on to the medial pin. Medial pin is only used when there is inadequate stability or if there is a medial oblique fracture. Uh, normally how, do, how I perform is that I give a small stab hole and pass a fine artery forcep up to the bone. The elbow is extended and then K wire is placed. And uh, it is advised to be slightly anterior if possible while advancing the medial K wire. Then check the AP and lateral views again. Now, what are the things that needs to be avoided while pinning? So, inadequate number of pins should not be there. The pins should not be thin. Uh, Bicortical purchase should be achieved. The pin spread should not be poor. The pin uh, avoid pin convergence and pin crossing. So, a tip to uh, make the pins uh, in a divergent fashion is that you you try to cross the K wires outside itself. Once the K wire has been crossed outside then, then uh, automatically the pins will diverge inside. Then after the, uh, after uh, putting the K wires, assess the stability, uh, check the stress, uh, check the reduction in stress views, check the vascularity and apply a cast in 60 to 70 degrees of elbow flexion. Uh, at follow-up, normally pin removal requires three to four weeks. Frequency of the follow-up is variable according to the surgeon or the fracture type and post-pin removal radiographs may not provide clinical utility in the absence of any other clinical finding. Uh, thank you. We'll have question answers up after the next session, after the next uh, speaker is done with. Uh, we all have come across many cases in which we have blanching present in the nail bed, but the pulse is not palpable. That is a pink pulse, pulseless hand. Now I invite a debate uh, on this, whether to wait or operate immediately for vascular injuries. Dr. Karthik would be uh, in favor of waiting in such cases, whereas Dr. Ritesh Pandey would be speaking uh, on uh, immediate surgery. So good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, Honorable Director Sir, Professor Brihan and Dr. Pratik for giving this opportunity. So it is a very interesting topic. So it is a uh, pink pulseless hand, but I want to use the word it is a perfused pulseless hand. I want to talk in favor of watchful way. So nothing to disclose. So when you look at this x-ray, it is a Gotland type 3 presenting with absent distal pulses. So how will we proceed? So you have to look at clinically. So you have to look out initial assessment. You have to look at clinically whether there's a skin puckering or ecchymosis is present because the proximal uh, fragment spike pierces the brachialis muscle and causes hemorrhage. That may be cause for impending compartment syndrome. So you should suspect compartment syndrome when you see ecchymosis also. So you look at this diagram. Here the median nerve and brachial artery are tethered by the proximal spike, proximal fragment spike. When you look at the diagram on the right side, this is a posterolateral displacement. Uh, it's a posterolateral type of supraconjunctival structure where the proximal spike is moving anteromedially and it causes injuring the median nerve and the brachial artery that are run very close to each other. So you have to look at the neurological status also. So complete motor and sensory examination. So Mangat et al. told if you are having coexisting anterior intracess nerve or median nerve injury, there is a more it is a more predictive of nerve or vessel entrapment. So angiography it is not routinely recommended. It is only time wasting. So the site of vascular injury is obvious, it is at the fracture site, so there is no need for protein angiography. So what do you have to do in the emergency room? First you have to apply the slab in slight traction in 30 to 40 degree of flexion. Apply only loose bandages, don't immobilize more than 90 degree because it may cause compartment syndrome and further compromise the vascularity. So this is a case of uh, supraconjunctivitis type 3 with vascular injuries, you take into OR and you fix with lateral K wires. So then you check for the pulse. So you wait for 10 to 15 minutes, whether if the pulse comes, it is well and good. In our, around 50 to 60 percent of the case, usually the pulse returns. But if the pulse didn't return, you have to look for the hand perfusion. So how you should look for hand perfusion? You got to look at the color by means of pink or it's pale. Whether it is the temperature is warm or not, capillary refill time is less than 3 seconds or more than 3 seconds. You can use the SPO2 oximetry. You have to look at the pulse form and the amplitude of the waveform. If you are having handheld Doppler, you can use the Doppler signals also. 
So if the pulse comes, it's very good. If the pulse doesn't come, you have to look at the, whether it is a pale hand or pink hand, perfused hand. If it is a pale hand, you have to explore. If it is a perfused hand, it is there's a no clear consensus. You have to decide whether you want to explore or not explore. So I want to talk in favor of which, which watchful expectancy. You have to wait, observe the patient. So you would look at the angiogram. Although you are not doing your angiogram routinely, but if you look, look at the angiogram, how beautifully the distal reformation is because of the rich collateral around the elbow, because of anastomosis between the profunda brachii, recurrent, uh, radial recurrent, and ulnar recurrent arteries. So there are multiple papers published. So this is the paper, uh, current parts of review by David Skats and Ronald B. Cruz from USA. Another is a systematic review that is published in Annals of Vascular Surgery. Another is a, another paper published in the Journal of Orthopedics by Sanjeev Sabarwalbu. So they are talking about the treatment algorithm for how will you manage a pink uh, vas supracranial humerus fracture with a vascular injury. So vascular injury is uh, the vascular compromise is comprised of into three to nineteen percent of the small supracranial humerus fractures. It is it, the characteristics of vascular injury may be a simple spasm or kinking, or sometimes it can be complete transection or thrombosis because of the intimal tear. Sometimes it may be entrapped within the fracture sites. So well perfused persons. Well perfused pink hand it is a controversy whether you want to wait or you want to explore immediately. So are the collaterals sufficient to explore or not? So we have to talk. There are two schools of thought to explore or not. So watchful wait and see because of the rich collaterals around the elbow, there is no need to explore in all the cases. So you have to look for the perfusion by means of uh, capillary refill time used to SPO2 probe and the temperature of the hand. So sometimes in 50 to 60 percent of the cases, the pulse returns within 10 to 15 minutes. So there are papers suggesting there may be a chance of re-occlusion even after vascular injury repair. Like if you do grafting or you do end-to-end -end repair, there's a chance of 50 to 60 percent cases there will be re-occlusion or there's a formation of aneurysm following repair also. There's a limited clinical evidence of long-term sequel. So Sabarwal et al. tell in 6 out of 13 patients, they had brachial or stenosis or re in their long-term follow-up. Another is Constantinuk et al. they're telling in the 14-year follow-up, they had 7 cases out of 10 had aneurysm following the vascular intervention. So why you want to explore? But the people that are standing in the opposite side, they want to explore, they are telling the points favor of exploration. You are missing the opportunity to re-establish it. And there's a long-term sequelae, although it is not proven. The long-term sequelae are not proven. So this is a level one systematic review done by Delnoitis in the annual, this is published in the Annal of Vascular Surgery. They told that in a well perfused pink hand, the traditional dogma of watchful weight should not be revisited as long as no signs of deterioration of the vascular status is appears. There is no need to intervene if the hand is well perfused. This is another paper that is published in 2021 in the BMC Vasculature Center that also tells if the hand is well perfused, surgical exposure is not necessary as long as the hand is warm and well perfused. You have to observe for next 40 to 70 hours. So, what is watchful way? What do you mean by watchful way? So, you have to do continuous serial examinations in your ward. So, you have to monitor. It is not like that you are operating and you are going out, you are not observing at all. You have to do monitor regularly. You have to look for the temperature, you have to look for the capillary refill time, you have to look for the SPO2 waveform. And if you are having handheld temper, you can use that also. There is a signal suppression or not. So in children, the in adults, you will have five Ps for looking for the compartment syndrome. But in the children, it is three A's. It is an increased anxiety, agitation, and increased requirement of analgesics. So you have to feel for the tense of the compartment and you have to look for these signs. So be aware in kids with medial palsy. Why in medial palsy? Because in medial palsy, there's a sensory component is also involved. So if the patient is having sensory component involved, the patient, the child may not manifest the pain. So you have to, at that time, you have to feel the compartment and you have to use the SPO2 probe, something like that. So in anterior intracellular nerve palsy, it's a pure motor branch, sensory will be preserved. But in medial nerve injury, the sensory component along with the motor component will go. So the pain perception will be less. So you should be very aware in cases of coexisting medial nerve injury with the vascular injury. So this is an algorithm. So if, if your patient comes to with the pulses hand, you have to apply in a slight traction, apply 30 to 40 degree. Remember, don't attempt any reduction. Just apply in a slight traction in 30 to 40 degree of flexion. So if the pulse returns, it's well and good. If the pulse is not returned, if it is a pale hand, you have to immediately explore, you get the vascular consolation. But most of the time, it will be a perfused hand. So you have to observe and watch, watchful wait for another 48 hours. So how do you observe? You observe me, I already told you how to look at the compartment, you have to look at the capillary refill time, you have to use the SPO2 probe and you have to use the handheld doppler. So during the observation time, if the child develops some signs of impending compartment syndrome, like three years, or there is a deterioration in perfusion, you have to get immediate vascular consultation and if required, you have to go for vascular exploration if the deterioration occurs. So what about long-term concerns? Some people will talk about long-term concerns like growth retardation, or there is an exercise or cold intolerance or autonomic dysfunctions. So what the literature says, 
This is an E4 review. What it told is Parmana et al. reviewed 14 adults with a 14 year follow up. They are telling with no difference in grip strength, capillary refill, wrist brachial index, and length of the arm and circumference. And the radial pulse was present in all these patients. So, in the literature, also it varied from 80 to 90 percent after one year follow up, the radial pulse comes back. So, we are also doing a study in our institute. So, we are comparing the patients retrospective study, comparing the patients, those who underwent uh, vascular intervention and those who didn't underwent vascular intervention. We also found no difference because in all the patients, the radial pulse returns after one and a half years follow. So, this is a case example of three-year-old child having pink pulseless hand. We taken it to war immediately and she fixed with cross caver because it was unstable only with the lateral caver. And it was managed conservatively with the watchful expectancy. We didn't intervene vascularly. So after three years of follow, now the child is six years old. After three years of follow, we took the color Doppler, and you can see there's a triphasic flow. Although the PSV is less on the left side, the left side is the injured side, but it is triphasic. And you have to look at the temperature difference. If you talk about autonomic destruction, your temperature difference. Here it is similar. You're using the infrared camera. You can see the temperature difference on the opposite side is more or less same. And there is no cold intolerance or excess induced intolerance. So the pulses is palpable, although the volume is less. The patency is present and it is a triphasic work form in this child. So we look at the exercise induced intolerance by measuring the brachial wrist brachial index. We ask the child to have a smiley ball and ask to squeeze for 10 minutes. We measure the brachial index before exercise and after exercise. The value more than 0.8 is normal. So here the child comes, it is more than one in both the sides. So there is no exercise induced intolerance after a long term follow up also. So you want to look at the grip strength by means of dynamometer up to 14 kg this child is able to perform bilaterally. And there is no growth disturbances in means of length and circumference. So the child is asymptomatic and there is no proven long-term sequel. So my conclusion is distal perfusion is the main designing factor rather than the severity of vascular injury, whether it is a transaction, whether it is a spasm, whatever may be. So you have to look at the distal perfusion, that is the main designing factor. When the cases with associated medial injury, yes, you can manage conservatively, but you should be more vigilant. Every case of pink pulseless hand doesn't require vascular intervention. It should be individualized approach based upon the treatment algorithm. So watchful eye, observe for signs of compartment syndrome and vascular deterioration for the next 24, 48 to 72 hours before discharging the patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karthi. Now I invite Dr. Vitesh Pandey. A very good morning to all. At the outset, I thank Ajay sir, Rehan sir, Dr. Pratik, and the whole organizing team for having me here. I will be speaking in the favor of early vascular exploration for a case of pink pulseless hand. And Karthik is a very a good friend of mine and uh, he is very academic and uh, I knew that he will present a lot of papers in his support. But Life is beyond expectations and what Karthik is suggesting is that to do nothing and to expect that everything will be fine. And this may lead to disappointments both for the patients as well as the physicians. And hence I object against observing these cases. And I will prove my arguments by uh, discussing the disadvantages of observation and monitoring and then the advantages of exploration. So let's come to the first point. Most of these studies which support conservative treatment, they are retrospective in nature and they lack proper validation. And the definition of pink is also not very clear uh, regarding how much pink should be considered as a normal thing. The studies mainly comment on the return of palpable pulse and capillary refill, but they lack comment on the long-term functional outcomes and the lack comment on long-term objective assessment of the vascularity. Also, these are some questions which are not answered yet in literature, like what is critical ischemia? How do you define it? And how do you determine it? Then the term deterioration is also not very clear, like how much deterioration will uh, suggest you to go for exploration on a timely basis? And when to discontinue the monitoring and declare that it is safe now? This uh, study has tried to make the things a bit simpler by suggesting some of the indications for vascular exploration when the child is undergoing observation for a pink pulseless hand. 
and if you can see all these indications are subjective and not very clear also in a dark skin child it may be difficult to differentiate a pink hand from an essential vascular injury pink hand doesn't uh, guarantee us about the long term outcomes the return of pulse is mainly dependent on presence of rich collaterals but this collaterals may itself be variable and unreliable so what i want to say that a pink pulseless hand is a compromised state somewhere between complete ischemia and complete recovery and it has its own implications for example in this study two children out of 20 who were undergoing observation they needed subsequent vascular exploration but what is more confirming is sorry what is more confirming is this patient who was discharged and later on presented in the opd with circumferential skin necrosis and a vic this is another long term outcome study which followed these patients for around 15 years and 22 patients who had undergone observation they all had signs of a vic and later needed surgery for the correction of the deformity another issue is that as a treating physician we are mostly unaware of the real scenarios and its gravity so this is a study which compared the actual figures from the literature and compared it with the response given by the posna members and you can see there is big there is big disparity between the figures and i'm sure if a similar study is carried out in india similar figures will come out the concomitant nerve involvement is also very common and it needs uh, exploration otherwise it is going to cause long term neurological issues it is also known that a compromised vascularity can lead to poor limb development and shortening in a growing child and cases of late uh, pseudoaneurysm from the brachial arteries uh, has been reported in literature so how will we explain all these things who will be answerable to all these long term complications in today's world of litigations and which could have been avoided by a timely surgical intervention so these are the uh, types of uh, vascular injuries which have been reported in literature and in most of the cases it is a simple entrapment of vessel between the fracture ends and and exploration can restore the vascularity immediately so why to depend on the collaterals and remain in uncertainty so i support exploration of the neurovascular structures and appropriate intervention can be done depending on the type of the vascular injuries you are facing and it is uh, fairly supported by the literature like uh, in this study the five children who underwent uh, vascular exploration all had a normal neurological and vascular status at the end of one year this is another study the children were followed for around 14 years and all 12 had a patent vascular reconstruction and equal limb length and there are many more similar studies which support early vascular intervention for a pink pulseless hand so to, to conclude <laughs> i support early vascular intervention as it restores the vascularity immediately and takes out of the uncertain uh, situations it avoids long term complications and it is more justified for the medical legal issues thank you very much thank you dr nitesh uh, we have two senior orthopedic surgeons in the hall they are currently directors of their own institutes right now and they are i think they have much more experience in dealing with pediatric orthopedic i would like to have their experience in in managing supracondylar fracture humerus uh, since uh, they are more experienced we would be enlightened by their experience just half of minute uh, may i request dr ajay singh sir and dr jitin shukla sir later on uh, thank you very much sir uh, i think uh, all the three uh, all the four uh, speaker were excellent and they have presented their views and uh, nothing more i want to add uh, but i want to this debate is very interesting but uh, uh, as per my opinion this is not the debate where 
there are definitive indications when the exploration should be done. Nobody is saying that exploration should not be done. Nobody is saying that totally we have to wait. There are certain indication and parameters. We have to define those parameters. And as per the parameters, we have to wait and wait the watchful wait, wait for 48 hours. If there is no deterioration, no, uh, there is uh, no development of uh, uh, compartments in you know, that uh, uh, 48 hours means after the manipulation, if the limb was initially was pulseless and uh, it was uh, not well perfused, but after the manipulation, it has become uh, perfused, well perfused. And well perfused does not mean the pink in color. It is it is the uh, pulse oximetry which is now is uh, one of the very solid parameter, and it is the triphasic wave that is that is more important rather than the oxygen concentration. So the triphasic phase is there, and it, if there is no sign of uh, uh, if uh, the compartment syndrome, so I strongly feel uh, that we should wait and uh, only after if deterioration is there just. For the sake of obtaining the vessel does not uh, justify our uh, intervention. That is my opinion and I follow that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shukla, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vashen, for involving us in the discussion part of it. And uh, I have, uh, I will start by commenting on the CRPP by Dr. Fraser. Uh, Dr. Faisal was talking about reduction of the supracondyl fracture. So one point uh, which I would like to suggest, when you are giving the traction for reduction of supracondyl fracture, it has to be given in line of the deformity rather than do not overextend the elbow at the time of reduction. One. Second is when you have once achieved the length, the distal to medial manipulation that you advise should not be done in flexion, it should be done in extension. Because in flexion you are locking that fragment, then this displacement will the correction will not be possible. That is what I think. Maybe you can support your views, but that is what I think. Second, I would like to ask your question. I ask you a question. When you go for three pin fixation from the lateral side, and when you go from median and lateral one pin fixation. If the concept first, first and foremost, I, I try to achieve the correction by two lateral pins. And if the if the uh, construct I find uh, the construct to be stable, then I leave it. And if the construct is unstable, or if there is a medial wall combination, then I go for a medial pin. But medial wall combination is obvious to you even on X-rays prior to taking in for the reduction. And so, at all in all cases, you have three pins. In May I ask uh, all the speakers to please come forward? So, sir, you may continue. If, if, uh, uh, sir, you allow me. Uh, I want to intervene that uh, uh, now the evidences are very strong in favor of two lateral pins in an uncomplicated supracondylar uh, And when we are talking about two uh, two pins, means one pin should be central, involving the co four cortex, and only then and other thing he has already mentioned that it, it should be spanning, fanning out in the both direction should be, and the, the second pin should be involving the at least two cortex. Only then the fixation is good. Biomechanical studies are enough there which suggest that the if these parameters are met, then no need of three lateral pins are required. The two are good enough. As far as the medial pinning is concerned, as Dr. Fazal has, I think I agree with that idea that if there is a commission, and you are very right, the communication, a commission you can see uh, on your plain x ray. So if you are able to see the commission, then you have to go for uh, medial uh, pinning. But otherwise, biomechanically, there are no indication for unless until it's a higher supracondylar. If it's a higher supracondylar, then you you may 
uh, fix the lateral column, medial column, and the central uh, involving the four pins. Otherwise, uh, two pins are good enough in a classical supracondylar uh, numerus. As far as now coming to the debate, uh, so uh, I think uh, I would also like to I would also like to opt for wait and watch. And unless uh, you have some, uh, as Dr. Pandey has said, some other signs, and then you can always go for an exploration of the vessel. Nerve injury, median nerve injury associated with uh, the pulseless hand, more chances of exploration, that is what I think. And uh, uh, thirdly, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Karthik, is there any range when you are monitoring the SpO2? Is there any range which you will say it is acceptable? Is acceptable? That is more it is subjective only. The amplitude of the waveform. Please just uh, look at the amplitude of the waveform. There is no written criteria exactly, but you should look at the amplitude of the waveform. That is, if the amplitude is good, then it's okay. If the amplitude is poor, the graph the amplitude. Then it is a concern. As such, there is no range like 93%, 95%, above 95% or below 95%. No, you are talking about the saturation value, sir. Saturation value. SPO2. 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 Sir, it is uh, more than 90%. It's okay. But I am more concerned about the amplitude rather than the saturation. Okay. Thank you. It is not only uh, it is not only the, uh, the, the uh, height of the wave. It is the biphasic pattern. If it is not biphasic pattern, then it is... Yes, that is in Doppler. That is, that is in Doppler. Yes, so sir. that is more important. Even in pulse oximeter, you have the wave pattern. It has to be the wave pattern. And exactly. If, amplitude. Yeah. So that is that wave uh, pattern is more important to observe rather than going for, because there are many factors which will influence uh, your uh, oxygen concentration, uh, such as the temperature and other factors, the apprehension, even the apprehension will decrease uh, the vaso, will do the peripheral vasoconstriction. So that is not the criteria of doing it. It is, it is the, it is the pattern of the wave, which is, which is more important. So I suggest to have a handheld doctor, you can purchase some handheld doctor, it will be really yeah. hand, handy to use. And uh, secondly, I would like to ask whether, uh, this thing I wanted to ask Dr. Vitesh that, in the meantime, can I that, uh, that the pulse which returns, the pulse which returns after some time in a pink uh, pulseless hand, after reduction even, or after your repair even, is it due to the collaterals or is it really the bounding pulse? Again, you have to take color doctor and find the dry physics that are not written in water. So most of the time it is an arterial spasm. So uh, because of the main vessel, the pulse returns not because of collaterals, that because of the flow through the main vessel itself. Most of the time, it will get arterial spasm. So, if the spasm goes out after the once the fracture is reduced, maybe after 50, you wait for 15 to 20 minutes, in 50 to 60 percent comes. So, to answer your question, it is the flow through the main vessel rather than the collaterals, because immediate pulse return is due to the main vessel flow, not because of the collaterals. Not the vessel, the vessel which is commonly injured, the pattern is the intimal uh, damage. That is the most that causes the spasm. So even if when the spasm is over, the damage is always there. So what he uh, he present you presented or he presented that uh, in a long term pattern there will be the the pulse will be feeble. It it will not be it may volume, not volume be, is less. Yeah, volume will be less. But so that that is not the criteria. That is not the criteria. It is the extent of the capillary circulation which is more important so to add on to the point if after intimate tear there will be late onset thrombus the thrombus may develop after 20 48 hours or so so you should be very careful that's why 48 hours are yeah. very very critical to okay. find out any 3a uh, is is there or not what do you say after that the collaterals will develop during that 48 hours and the flow will be there hey, the collaterals are already there sir the collaterals are already there and is there so I am telling most of the time the collateral, the hand, I am not using the word pink, I am already already using the word perfused hand. So the hand perfuse is the criteria. If the pulse comes, the arterial spasm is relieved. So the patency of the vessel had improved. 
So, but it takes time. It case to case, case to case basis. It may vary. Later, the pulse can go away with the thrombus if there is formation of thrombus in the vessel. It can. If the you are telling the pulse comes immediately because of the intimate layer later on the thrombus, then it, then it can go. Theoretically, away. it is likely, sir. But the hand will be again be perfused because of the collateral. So, we are con concerned about the perfusion of the hand rather than this. In, in presence of good collateral, the the the, the thrombus will be bypassed. So sometimes even the proximal uh, collateral will bypass the thrombus. So it is not necessary. If thrombus is there, then you will not get a good yeah. quality. Because the anastomosis is higher above the profunda brachia yeah. with the radial and ulnar yeah. artery. So, so it is way higher. Above. It will it will uh, maintain and bypass the thrombus. Second question I want to ask is uh, while you are pinning, suppose you have pinned the uh, fracture, that will you which you see internal rotation one or external rotation or both. So if it is a stable, I will do external rotation. Otherwise, I will move. If it is unstable pattern, I will move the CR and see that is the best. This being very because common. the problem is if you rotate, most of the people rotate the forearm. You don't rotate the humerus. That is a, the what the mistake you see. What you see? Well, I will I will rotate the humerus along with this, not just rotating this because it will pass straight over the fixation. So that is the most common mistake that people do. Just rotating the distal lever arm. This being that a common topic, like. I'm sure there will be a lot many questions which we can discuss during uh, tea and other uh, time during lunch or tea. I would now uh, I would now invite Dr. Amol to be Priya for uh, his case. Thank you. We, we can have further discussion over the case also. Sir, so before and that, I would, uh, I would like to make it clear that uh, don't get confused with the debate. I totally agree with uh, uh, the opinion of the house and Dr. Kartik that surgical exploration is not needed in every case and the first step should be observation if everything looks okay and based on the defined indications we should go ahead and do the exploration if needed thank you very much uh, one more from the uh, suggestion to the organizer that we must encourage our pgs and the other delegate for the discussion because delegate uh, this discussion should not be from our, our side but from the uh, so, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Honorable Director Sir, Rehan Sir, and Pratik Sir for giving this opportunity. So, starting with the case. A child was born by complex vaginal delivery, which required traction for extraction of the baby at a hospital in periphery of MP. On day two, the obstetrician noticed swelling over the right elbow and decreased movement of the right upper extremity. So they sought opinion by an orthopedic surgeon. So on the second day of birth, after examination by the orthopedic surgeon, the standard X-ray was done, they pain lateral use. So in this X-ray, we can see some abnormality over the elbow. So anyone from the delegates would like to make a diagnosis? Anyone? Okay, uh, so uh, we can see that the normal anatomy of the elbow is distorted and uh, there is a history of trauma, but trauma. So if no one <laughs> is ready. Yeah, people should get involved. It was already mentioned in my lecture. Uh, yeah, please suggest a diagnosis. Any of you. Okay, very good. Anyone would like to give another diagnosis? Let it be wrong, but make a yes. Okay. Why it is not elbow dislocation? It's dry because the oscillation center we have not developed at uh, birth. So we can also make a differential diagnosis of uh, elbow dislocation as well as a transpicing fracture dislocation. 
So the treating surgeon was also not experienced in the pediatric cases. He misdiagnosed it as a case of elbow dislocation. And as per the uh, child's parents, uh, after close reduction of the elbow, uh, the surgeon applied an avulbus step. However, he made a mistake here that he didn't get a check X-ray done after slab application. He advised the patient to continue slab and to follow after two weeks. So after two weeks of birth, the slab was removed and fresh X-ray was done. So now we can see that the still the normal uh, anatomy of the elbow is not retained. We can see that the proximal end of both radius and arna are shifted medially and have migrated proximally. Also, we can see some periosteal reaction around the elbow. So now he realized his mistake that it is not a case of elbow dislocation, rather it was a case of transphysical separation of distal humerus. So he then referred the patient to higher center. So for my uh, young uh, friends, just a glimpse of transphysical separation. This is a diagrammatic illustration of the transphysical injury. Uh, the physial portion of the distal humerus is the weakest part and the uh, uh, bird trauma can lead to this physial separation. And the key to diagnosis is the alignment of radius with the capital M. The physis at this time is cartilaginous, so we cannot see in the plain X-ray. So for a confirmation of diagnosis, we'll have to use additional imaging modalities like USG, MRI and arthrography. So we all know that USG is a simple non-invasive and easily available tool. And uh, for diagnosis, uh, a skilled radiologist should be involved in this and it can be done without sedation, but usually it is uncomfortable for the patient to manipulate the limb. So here we can see that this uh, starting with the normal side, the capital M and the humerus is aligned. But in this case, the humerus and capitulum is not lined and radius and rather radius and capitulum is aligned. Uh, second imaging modality is the MRI. It is the most accurate examination. It provides detailed visualization of the cartilage, bone and soft tissue in various planes. And it, but it requires the baby to be under sedation uh, and it is an expensive modality. The third one, uh, which is usually done by an orthopedic surgeon, is an arthrography. It is a useful tool that is quick and minimally invasive. It allows adequate visualization of the joint anatomy during surgery and it helps in intraoperative decision making. So coming back to the case, so this patient came to us with this x-ray at uh, 16 days after birth. So considering the periosteal reaction, uh, we uh, thought that the healing process is on the way. So we decided to manage this patient conservatively. So anyone would like to uh, change with the plan, any other method of management? So uh, we went by the literature. The actual management of transphysical separation depends on age and time of presentation of the patient. Neonates and infants up to six months of age can be managed with close reduction and avulbo casting. However, if close reduction fails, then we need to move on the operative intervention. Children more than six months of age, usually close reduction and pinning is advised. And it is not recommended to treat a late presentation with open reduction uh, because it can more damage 
the physis and uh, we usually see cubitus varus deformity in this neglected cases which can be dealt later on so this was the uh, follow up x ray which was done at our hospital after 4 months of birth at this point of time uh, we can see that the distal part is now uh, looking like distal humerus however there is uh, some mal alignment so we decided to uh, so we decided to uh, manage this patient conservatively only and uh, the malunent to progress so take home message remains the correct diagnosis uh, for my young friends to differentiate elbow dislocation with transsagittal separation age at presentation is important in this case as it was a neonate neonate and infants we usually see transsagittal separation in age less than 2 to in age more than 2 to 3 years we should make a diagnosis of elbow dislocation mode of trauma and uh, the important finding is the radiological feature as in this case uh, we can see we uh, saw that there was a medial displacement of radius and ulna but in case of elbow dislocation usually the radius and ulna are displaced laterally and uh, we should not hesitate uh, to use additional imaging modalities like uh, already discussed usg mri arthrography and uh, management depends on age and time of presentation and cubitus varus is the common complication thank you very much thank you uh, we have discussion on at the end of the second case dr shekhar mishra Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting a case. Uh, uh, this, uh, child presented. Uh, the history of the uh, case is the child presented. An eight-year-old boy presented with trauma with a history of fall on outstretched hand while playing in the park. Uh, on examination, uh, there was uh, uh, swelling around the left elbow. There was no open wound. There was tenderness, uh, and there was no distal neurovascular deficit. So sadly, I don't have the X-rays uh, for this child. Uh, these are the the introp siam images uh, you can see in the x rays with um, the introp siam images in the ap and the lateral views in the lateral view you can see there is no meaningful cortical continuity uh, so we diagnosed this case as a supracondylar humerus cartilage type 3 fracture and the patient was planned for close reduction and percutaneous spinning with k wires so these are the introp siam images and this is the ap view and this is the lateral view so you can see the In lateral view, the fragments are completely separate. So again, after flexion and reduction maneuvers, we could not attain attain reduction. So we tried some reduction maneuvers have been uh, talked in close reduction techniques. Uh, one of them is this intrafocal pinning, similar to a Kapanji technique which we use for distal end radius. This is first described. It's a Japanese person. It was done, which is uh, published in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2003. In this, we pass a pin from the posterior side. and we engage we go through the fracture fragment and then we try to lever it lever the fragment lever the proximal fragment to attain cortical continuity but uh, despite this method also we fail to achieve reduction this was the lateral view after trying to achieve we could not achieve reduction so the next method left to us was only open to go for an open approach so the fracture then open through an anterior approach uh, the fracture Can be approached to various approaches, but multiple literature suggests that the anterior approach is better compared to the posterior or the lateral and medial approaches. <laughs> so these are the intra uh, pictures. Uh, you can clearly see a rent in the anterior brachialis and the uh, the brachialis muscle. So uh, the fracture was then reduced after removing the interposing uh, brachialis muscle, and uh, fixation of the fracture was then done using K wires, used under fluoroscopic guidance. so this is the uh, fixation that we did we had to put uh, three lateral pins for first we did to see the stability but even that proved to be unstable then we had to go for a middle pin also so these are the pictures after reduction and the after uh, fixation with k wires this is a one month follow up x ray of the same child 
after which the uh, KYs are removed. So one of the um, things to ponder in this is initially when you see a patient with a supracondylar fracture, you should always look for this sign, which is a pucker sign, which we say, in which the proximal fragment has penetrated through the brachialis muscle and has uh, inter, uh, taken the dermis with it. It has incarcerated the dermis. So this is, you should be uh, aware of this sign. So how do you reduce this? So before giving traction initially, you, uh, normally what we heard initially was when you go to a theater, you try to give reduction, you give a longitudinal traction. But when you have this sign, instead of first giving traction, you first try to milk this. If you give traction, it will incarcerate further uh, structures which are there. So first you try to reduce this and then you go ahead with your reduction uh, techniques. So. Uh, the take home message is uh, supraconvulsive fractures, grade 3 nerves can be sometimes difficult to reduce uh, with close techniques. A pucker sign, which I showed previously, may be present if the proximal fragment has penetrated the brachialis and the anterior fascia of the elbow. Uh, milking maneuver may be tried for freeing the brachialis. However, if it still fails, opening the fracture from an anterior approach may be required. Thank you. Dr. Shekhar, please stay there. Dr. Amol, please come forward. Now, may we have questions from delegate? Why a medial pin was inserted in your case? Just curious. Sir, so after the pins insertion from the lateral side with the pins, the stability was checked. Introp was still, we found that the stability was not. Uh, so, still applying three KYs from the lateral yes, side, sir. still it was unsafe. Yes, sir, because one of the KYs which I see is the displacement of the factor side is still not appreciable. Like the factor it is not as divergent that would have liked in the. And do all the cases of uh, open reduction, uh, you go for uh, through the anterior approach. I mean, you told in your talk yes, that we, uh, we prefer anterior approach rather than lateral and posterior. How common is it to perform anterior approach in cases of uh, open reduction in the supracondylar fracture tumorous? Firstly, sir, what I have been in, um, we have mostly gone through the anterior approach only, but uh, I've not been in many, sir, as I I would, like to, I would like the senior members to comment on this. Shekhar, uh, anterior approach is only meant if you are going to explore the vessel. If you are not aiming to exploding the vessel, then much easier is going for posterior lateral approach. That will take take you to the safer area. There is there would be less chances of maybe surgical complications. So anterior approach is good. Uh, because directly you are reaching the uh, the vessel, but if vessel is not being targeted, then you know uh, for me that is uh, not uh, preferred approach. Okay. So, what I read was uh, going through a posterior approach uh, in grade three, mostly the periosteal hinge is still intact. So when you go through a posterior, no, that, then that is not type three. If 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 uh, that is two B, if the hinge is in there, then the, that is. Yes, the bone is not in contact, but the periosteum is intact, which we don't see on the x-ray. But if the periosteum is completely torn, then it goes into grade for them, which is the flexion extension board. Mm -hmm. Anterior approach, approach is not should be only for the exploration. There are posterior lateral is the most safe uh, approach without going into the danger area. And Sir is saying about posterior lateral approaches, not the typical posterior approaches, which some of the surgeons use. Yes, sir. Uh, I was having a discussion with Dr. Karthik over here about using the Dorgan spin. Yes, that so, is very important. Like, I, uh, with so much experience uh, among us yes. over here, yes. Uh, how commonly, sir, have you encountered a uh, radial nerve injury? I, I think that that was uh, he showed uh, the pin. He used the pin for uh, as a joystick and keeping that pin into the fracture site and manipulating the fragment. The joy. Then, if you are having two pins, one in the proximal uh, pin, uh, proximal fragment, other in the uh, distal fragment. And then you manipulate with these pins the two fragment, and as soon as you get the uh, the reduction, you same pin may be passed into uh, the, from distal to proximal or proximal, proximal to, to distal. Sir, the pro yeah, that is the proximal to distal. What you are talking about? So that is that is one of the way of the next time you you try that that method. Don't keep only one pin into the fracture side, but 
make a joystick of having two pins and then manipulate and same pin can be used to uh, propagate into uh, through the pressure that would be what he is saying is uh, because now the most uh, um, three pin from the distal to proximal other way is from the proximal to distal that gives even the better fixation as far as biomechanical uh, evidence is there. The question I wanted to ask uh, everybody over here that has anyone encountered a radial nerve injury with organs? Because I use it in a little bit like more common way than the than it should be used according to textbook. But uh, uh, really, I have uh, been warned, warned by it about the radial nerve policy by my seniors. Dr. Karthik also was saying the uh, same thing. There is, there is uh, evidences or papers are there in which they say that by passing the three or uh, passing the literal uh, pins, you may injure uh, the radial. Why? Because radial is piercing the, the septum. When it is piercing the septum, and uh, then there are high chances. I mean, there are chances. So one of the x-ray was showing too much uh, pin was uh, going out of the cortex. That should be avoided in the next time. It, it should not be so much of uh, going into the soft tissue. That should be avoided even if you have gone uh, into the soft tissue, withdraw it slightly. Uh, only then you will be uh, avoiding the uh, radian of injury through the lateral uh, spinning. Uh, I use this spin construct when I am having a difficult reduction and I have to go with lateral approach for open reduction, then I have gone in front of me. And then I use that wire, and it will be a cross fixation. Yes. But I'm not going from medial side. I'm going from upside. Yes. And I restrict myself from just above the medial tip on that. In that case, we are safe from the radial nerve as well as ulnar nerve. Otherwise, obviously, percutaneously, it will be difficult to so, be safeguarding the. So we are running a shorter time, and uh, I thank you all the speakers for some nice. Uh, only speakers. one point I want to add uh, about uh, Amol. Yes. Uh, one of if it is a birth injury, you you presented uh, the uh, lower humeral uh, epiphysis uh, uh, separation as one of the uh, birth injury. Uh, yes, it may be a birth injury in a difficult delivery. Otherwise, uh, this is for every student uh, who is present here. We must rule out the infection. Septic arthritis induced. Uh, separation is very common in high risk uh, neonates. So, we must do ultrasound in such uh, patient in each and every to rule out whether there is a collection of fluid or not. If it is there, then the whole the treatment will change. So, it is they should not go with the mind uh, with the impression that it is only the injury which is causing maybe infection without injury may be the cause. Okay, thank you. And just one point I'd like to add in such cases. In such cases uh, where we are suspecting septic arthritis, I would recommend that uh, normally we, what ultrasound we do, we should go for a high resolution ultrasound. So, uh, thank you for an interesting session. I thank all the speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, speakers and chairperson. So, there is time to appreciate the speakers. So, please, chairperson, please come to the desk and give them a message to the speakers. I will call one by one. Dr. Abhishek Sahas. Dr. Abhishek. Doctor Pazan, please. Dr. Karthik, yes, please come on the right. Dr. 
successful CME. Any event that happens that stands on the shoulders of people who have built up an organization. And I would like to tell you that the MP chapter of the Indian Orthopedic Association is one of the most vibrant chapters. Unfortunately, we lost uh, one of our very senior members, uh, Professor Pradeep Bhargav. Uh, he was the ex-HOD of the Department of Orthopedics at Indore Medical College. And he was one of the pioneers who actually established orthopedics in the state. So I would request all of you to stand up for one minute. Uh, it is his funeral today and we will just, uh, for one minute, we'll keep silence to give calm and distance to the family, please. I think as the head of the Department of Orthopedics, it is my humble duty to welcome all the people who have come all the way from Bhopal and from the far-flung corners of the country. I first and foremost would want to welcome our Executive Director, Sir, Professor Dr. Ajay Singh, Sir. Sir is himself uh, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon that you would, all who are sitting behind would have now realized because uh, I think the final key take home messages and all the talks are actually coming from him. I would request uh, Dr. John to welcome sir with a floral welcome. So Bhopal is actually a wonderful city and we are actually at the forefront of orthopedic uh, education as of today. I think uh, we have two very senior people, Dr. Sanjeev Kaur, who is the president of the Central Zone and Dr. Sumit Tandon, who is the president of the MP chapter of IOA. Unfortunately, because of their busy schedules, they have not been able to join us today, but uh, their blessings are with us. And I think uh, probably in the afternoon, once they join, the discussions will become more vibrant. I would take this opportunity to opportunity to welcome uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, sir. Sir is a very busy practitioner in the city of Bhopal. He is also the president of the Bhopal Orthopedic Surgeon Society. And I think without his help and cooperation, it would not have been possible for us to organize the CME. Uh, Pratik. I would also like to welcome the young and dynamic uh, secretary of the Bhopal Orthopedic Surgeon Society, Dr. Rahul Varma. He is an associate professor at Gandhi Medical College, a very close friend, and we are always looking for a lot of advice from him. I would request uh, Pratik again to give a floral welcome to Dr. Rahul Varma. Good 
we have some uh, very senior people of the boss who have graced this occasion i would request uh, uh, dr pankaj uh, to give a floral welcome to jitendra shukla sir the reason why we had two chair persons in the form of dr bk jain and dr atul washni is well known hum log jo boss mein jo bhi event karwana hota hai agar usko 9 baje shuru karna hai then dr bk jain and dr atul washni have to be the chair persons because they were the one who will come at 8:58 and will ask you ya tum log khud hi nahi aaye hum log ko bula liya so i would like to welcome both of them again dr john can you kindly give a floral welcome to dr bk jain and dr manish to kindly give a floral welcome to uh atul yesterday we had a faculty dinner right uh, and it has been only 3 years since i have moved from delhi to bhopal and uh, i was uh, like some of you ravi will know i was very active in the delhi orthopedic association and i used to feel ki main a middle age group mein hu but yesterday when i was in the faculty dinner i suddenly realized that the faculty's age is almost 10 years younger than me right and it was a this thing that generational chain is actually coming hum apne aap ko mana karte the ki hum juniors hain and there were a lot of seniors but yesterday uh, i think there was a huge generational gap so i would like and i think that is why a wonderful discussion is happening they are talking from the textbooks they are talking about evidence unlike what we used to have in the past where you we used to have eminence based discussions ki nahi this is ये मेरा तरीका है एंड मैं ऐसे करता हूँ दैट इज वॉट इज नॉट हैपनिंग इन दिस वर्कशॉप एंड आई थिंक इट इज ऑल बिकॉज ऑफ द फैकल्टी सो बिग राउंड ऑफ अपलॉस फॉर ऑल दैकल्टी लास्ट बट नॉट द लीस्ट आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक ऑल द डेलीकेट्स बिकॉज विदाउट यू एनी कॉन्फ्रेंस इज ऑफ नो यूज अ लॉट ऑफ एफर्ट गोज ऑन द पार्ट ऑफ द ऑर्गेनाइजिंग टीम टू मेक अ दिस थिंग एंड i see i would have been happier if the more people would have come but yes there is a crowd the good thing is now with technology a lot of things can be overcome so all what is happening over here is actually available on the ortho tv thanks to ravi it is also available on youtube so i think those who are missing out on the academics in the lecture theater may be looking at it on the youtube and the ortho tv so thank you ravi for that and i think uh, with these because we are already running short of time i would uh, close this session and i would like pankaj to come forward and take the proceedings for the inaugural session forward thank you thank you sir sir apurva kopi poshodyam vidyate to bharti veto vidhimaya ti kshayamaya ti santeya he sarasati tera khazana satmuch avarnani kharch karne se badhta hai aur sambhalne se kam hai with this slow I will request to our director, sir, please come on the dais to the lighting, the lamps. Sir, I will request to Dr. Sanjay Gupta, sir, Vice President, kindly come on the dais and give us some.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, as already we have read, I will restrict my talk to the two minutes. Respected Dr. Ajay Singh, Director Ames Gopal, Dr. Ryan Allah, HOD Ames Gopal, and I think Dr. Seniors, Dr. Jitin Shukla, Dr. B.K. Jain, Dr. Atul Vashne, and respected all seniors and my dear colleagues and friends and special mention for the young faculty who have come from all parts of the uh, India to deliver our lectures on pediatric orthopedics. First, I should thank Dr. Vijay Singh, Dr. Ajay Singh, who has been driving force for this conference. I should also thank Dr. Yahano Dhak uh, for uh, uh, arranging this uh, pediatric orthopedic CME uh, and then Dr. Pratik, uh, he is also very efficient and he has taken a lot of pains in making arrangements. In last 30 years of my stay in Nepal, I think this is the only first orthopedic CME we have, uh, we have organizing in Nepal. That all great goes to, I think, Dr. Ajay Singh, who is here as Director Ames. Though during MS, we learn pediatric orthopedics and we all treat all type of fractures in children. With the time, pediatric ortho is becoming a super specialty in orthopedics. In metro towns, there are so many pediatric orthopedic surgeons. It is true that when you treat only children, you will do better job and then uh, better job for them and, and obviously give better results. That is true, very true. Fresh, fresh simple trauma in children can be treated by all ortho, ortho surgeons equally well. Role of pediatric ortho surgeons comes in treating complicated trauma, neglected trauma, and congenital anomalies. I think in Bhopal at present we don't have pediatric ortho surgeon, but with so many medical colleges coming up. Gradually, we'll be having a pediatric orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon very soon in Bhopal. I think one pediatric orthopedic surgeon from Indore is visiting once a month to, Bhopal, to provide his services in Bhopal. With so many medical colleges in Bhopal, soon or later, Bhopal city will have specialized pediatric orthopedic surgeon. This pediatric orthopedic conference will, will be useful for all the ortho surgeons of Bhopal as they have got a good opportunity to learn from the experts in the field, especially complicated trauma, how to ma manage this complicated trauma and neglected trauma. If the child is not treated well, and especially with some deformity which is not correctable, he had to suffer longest because he is having long lifespan. We should be very careful in treating children. He should not land up with any deformity because you can understand he's having longest lifespan. Adult is having smaller lifespan, but uh, children is having longer lifespan. He has to suffer whole life. So we should be very careful. I think this pediatric ortho CME in Bhopal will be benefited, uh, uh, benefit all ortho surgeons and also population of Bhopal, all pediatric population of Bhopal. Thank you very much. So, uh, as this is an IOA event, we had requested the IOA office bearers to be with us. Unfortunately, there are two different conferences also going on and they have three occupations. So, uh, they have sent their uh, wishes in regards to us. And I would like to uh, take it, this opportunity to play the, their uh, recorded inauguration. First of all, I uh, will be running the video of the IOA Academy this year. Excuse me, I am Dr. Vivek Trikha, Academic Cell in Charge of Indian Orthopedic Association. It gives me great pleasure and honor to give uh, welcome you all to this excellent pediatric orthopedics CME 
which is being conducted on 13th and 14th of May in Bhopal under the guidance of Professor Ajay Singh, Executive Director and CEO of AIMS Bhopal. He is also the Pediatric Subcommittee of Indian Orthopedic Association in charge and has been guiding us in the matters of pediatric orthopedics to, for the IOA in a great way. This CME is concentrated purely for the pediatric orthopedics issues, especially the trauma on 14th of May, where the entire gamut of all the fractures and all the topics regarding to the fractures of pediatric orthopedics are going to be taken up by luminaries and great experts of pediatric orthopedics from all over the country. I was going through the brochure and I could see that the Professor Ajay Singh and his great team of Professor Rehan and other people in the organization, along with Bhopal Orthopedic Surgeon Society, has been able to gather a lot of good, great speakers, great experts in pediatric orthopedics, and are going to cover a lot of area in the pediatric orthopedics trauma by lectures, by case discussions, and other activities. On 13th of May, they have organized a club foot management CME along with Pure Foundation, and it is also an important part of pediatric orthopedics. I feel that this CME is going to be a landmark CME and is going to be of great value to the orthopedic surgeons who have come there, especially in the middle part of our country, and is going to be emulated by all the people in various parts of the country to follow such events and to have such events, for the, especially for the pediatric orthopedics scenario. I would like to wish Professor Ajay Singh sir or Professor Rehan, the organizing team, all the delegates and the faculty a grand success for this academic event. And I hope that this academic spirit of IOA is going to continue in the very future as well. I thank you all for your patient hearing and giving me this opportunity to be a part of the Go Online being the part right now in a conference in Delhi right now. So I think, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. You know, delegates and dignitaries of the IS and of the IS. On behalf of IO Secretary Office, we invite you here The fantastic boards organized by Gopal Ames under the aegis of the IO Hospital Academic Committee, Pediatric Office Committee, and under the aegis of Central Zone of IOA and the MP Chapter of IOA, where all the store parts are here. The chairman of IOA. Pediatric Orthopedic Committee, he has put a lot of support to this team of Rehan and the Committee. He to all with all facility and very good ambience. I must thank organizers for inviting me in this event. But as I'm fully committed for South Zone Conference of Sony God and the North Zone Conference of Delhi, I'm not available with you physically, but virtually I'm with you. <laughs> the whole team has crafted a well balanced program as a workshop. As a faculty, are very good second. We are lucky to have a very senior dedicated <coughs> Matthews, Dergis, sir, and other faculties, we have prepared structured modules for all the I have a small appeal to young delegates to become an IO member, to have an advantage of you are meant to say. You can create a possibility of training to get mentored by Dr. Matthew Vargis, Dr. Ajay Singh, Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan in pediatric orthopedics and all other fields of orthopedics, whatever you choose, whatever mentor you choose. We have 100 UR mentorships. Last year we had given 100 UR mentorships to young orthopedic surgeons. And we 
your your mark sixty five rupees fund as an academic fund for young or putting such a for scholarship. And now I O membership first time in the history of I O S has been made totally online, total paperless, including payment online. No need to make drafts. No effort. You can join I O S paperless. Visit the I O website and click the join I O button, and you will be able to see the complete detail and instructions that you can join I O S effortless. So please join the I O. So we are now moving more and more towards the digitalization of the I O. Now you can see the I O A all the papers, all the issues from 1967 into the digitalized by our I O team. It is put up on the I O. We need a login to enter into it. We need a login to read all the articles. The free for all I O members. I am again thankful to you all for the great support in my tenure and helping to bring the change in the IO. So many changes we could make together, and still we will make many new changes. As few young members say, new IO. So we will be sharing, contributing, and learning together, and evolve, evolve together. Thanks to all. Allowing me here to welcome you, and you will get the best knowledge by all the faculties. <laughs> and I wish great success to the event. Very well done. Thank you. Good morning, friends. I'm happy that our Pediatric Orthopedic Committee of the Indian Orthopedic Association is organizing a CNE on pediatric trauma today at Gopal. This is also being accompanied by a workshop on consecutive things. I am thankful to the Department of Orthopedic of Canada, the Honorable, for taking this effort in organizing this. We have the best available expertise of the current NASA. Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan as the advisors, Dr. Rajya Singh as the chairman, Dr. Kamlesh Devgurari, Dr. Nandara Gashe, Dr. Veshal Das as members. I would have so much wanted to be there in person, but I am in Japan attending the Japanese Orthopedic Association conference. I wish you all the best for here at Yokohama. Enjoy good learning. Jai Hind. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, I would like to invite our director, sir, Professor Rajesh Singh, sir, to have uh, share his experience and a few words with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, IOA. Thank you, BOA, BOSS, MP Chapter, Central Zone, Department of Orthopedics, uh, James Bhopal, all the organizers, senior persons sitting. Uh, of the dais and everyone, the, all the faculty members coming from uh, far places uh, from the from the country, and uh, all the members or the delegates on the behalf of uh, in Bhopal, please accept my greetings. And I am very happy to be here. And uh, especially Pratik has done a lot of uh, that the supervision of uh, Dr. Rehan. Has done a wonderful job of organizing this uh, this workshop. Yes, uh, we are missing few of. Uh, I mean, there are number of uh, persons are delegates are less, but no, no matter because we are live on uh, YouTube and uh, we are having uh, RFO TV facility also. So I'm so happy that uh, uh, this this workshop will will improve the. Awareness as far as, as the pediatric uh, orthopedics is concerned. जब मैंने काम शुरू किया था तो उस समय लोगों को लगता था कि pediatric orthopedics क्या है, इसकी जरूरत भी क्यों है? तो सभी जैसे होता है कि हम तो already बच्चों को इलाज कर ही रहे हैं, इसमें अलग से करने की क्या आवश्यकता है? लेकिन now I am 
वेरी हैप्पी कि इतने सब यंग मेरे कुलीग्स यहाँ पे हैं और वो सब इस इस मैंडेट के साथ यहाँ है कि हम लोगों को बच्चों के लिए जो स्पेशलाइज ट्रीटमेंट की आवश्यकता है वो हम लोग उनको दे पा रहे हैं और हमारी यूजी और पीजी की ट्रेनिंग में कहीं ना कहीं इसको इनकॉपरेट करने की आवश्यकता थी अभी भी इसको है और हमें लगता है कि हमें बहुत ज्यादा इस पे अभी काम करने की जरूरत है तो मैं आई ओए का बहुत ही धन्यवाद देता हूँ कि उन्होंने हम लोगों को ये अपॉर्चुनिटी दी और बॉस और एम पी चैप्टर का भी धन्यवाद देता हूँ कि आप लोगों ने हम हम लोगों को ये मौका दिया कि हम ये जो है वो एम भोपाल में कर सकें कॉन्फ्रेंस मेरा डॉक्टर संजय आपने कहा कि देर इज नो पीडेटिक आर्थोपेडिक सर्जन इन भोपाल आई थिंक डॉक्टर प्रतीक इज वेरी वेल डूइंग देर गुड जॉब इन पीडेटिक आर्थोपेडिक्स और यदि भोपाल इज नॉट रिकॉग्नाइजिंग प्रतीक देन दैट इज योर मिस्टेक यू शुड यू शुड बी मोर वोकल एज फर एज अटिक आर्थोपेडिक एंड नाउ नाउ इट इज माई ड्यूटी to move uh, make you prominent from uh, in mobile so uh, we are very much uh, i know uh, he's working i know his uh, surgery i am following uh, his patients in opd so i know he's doing wonderful job so uh, i am very hopeful and uh, i'm sure <laughs> एक तो यू हैव टू स्टार्ट एंटी चैप्टर पेरेटिक आर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन दैट इज वेरी मच इट रिक्वायर्ड वट एवर आई मीन इट इज नॉट नेसेसरी देन एनी एनी आर्थोपेडिक सर्जन हु इज हैविंग सम डिग्री और फेलोशिप इन द पेरेटिक एनी पर्सन हु इज हैविंग इंटरेस्ट इन द पेरेटिक आर्थोपेडिक एंड वॉन्ट्स टू लर्न मोर यू मस्ट एट्रैक्ट दोज एंड इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री यू मस्ट एस्टेब्लिश ए एम पी चैप्टर ऑफ पेरेटिक आर्थोपेडिक that is one job i am giving you and without fail you have to do it the other thing that is for rehan that uh, this sal uh, this year uh, the mcr pediatric arthropedics has to be started in aims bhopal without fail i don't know how you will manage but you have to manage it and that is my personal request but also the command that you have to follow it तो so, एक चीज में आ, सभी सीनियर्स बैठे हुए हैं और बहुत सारी फैकल्टी इधर हमारे अदर मेडिकल कॉलेज से आए मेरा एक छोटा सा निवेदन है कि हम लोग फेलोशिप शुरू कर सकते हैं आ, जो कि जो स्टूडेंट्स हैं आपके पीजी या इवन यंग आर्थोपेडिक सर्जन हु वांट्स टू सी गुड सर्जरी डीडीएच जैसे आ, प्रतीक करता है बहुत अच्छा डीडीएच का केसेस करता है और भी मैंने देखा है इसको स्पाइन इस हमारे यहाँ बहुत अच्छा हो रहा है तो यदि हम लोग उन चीजों को यदि शेयर कर सकें तो वो एक शेयरिंग ऑफ नॉलेज बहुत जरूरी है तो मैं जो तो भी सीनियर एमपी चैप्टर के लोग हैं जो बॉस के जो सीनियर लोग हैं मैं उनसे रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि इस तरीके की एक्सचेंज फेलोशिप हम लोगों के होनी चाहिए और लोगों को रेजिडेंट्स को और सीनियर रेजिडेंट को और यंग आर्थोपेडिक सर्जन को एम्स में हम लोगों को वेलकम करना चाहिए कि आप यहाँ पे आए क्योंकि ऑलरेडी हम बहुत ज्यादा लेट हो रहे हैं तो मैं इसमें ज्यादा नहीं बोलूंगा ये दो काम मैंने दिए हैं एक डॉक्टर रेहान को और एक डॉक्टर प्रतीक को ये दोनों काम हम लोग करेंगे और नेक्स्ट टाइम जब भी हम लोग मिलेंगे तो we will come up with a uh, with a much uh, awaited news as far as the creation of these two things are concerned i wish everyone uh, all the best and uh, happy learning from uh, aims group thank you thank you sir for your kind words sir please come and join our team next or jo delegates hain unhone jo उनको अपना पोस्टर जाकर के वहां लगा दें ताकि हम लोग उसको टाइमली जो है बाद में जज कर सकते
कैंडिडेट्स जिन लोगों का पोस्टर अभी नहीं लगा है प्लीज आप लोग जाके लगा दीजिए वहां पे नाउ वी आर मूविंग टू द सेकंड सेशन फॉर द सेकंड सेशन आई इनवाइट डॉक्टर अजय सर एंड डॉक्टर संजय गुप्ता सर प्लीज प्लीज चेयर द सेशन uh thank you very much uh, now we are going to start uh, the session 2 uh, and uh, first topic is management of lateral condyle humerus uh, humeral fracture how do i do it uh, dr anurag tiwari questions will be after this lecture only so keep keep your questions ready after the lecture respected chairperson my seniors other faculty members and my dear friends aap sabhi ko mera namaskar main dr anurag tiwari aaj present kar raha hu apni talk lateral condyle numerus fracture i would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity so let's start this lateral condyle humerus why is so important in the pediatric age group we see the injuries around the elbow there are two injuries the supracondylar and the lateral condyle i personally feel that the lateral condyle is more important because the lateral condyle is rare injury you may see only one to two cases per month in your emergencies during post graduation whereas the supracondylar you may see a lot of cases every day so this is important this is rare and the second important reason is the diagnosis is challenging many times you see the x rays the patient comes to you after injury and the x ray looks normal and you see that the x ray is normal and you send back the patient home whereas in such cases if you feel that there is something suspicious about the injury about the lateral condyle you always get a comparison view from the other limb you can compare that what is wrong what is normal and what is abnormal you can clearly now identify that there is something abnormal in the lateral side there is fracture lateral condyle the next is there is a pull of the extensor muscle which is causing the displacement and rotation and it is a intra articular fracture epiphyseal so these two parameters cause more prone for the fracture to go into non union and these non union if left untreated the patient may end up with cubitus valgus this deformity and the tardy hernia palsy later on so to avoid this disaster to avoid this complication we need to address this uh, lateral condyle to be diagnosed early and appropriate management can be started so that's why it is called as fracture of necessity whenever you see the displaced lateral condyle it is the treatment of choice is open reduction internal fixation to avoid this complication you have to fix it with a k wire so lateral condyle humerus what does this include in your exam if you have get the case of cubitus valgus definitely the examiner will ask you that what do you mean by lateral condyle so just have this animation on the x ray the lateral condyle includes actually the capitulum the lateral epicondyle portion the lateral condylar physis the portion of trochlea again important many of us may not be knowing that the portion of trochlea is also included in the lateral condyle this portion and the metaphyseal region so any injury in this region will be called as the lateral condyle it is a intra articular fracture epiphyseal injury and in the later adult life this portion is made by this lateral condyle the classification we have many classification not going into too much of detail means you already know if the class if the fracture is going through the proprio capitular ridge or if the it is going around the physis of the condyle this will be classified as one and the two milch one is salter harris type 4 and milch two is salter harris type 2 so there is a mnemonic i have made the one into four is four two into two is four so easy to remember that milch type is milch the salter harris type 4 and milch type 2 is salter harris type 2 but not so helpful in treatment decision making it does not tell ke isme kya karna hai isme kya karna hai so management wise this classification is not uh, is outdated so we have the jacob classification based upon the displacement 
if it is undisplaced fracture if it is a complete fracture or if it is a displaced and rotated the same way to a little of this difference we can make it more objective that if the displacement is less than 2 mm type 1 if it is more than 2 mm but articular hinge is intact somewhat different from the jacobs type 2 and if the displacement is more than 2 mm so this will be the b's classification more or less the same only difference is between the type 2 the type 2 intra articular disruption it will be the jacob 2 and if it is articular intact it will be b's classification so to combine these two classification they combine into one single that is the song classification they are made into the five types based upon the displacement and the fracture pattern so clearly it differentiates that if it is an undisplaced type it will be treated as a uh, non-operative management whereas if it is a displaced and rotated definitely it needs open reduction and internal fixation so this looks more uh, treatment decision making would be easier the mechanism we have the two theories that is push off and pull off if the patient or the child fall on outstretched hand there will be valgus and it will cause fracture lateral condyle or the second is the theory if it is because of the pull of the extensor muscle there will be avulsion type of the fracture lateral condyle so if there is a valgus force given because of the radial head, this causes the fracture of the lateral condyle and it displays superiorly. And the second possibility is because of the pull of the common extensor origin on the lateral condyle, there will be the avulsion type of the injury. So if it is a push-off theory, the type 1 milch will be more commonly seen. In this type of injury mechanism, the type 2 milch will be commonly seen. So based upon the mechanism, you can have the idea about the fracture pattern. Clinical presentation, you all know there will be pain, there will be swelling, there will be the tenderness, all sorts of this. But just want to make a point here that you have to differentiate between the supracondylar and the lateral condyle. If you see this child like this in your emergency, it is something abnormal in the elbow. The patient will not allow you to touch. There will be swelling. In supracondylar, there will be the circumferential swelling, whereas in lateral condyle, it will be more localized towards the lateral side. The second point is the tenderness. If you go and tenderness, if you check the tenderness in supracondylar, it will be medial as well as lateral supracondylar ridges will be tender. Whereas in lateral condyle, it will only be more prominent on the lateral side. So these are the two differentiating features clinically you can differentiate. Now next comes the X-ray. So this is the X-ray AP view. Can anyone tell me that what it is? Is it normal or abnormal? More or less, it looks normal. AP view is normal. Any other view? We have the lateral view. Again, normal. I don't know. This is also normal. This is also normal. We can send back the patient home. No. For lateral condyle, if you are suspecting that there is swelling, there is tenderness over the lateral condylar region, always get an oblique view. So it is mandatory to get an oblique view if you feel that there is suspected fracture, but the diagnosis is not clear. So this is the oblique view, this is the external oblique view, and this is the internal oblique view. Because the lateral condyle is placed not exactly lateral, it is posterolateral. So the fracture is posterolateral. When you rotate the hand internally, the fracture will be more visible. Like we do in the fracture neck of femur, we rotate it by 15 degrees. So that is the same principle here. So now you can appreciate the fracture here. There is a fracture of the lateral condyle on the internal oblique view. And now retrospectively, you can say that there is some haziness or there is some problem in the AP view too. So this is the importance of internal oblique view. Always get an internal oblique if you are in a doubt of diagnosing the lateral condyle. Now next talk about the management part. So we have the two varieties. It could be non-displaced, it could be displaced. So displaced and non-displaced are divided by the basis of 2 mm displacement. So if it is a less than 2 mm displacement in all the views, including the internal oblique, such type of injuries. The treatment is controversial. Two school of thought. Some surgeons say that go for non-operative management, wait and watch, just apply the immobilization. And the second school of thought is always operate. So I personally feel that you should go with our valgus slab or cast. I treat them non-operatively and check the X-rays every week. If it is going to displace in a later on follow-up X-rays, then go for surgery. If it is not, then continue the same for four to six weeks and the patient will be fine. The fracture will definitely unite. This place, there is no confusion, no controversy. Always and always surgery because this is fracture of necessity. If you don't treat, they will go into non-union. They will go into cubitus valgus. 
So it is the open reduction internal fixation is the treatment of choice in such fractures. Now surgery, how do I do it? Certain questions which need to be answered that what should be the reduction, close or open approach, choice of implant, how will I uh, do the fixation, the pattern of fixation, pins to be left outside or inside the skin, immobilization for how long, and the rehab protocol. So these are the questions to your mind, to my mind when I was the postgraduate, kaise karna hai, kyon karna hai, is tarhe se. So let's see one by one. So how do I do it? Reduction, always and always open. I always prefer open reduction if it is a displaced fracture. There is no role for closed reduction. But there is a school of thought that you can do the closed reduction and percutaneous pinning. But I feel there are so many literature that always do the open reduction. Now the approach, the standard approach is the cocker's approach, the lateral approach to the elbow for the radial head, for the epithelium, for the lateral condyle. So this is the approach you do the, do the incision. You give the incision along the lateral supracondylar ridge and continue it along the joint and just turn it towards the radial neck. You dissect and the interval is between the ECU and the anconius muscle. Many times when you open the fracture, if it is a displaced type of fracture, you will directly lead onto the, you will see the hematoma and there will be the uh, breach in the fascia and you will directly see the fracture inside. Not too much of dissection is required in the displaced fracture. So when you give the incision, you see this picture, you will see the fragment. So this is the arm side, this is the forearm, here the tunica will be applied. And in these cases, always remember that, always uh, uh, beware that you cannot injure, you should not injure the articular surface. Because this is articular surface just beneath the fascia. So if you are doing it blindly, just uh, uh, cutting with a knife, you can injure the articular surface. So beware about this. The second is, don't put any retractor in the anterior side. The anterior side, if you put the retractor, omen retractor, I have put this Langen back retractor. So don't put your retractor because you can injure the ulna nerve onto the medial side. Or if you are using it, omen retractor, then be close to the bone. Remain close to the bone so that to avoid the any injury to the ulna nerve. And lastly, always dissect anterior to the fragment. Now don't dissect posterior to this. So I have not done any dissection posterior to this side. So this side should be left alone, the soft tissue should not be touched because they can cause the osteonecrosis of the fragment because vascularity is coming from the posterior side. So always do the dissection from this line anteriorly, this side. And this is the joint you have to visualize. So always focus on the articular reduction. That is more important. Metaphysial can be there, can be step because of the plastic deformation. So don't focus on the, don't focus on the metaphysial part, always on the intraarticular. Just three, four slides, sir. So don't dissect posteriorly, just want to emphasize this. After approach, we have the choice of implants. So they can be the K wire if the metaphysial fragment is small. You can use the K wire if it is a large chunk, you can use the screw. However, I personally prefer only the K wire, the smooth K wires. They don't injure the physis. Pattern of K wire, you can use the multiple pattern, the parallel, two wire, divergent, three wire, or screws. So I use usually the two parallel or divergent wire as the previous session also emphasized that the need for the divergent wire. So always use a divergent type of configuration that is more stable. The pins outside or inside is skin. So there is a paper here and they have said that there is no significant difference between the infection rate between the two groups. But there is a high risk of skin erosion in the buried group. And there is high risk of pin migration in the buried group. So I personally leave all the pins outside the skin. Immobilization for six weeks and rehab protocol after six weeks, you start the active or active assisted exercise. Don't go for passive because it will cause myositis ossificans. Complication already are told about this. So this is a case, a nine to 10 year old child with fractal lateral condyle. I have done this open reduction internal fixation with K wire and that healed in the six weeks, it is about six weeks actually, and after three months, full range of motion, the supination, pronation, and the flexion extension is achieved. Thank you. Lecture is open for discussion. No. Only it's the two minutes. So you don't you always are open to open in this place type of lectures. Okay. If it is displaced, it's some, it's some four and five, five. Maybe.
Then it is not always. Right? In some time, you will do post rest. You will after post rest also. No. If uh, it is undisplaced type, then I will do the non-operative management. If it is getting displaced during the treatment part. So undisplaced is song one. Completely yes. displaced and rotated is song five. Yes. What about two, three, four? Two and three also non-operative. I will go for three non -operative. non-operative. Yes. So that is debatable. Yes. That is controversy. Okay. And another thing, you will immobilize for six weeks. Yes. So, Usually yes, we keep KOS for six weeks, but we start elbow or arm after three weeks. Otherwise, it will become stable. Again, depends upon the fracture fixation. If it is stable, then after four weeks can be mobilized. See, you should do a good job. You should do stable fixation. But uh, we can start earlier. Thank you. Just to keep a caution. Yes. And you use thread wires or plain wires? Smooth, smooth wires. Is there any advantage of thread wires? They will, uh, theoretically, there is an advantage that they will have a more purchase. But I don't think the threaded wire. No, never, never to go. Uh, Never will because, uh, that will five will be just right. Okay, Anurag, uh, yes. it was a nice presentation. So I also agree with Karthik that there is role of percutaneous KY fixation also for um, undisplaced and minimally displaced fractures rather than opening or managing conservatively. So there is a middle way of percutaneous KY fixation. When you are in doubt that it may get displaced. And uh, it's not very much displaced to uh, do an open data. And it is controversial, and there are two schools of thought. You saw the program a lot. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is very important. I think uh, you must tell the students about the hard program because that will decide whether you will want open reduction or closed reduction. So there is a scope. There is, if yeah. there the cartilage is intact, then there is a scope of uh, doing even slightly displaced structures. If, if cartilage is intact, then you may go for the close. Otherwise, if cartilage is not there, and it, even if it's at less than 2 mm, so what you show is the conservative in the first uh, x ray. If cartilage is not uh, it is, uh, not intact, then go always go for uh, uh, percutaneous meaning uh, at the first step. Dr. Ian. I think a wonderful lecture. I just wanted to know uh, in our own clinical practice, we get a lot of patients who are coming a bit late. Let's say they're not coming at say six weeks, but they're coming at two weeks or three weeks. And there is a diagnostic dilemma regarding whether you should get this fragment back or fix it and leave it and do it. So what is the opinion of the house? I would just want to have an idea about it. First from you and then maybe from the other people who are here. Usually, if the patient is coming late, maybe three to four weeks. And if it is a displaced, then definitely I will go for open reduction internal fixation day one. What if you cut off after so many weeks, I'm not going to go. Maybe six weeks. Beyond six weeks, there is no point because the fracture will be. Yes, sir. sir, the cutoff for neglected uh, fractures is three months. When a, when a patient comes after three months post injury lateral condyle, then we term the patient as mm -hmm. neglected. Uh, lateral condyle. And if the patient presents to you before three months, then we treat it as uh, Dr. Anurag has mentioned. And if the patient comes with any associated deformities, suppose elbow instability or cubitus valgus deformity or a tardial nerve, nerve palsy, then subsequently we, we stabilize the uh, uh, fracture fragment and whatever is required between the same. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anurag. Now, uh, next lecture is uh, rash injury, something all must be aware of. Uh, by Dr. Suresh. Good morning, all. And I'm thankful to Professor Ajay Singh, Sir, uh, Rehan, Sir, and Pratik for uh, inviting me here. And it's always wonderful to interact with all the friends and colleagues and juniors. So I'll be presenting on elbow trash region, something all must be aware of. So it's a topic which uh, uh, is, uh, I mean, uh, signify, uh, signify, uh, signifies the old saying that eyes don't see but mind do, doesn't know. So elbow trash lesions uh, are uh, a, a kind of injury which we should know and then only we'll be able to uh, detect them. So I have no financial disclosures. I will be uh, thankful to Dr. Mannar and Dr. Sandeep for sharing their cases for this uh, presentation because all varieties of uh, crash regions even I have not attended. A few kind of uh, them I have attended. So this was classical paper by uh, Peter Waters. 
uh, in 2010, uh, they have uh, mentioned trash lesion. So the uh, uh, the uh, this uh, full form for that uh, lesions they have uh, put forth is the radiographic appearance seemed harmless. So what they uh, uh, encase a variety of lesions where the first X-ray might be very normal looking, and we might miss that uh, elbow injury as soft tissue injury. And uh, in a later date, we'll have a more complicated thing, which will be difficult to uh, salvage and child will always be having a problem. So they have uh, uh, almost seven to eight uh, variants or maybe uh, types of trash lesions they have uh, mentioned. Uh, it is uh, listed over here. And in subsequent slides, I'll try to cover all the things with the case examples. So this is another article in uh, IJO, which has uh, described all the types of uh, trash lesions one by one, and I'll try to go through each case. So the errors in management would be, first thing, we don't suspect it and, it, and we don't know that stress lesions are there and such entity exists. And we overlook the subtle things and we subsequently uh, fall back with the uh, uh, elbow uh, persistent pain or functional limitation. And then we, in retrospect, we diagnose that it was something fishy going on in the X-ray, in the initial presentation as well. So this is the uh, first case who presented with a, a, a fall on upstairs hand, initially reported as normal, but uh, when the child had persistent elbow pain, somebody reported it as radial head fracture. So if we see in this X-ray closely, we see that uh, there is something uh, not uh, well around the radiocapitular uh, area. And in the lateral view also, the radiocapitular line is not very uh, well, which should go at the one third level of capitulum. So if we do a higher imaging like CT or MRI, we can see that there is radial head compression fracture. And more than that, there is a, a progressive subluxation of uh, there is progressive subluxation of uh, radiocapitular joint. So radial head fracture itself might be a, a, a harmless entity in, in a child, but the radiocapitular subluxation will definitely have uh, uh, worse outcomes in the long term and uh, missing such injury will have uh, very uh, bad results in the functional uh, way for the child. So this was uh, diagnosed at radial head compression fracture, which is one of the variants of trash lesions. And there is a progressive uh, sub, uh, radiocapitular subluxation. So this was uh, fixed with uh, open reduction and headless screws. Absorbable screws are uh, preferred, but if not available, then we can use the classical Herbert screws as well. So the uh, second case is six-year-old uh, girl who had elbow injury while doing somersault and there was valgus thrust injury and somebody uh, diagnosed it as well uh, the uh, medial epicondyle fracture and which appeared to be very harmless and they uh, managed it conservatively. So after three months, patient presented with persistent pain and uh, not uh, regaining it, uh, the functions and on x-ray the fragment was visibly large this time and it was uh, actually a unnocified medial condylar fracture, which was uh, wrongly labeled as medial epicondyle avulsion kind of fracture, and that was managed conservatively. Now this required open reduction, and thankfully, because it was only three months, it could be fixed and the function was uh, well. So again, this was uh, missed as medial epicondyle avulsion fracture. Third case here is, uh, we have been going through uh, uh, such cases earlier in presentations also. Typical history is a newborn child from a uh, Niku or Piku, we have we got a call that there was a difficult uh, birth and there is elbow pain and swelling or refusal to use the limb. So somebody will diagnose it wrongly as elbow dislocation because the physis is uh, weaker than the capsule and ligament. So elbow dislocation will be very rare entity in children and the physis will give way before the forces go to joint and it dislocates it. So this is supracondylar. Uh, the uh, transphysial separation and the treatment is similar to supracondylar. If you have facility and child allows, you can put uh, under GA and put <clears throat> KY fixation. If not, the situation doesn't allow and the child is very small, you can use gentle reduction and counsel the parents for the future cubitus virus deformity, but obviously it should not be treated as elbow dislocation. So opposite side x-rays are always helpful in treating the uh, children elbows and we should have comparative views whenever in the doubt. In these x-rays, we can uh, certainly make that there is no doubt about uh, the radiographic abnormalities in the elbow. So this was uh, fixed. And we can always use uh, arthrography to uh, 
see the distal fragment and it will guide us in passing the KYS. So prognosis is uh, just like supracondylar fractures and the only problem is uh, cubitus virus if there is any. The fourth case I'm describing here is six-year-old uh, child who presented to emergency as elbow injury and somebody diagnosed it as the elbow dislocation and uh, simply close reduction was done and a slab was applied. However, uh, this was the presentation x-rays and if we see closely there is something uh, not uh, usual in the medial side of the joint and on higher imaging there was incarcerated medial epicondyle which was wrongly labeled as elbow dislocation and was reduced and patient presented with uh, uh, persistent elbow pain and ulnar nerve palsy and it had to be uh, done open reduction and uh, while reducing it the ulnar nerve got relaxed and it was fixed with uh, screw and the uh, outcome was very uh, good. So, uh, fifth case is 15 year old child who had uh, uh, injury while he was working in his fields and the, uh, the uh, pool suddenly ran away from his hand and there was uh, some injury in the elbow and somebody reported it as normal. Patient presented uh, around four to uh, six weeks later with the persistent elbow pain and restricted range of motion. And on first x-ray, it looked like some myositis is there in the anterior aspect of the humerus. However, on closed uh, uh, analysis, there is something abnormal in the lateral aspect of the x-ray. And on higher imaging, we can see that there is a shear fracture of the capitulum and which has, which has to be fixed. Obviously, approach and all will be uh, a dilemma. And a simple anterolateral open reduction, just like in a and a lateral condyle probably will be a sufficient thing in such cases. These are some of the intro uh, steps and it was fixed with a uh, Herbert screw. Obviously, in children, we cannot remove it. So, if available, use uh, bio screws. So, this is a known entity of having a shear <coughs> fracture in the capsule. The last case I will uh, demonstrate here is a four-year-old child with injury on the uh, elbow, fall on outstretched hand. And we can see that there is... Uh, uh, the radio capitular alignment is probably not right and the patient has persistent elbow pain. On higher imaging, we can see that in the uh, capitulum area, there is uh, osteochondral injury and in the retrospect, we can see that the elbow alignment is also not very uh, good. So, uh, these are the ossification centers around the elbow. We should always be aware of uh, the things and the unossified cartilage uh, 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 rupture or avulsion is the known entity and it, it has to be fixed. So take home message is triast lesions are set of injuries which appear harmless on x-ray and a high index of suspicion is required. And these are the enumerated again and we should always have these injuries in our mind when the child has elbow pain and we can always treat them as uh, with the uh, splinters and we can always have a look back after four to five days and the, uh, uh, the pain and the swelling is not subsiding we can always go for higher imaging and rule out the trash lesions. This is again the summary of that article. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Uh, now, uh, this uh, lecture is open for the discussion. Uh, next one, two questions will be taken. Yeah, Ravi. Nice talk, Dr. Suresh. Uh, well, for the sake of senior residents and postgraduates, I want to ask you just a few tips. Yeah. Because diagnosis is a big problem in these stress lesions. Yeah. So, with your experience or with your literature support, what are those tips that you give to the postgraduates and senior residents? Yeah. That these are the few things that you can notice in these elbows, yeah. and you should have a high suspicion of diagnosing of the stress lesions. Yeah. So, if a if a pediatric a patient comes in this age group and he has a typical history of fall on outstretched hand most of the time. And there is swelling and pain which uh, suggests that there is something fracture kind of thing and you get an x-ray where there is nothing there. So probably you will suspect something and you analyze the x-ray again and it's okay to miss these findings. But I'll apply a slab and uh, counsel the parents to come back after three to five days. By that time the soft tissue injury should have subsided and I'll take examination again and I'll analyze the x-rays again. At that moment if there is a persistent pain and swelling I'll try to go for higher imaging because without the help of higher imaging, it will be difficult to diagnose. And it's always to uh, are on the side of over investigating in such cases rather than missing it and later repenting that we cannot do anything. So why can't we go for a higher image at that time of presentation? 
so because if you go for mri or something because it will need sedation and everything cost issues are there and uh, in our, in our country we need to look at the uh, practical issue of having mri in small city so it's safer to have a, a slab and re look at 3 to 5 days because within 5 days there is i think uh, we are going to lose and we can always have a look but yes in on a day one you suspect something is fishy yeah you can go for directly for i'm not saying deliberately you delay but if there is the dilemma and there is no uh, complete evidence of fresh lesion or something like that you can always have a re look but uh, don't say ki soft tissue injury abhi do hafte baad aana and then you have nothing to do moreover i think sir an early mri will have lot of hematoma and the the, the definition of the lesion will also not clearly demarcated by the radiologist also that's also one of the points to okay so then please come whether we should go for ct or mri so mri is better because the all the all the problem is here uh, is non ossified cartilage so the mri will be always be better but depending on the practicality uh, the ct will be better than having nothing okay, and if you go on x-ray it's not it's not ct Dr. Suresh, I think uh, again, micrography is a good option. Yes, yes, yes. Anyways, uh, yeah, uh, MRI will need sedation. Yes. Yeah. So, and you need some kind of intervention, some close reduction, yeah. whether to take the child to get a get an arthrogram done. Yeah, yeah. We can detect the. Suresh, one thing I want to add that uh, now this in this era of high resolution ultrasound, it is always better to go for high resolution ultrasound even in in a. Ad- in a slightly elder uh, patient because the high resolution ultra sound will tell you about the discontinuity of the cortex if you are getting the discontinuity without any uh, any correction then of course you can go for ct uh, go for mri otherwise uh, i mean not always going for mri because mri would be uh, i mean not technically viable number one ortho orthography uh, i i feel if you are not having any uh, disintegration then penetrating into the joint is not a good idea always so high resolution ultrasound should also be tried yeah i agree sir the, i think the message should be that uh, trash region should be kept a differential exactly. and a high uh, the higher imaging whatever is practically available should all be there. thank you very much thank uh, you. Uh, dr I want to thank the Department of Orthopedics uh, in Scopa for inviting me again over here. Now, uh, this is a topic uh, which uh, commonly uh, is a uh, matter of considerable de- debate as well as uh, I have tried to simplify it in my talk by not going into the technical details of the various papers and what the different authors mentioned. But to make it simple for the srs and the our uh, junior colleagues to make a decision based on the x ray so it's a relatively common traumatic injury and uh, usually affects the radial neck in children above 7 years of age though in younger age also you might get these fractures now plain radiographs of elbow and ap and lateral are most of the time sufficient to diagnose these fractures treatment is non operative operative we'll come to the details of that that is the crux of the talk and it depends mainly on degree of angulation translation and displacement so remember the three terms you have to see for angulation translation and displacement i have kept this slide immediately in the beginning this is a classification by o'brien uh, done long back this classification itself forms the crux of our decision to whether operate or not operate remember this classification now when you have an angulation of less than 30 degrees you are looking more at a conservative approach whereas when the angulation goes beyond 45 degrees you are looking at an operative approach provide depending on your post uh, angulation reduction and more than 60 degrees is most of the time a uh, definitive indication for fixation 
So I'd like you to go through this image because the discussion will be mainly case based and we will be going through rapidly through all the pixels because I'm the fixation techniques will also be discussed in very brief in the coming slides. There's another classification that is there though. <laughs> this is just being put over here to make you understand the amount of displacements which you can encounter in this branches. Now, indications of fixation, I have just bottled them up and tried to keep it as simple as possible. So there are other fact factors also, which is uh, beyond the sco uh, scope of our uh, junior colleagues. We can discuss that later on. Now, greater than 30 degree following a closed reduction. So as mentioned over there, once you reduce this fractures, then if you are seeing that the angulation is still, uh, is normally, uh, if, if you see that the displacement is more than 30 degrees, you I go for a closed reduction. And in case of more than 10 years, you can accept less than 15 degrees. Can anyone uh, tell me why we accept uh, less than 15 degrees when the age is beyond 10 years? This is a very simple question, actually, just to get our juniors involved. What is the reason? Someone can stand and just tell. I think you people have been quite, very quiet, actually. Exactly. It's a reduced remodel. Now, greater than 3 to 4 mm translation, I think all the fractures which have been discussed so far, it is an indication for fixation. And when you get a restricted pronation and supination, that is also an indication for fixation. Now, open reduction, when after a close, when you are given an attempt for a closed reduction, if you cannot, if a fracture that cannot be adequately reduced to less than 45 degrees, angulation with closed or percutaneous methods, you have to do an open reduction. But you should also know the pitfalls. There is always a loss of motion. You should counsel the patient accordingly that there will be a loss of motion if you're going for an open reduction. Increased rate of osteonecrosis of the radial head and risk of synostosis. Uh, this is an acute injury. Can anyone make out anything from the x-ray? This is the first x-ray which I had when the patient presented to me. How many see some displacement? Though the talk is on radial neck fracture, how many see a displacement? You can be honest. You can raise your hands. How many are seeing any displacement or think that there is an injury over here? This is the follow up at two weeks. So you can note a small bowing over there on the lateral aspect, which was suggestive that this was a radial neck fracture. So this was the x-ray. Luckily, I had uh, done a proper clinical examination and I had put this patient on an arm sling. So when he came, we continued with that because again, if you'd have gone for a cast or a fixation, it might have led to significant stiffness, uh, stiffness. So always be ready for this. The treatment here is definitely conservative because the angle, there is no angulation as such. That's what you need to understand. Now here is a 10 year old female. What is the angulation roughly? Thirty to sixty, around roughly. So this is the plus minus. But as I had already mentioned, that angle this is around ten year and a female. So in this cases, we have to be a little bit, little bit more aggressive. And this is the technique that I use for reduction. Luckily, with closed, I got the reduction, and then it was fixed. It united at five weeks and recovered full pronation and supination. And uh, I'm an uh, advocate of a little bit early mobilization, providing this. You can make out from the X-ray that we have accepted. A little less angulation, or a little bit of angulation, which will be the uh, why we have accepted that. I'll be mentioning at a later talk. Now, coming to a technique that we use, which is known as a massive technique. This is my case. This one had a radial neck with ulnar shaft. We used a massive technique in this. And uh, so, in this technique, what we do basically is we Take the, we try to engage the radial neck fracture and then we rotate it 180 degrees to get the reduction. But uh, I think uh, this has been well demonstrated in our various presentations, but it is easier said than done. 
it is not very easy to do so if you get a proper close reduction and you are able to reduce it by joysticking i would request you to stick to that technique initially medzu is a technique which i think maybe our seniors will be in a better position to tell that whether they are doing it because we still find, find it difficult to reduce now this is a 14 year old female neglected case almost skeletally mature this came to me at almost 6 weeks now, since i had plans to conserve the uh, the radial head over here we opened it up this was almost rotated by 180 degrees and fixed it with cables now why i have put this x ray over here so it is not an ideal uh, fixation technique in na nowadays because this was the technique or you might have to use a k wire in certain cases and the fixation might be a cross one which i have said which i which i have put over here or you can put two k wires because holding it in reduction is what is required over here now these are the certain special mentions for our uh, junior colleagues and that it is never it is almost never a uh, head fracture except for the trash lesion these uh, uh, this thing lesion just mentioned extension and valgus stress is the commonest cause if you have a 180 degree of flip you have to open and reduce and remember when you are opening you should be telling the patients that there will be some restriction of the movement that is the counsel which is the part of the counseling should include that if you get a full movement that's definitely the grace of god but invariably you should be ready for that loss of motion in 30 to 50% of all patients so again what i just mentioned you need a proper pre op counseling and fast for 2 to 3 weeks and start arm exercises because these fractures are very prone to stiffness Salter Harris type three and four are rare variants. They require audit. Again, coming back to the same point that it will have poor results. Now, they, there are a lot of studies which suggest that attempting close reduction after five days and everything is not indicated. But technically, we wait for almost ten days in that. Then, I, still, you can go for it, attempt for reduction. And in case of severe neglected cases, radial excision has been advised, and they have reported good results. But uh, again, this is uh, controversial. thank you i would like to specially thank dr ajay singh sir for inviting me over here he has been like a uh, mentor to me for the as we were saying dr uh, rehan sir for uh, inviting us and being such a grand host to us and uh, dr pratik for organizing such a good reason. this is my institute in kolkata this is the oldest pediatric uh, uh, hospital in the country it was a, it was established in 1952 and i'm working over there and this is my guru over there my boss uh, professor nk das sir who was one of the founding member of osi so if anyone wants to develop operative skills sir has a huge volume of cases he has an experience of almost 15000 uh, uh, ctvs alone in his 35 years of practice so anyone wants to have a good orthopedic uh, pediatric orthopedic exposure we can definitely arrange that uh, in the institute thank you so much there is open for discussion we normally uh, what we do is we keep the tens uh, the the usual technique for tens is to keep it buried to that level in which it will not be difficult to extract it's the same as the forearm fracture and that It was difficult, as you said. It's difficult with the maxillary technique. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So uh, when I put the tens, uh, it was outside. So I, I thought I will not change. Yeah, outside means what? Like. Put the skin. So. Did this? Oh, yes. So okay. I didn't want to manipulate much. Yeah. Just to remove it from under. No, that is. Uh, so I, I like the cutting the tens. That's what I. Mean. That is a technique which develops over time. That's all I can say to you. that you have to you have it's better to keep it buried inside never because what approach are you using are you going through the like the styloid or through the post, posterior this thing styloid styloid only you can think about going a little bit posterior through the this thing because superficial radial nerve injuries have been documented we have also gradually shifted from the uh, this thing uh, radial styloid approach to the posterior approach now Roughly, we normally at uh, five, five to six months. Roughly. One more question. Uh, 
you showed the technique of K-wire fixation of that. Is there any risk of injuring the posterior interosseous nerve with the K-wire? Yes, uh, there is a risk of uh, injury of so posterior interosseous nerve, nerve, and that is what, uh, uh, like in this, the joysticking technique which we use to reduce that. I'm intentionally not shown that because people, I, I'm not a big fan of that. It actually damages the physis more. There's a physis over there. And uh, basically, the posterior interosseous nerve is a little bit more anterior in the children. So it is preferable. As you can see, the KVS are all from the posterior side and that. So that is the technique which I used because I wanted to save that head anyhow. But uh, preferably, you can use a titanium elastic nail with your reduction manual. After open reduction, how do you fix it? So uh, it depends. We can use a uh, this thing, titanium elastic nail, and that if we can get a reduction, or we can put to this thing, KY after, size. After open reduction. After open reduction, so we can use a titanium elastic nail also because we're getting reduction in that reduction. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek. Thank you. Now I invite Dr. Pratik Bahira from uh, Montpellier Legions, always a guard challenge. Good afternoon, Mr. Seniors and colleagues. After going into the lesions around the elbow and then proximal part of the radius, let us discuss something about Montagia lesions. But the Montagia lesions are actually injuries of the ulna. Along with that, there is a radial head dislocation from the proximal radio ulnar joint. And it has a more than 200 year old history. The first being described in the year 1814 by Montagia. Then in 1844, Cooper came up with some sort of a classification which underwent many modifications. But we uh, should be thankful for Jose Bardo from Uruguay who actually uh, described his results. And after that, his classification is what we are using even today. Basically, why should we discuss it? Well, this is not very uncommon to find children coming to you with lesions like this, with deformities like this. And the moment you get the x-rays, you find out that there was an injury which was probably either missed or not identified or not managed properly. How does a child present? Well, there, there is a history of fall on outstretched hand or fall from substantial height at times in polytrauma patients also. And examination must include the note of any deformity at that time, the three A's, as Dr. Karthik has already emphasized and neurologic and vascular status. Once we have done this, we have to understand this basic uh, relationship of radius and ulna with each other and radius and ulna with the distal part of humerus. So the radius and ulna practically are uh, two bones, but they act as a single joint type of thing with a proximal radial ulnar joint, an interosseous membrane, and a distal radial ulnar joint. The capital M of the humerus articulates with the radius in all the positions when the elbow is moving. So uh, there are times when patients will come to you with history, you get the x-rays. Do you think these x-rays are enough? Are they sufficient? If you are happy with just looking at the fracture over ulna and with the forgetting the basic principle of getting x-rays of one joint above and one joint below, then yes, you are okay. But the moment you get x-rays one joint above and one joint below, you will find that you have actually missed out a lesion in the distal part in the, uh, of the humerus, in the uh, sorry, proximal part of forearm. And when you get the x-rays, what are the things you are going to look at? You have to look at for obvious relationship between the radius and ulna, relationship if there is any obvious fracture or not, and the relationship of radius with the capital. And this relationship is what is classically being identified with the help of what is called as the radio capital line. And this line is it, it has been classically described to be drawn along the long axis of the radius. But recently there are papers who have reported that this might not always be true. And that this radio capital line might not be a good idea if it is drawn along the long axis of the radius. Why? Because there are about 16% of radiographs in which even in a normal, normal elbow, if you draw a line, so this is an unrelated case, not having any sort of montage region. But if you draw the radio capital line along the shaft of the radius, it is going to miss the capital. So the new line has been described. What line? Yes, the radio capital line, but drawn along the neck of the radius. So this line uh, has been now proven to be better for identifying your radio capital alignment. And this is because there is a definite 
angulation between the proximal part of the radius in the neck and the shaft. This angulation is about 16 degree and you get and miss the diagnosis in 16% of cases. So once you have done this homework and you have identified that there is something wrong, there is a fracture in the radius, there is a fracture in the ulna, there is a dislocation of the proximal part of the radius from the capital, then you focus on management. How do you manage? Basic idea, basic concept, first classify. How do you classify? Presently accepted Bado classification. There are two aspects which you have to look. One is the angulation of the ulnar fracture and direction of displacement of the radial head. So based on this, apex anterior, ulnar fracture, direction of radial head dislocation anterior, type 1. Similarly, posterior is type 2, lateral or radial is type 3, and rarely when both radius and ulna are fractured, the radial head goes in any direction that becomes type 4. Along with this, there is a group of lesions which we label as Montagia equivalents. So these are the lesions where you, you, cannot, <clears throat> you cannot fit them into any of these criteria. But they have a radial head dislocation, there is a fracture. After you have classified, you must know what are you aiming at. So our aim is to reduce the ulnar fracture to regain the length. We have to reduce the radial head dislocation and maintain this alignment till the fracture heals. How do you do? Well, at present, the accepted guidelines and uh, in the recent international course lectures, Ring and Waters have used that description by Ramsky. And what they have described is an ulnar-based approach. So how do you decide? You decide by looking at the fracture of the ulna. Is the fracture of ulna incomplete? Is it a green stick or plastic deformation? No worries. If this is the scenario, simply do a close reduction, but keep the patient under follow-up. If the radius, sorry, the ulnar fracture is a complete fracture, but it is length stable. That means either a transverse or a short oblique, an intramedullary nail into the ulna and then addressing your radial head dislocation is the way to go. If your fracture is complete, but it is length unstable, either comminuted or long oblique, then you go for plate fixation. So this is a description by A. Wilkins. He, he was the primary pro uh, propagant of non-operative management. But what he has described is beautifully is the way you have to reduce. So the three-point fixation technique, you reduce the fracture in type 1. After that, because it is type 1, you have to decrease the pull of the biceps, you flex the elbow. Alna, you reduce it by countering the direction, but to maintain the reduction, you extend the elbow. For type 3, you have to reduce the radial displacement, you have to give a valgus pose. Once you have done this thing, the management for non-operative management is a long arm cast. These are the different positions for type 1, it is a flexion, type 2, it is an extension, type 3, extension with a valgus movement. But in all of these, what is important is this one. Close follow-up, weekly x-rays, check if there is any displacement happening or not. Let us go through a few case examples. So, uh, this is a case of a child in whom there is a complete fracture, but it is a transverse fracture. So, we were able to obtain this reduction, fit, uh, fix with an elastic nail and obtain a union in proper time. This is a child who has a relatively long oblique fracture. When we tried to attend the reduction, because in order to maintain stability, we went ahead with the plate fixation. So can a child present late? Yes, it is very common in our country. When can the child present late? If the consultation was not sought in time, very common in our villages and uh, backward areas. Parents, they short treatment, but unfortunately, the clinician failed to identify the lesion. There is a plastic deformation of ulna, which the clinician was not able to pick up that and diagnose it as an isolated radial head dislocation. So late presenting children, they will present with a deformity, invariably either virus or valgus. There can be presentation in the form of movement restriction, chronic pain, and at times, ulnar neuropathic symptoms. In this scenario, the principles of uh, treatment will be, first, classify. You can use the same Bado classification to classify. Assess the alignment of the radiocapitular joint. Assess the overlap. Then, you have to <coughs> define for your surgery. What surgery? You have to go through Boyd's or Popper's approach. Ulnar osteotomy and regaining of ulnar length is the primary aspect. This can be done either immediately and fix with the plate or gradually. After that, if required, you have to do a reduction of radial head by open technique. Then you have to stabilize the ulnar osteotomy with either a plate or fixator. Finally, if required, you have to stabilize the radial head by, uh, by a sling procedure if it is required, not always. So let us go through this example. So this is a child, the injury has been missed. When the child came, it was already three years down the line. But when we assess, what we find is that there is a missed Montagia lesion. When you do the Muvarex line, you clearly find that there is a uh, bowing of the ulna. And then you assess the amount of deformity. Here I measured the deformity was 10 degrees. So what, what did we do? 
we uh, went through the boil's approach we can see the aerial head in the depth of the wound capital m lying over here next what we did we use a dcp we bent the dcp the amount of angulation provided is twice the amount of uh, angulation which we measured it is not described anywhere but this is what i have learned from my seniors and colleagues so after that you put put the first screw as near to the coronoid process as possible you open up the displacement uh, so you open up the osteotomy assess whether the radial head is reducing or not if the radial is, is not reducing you may have to increase the amount of angulation even put in some amount of distraction after that the radial head is reduced now we were able to restore the radial alignment and uh, this is what the uh, osteotomy looks like after healing so it is not always that how do you decide where do you um, do the osteotomy and where do you uh, put the plate how do you put angulation in the plate so it depends on where the apex is if the apex is lateral the angulation in the plate has to be just opposite it has to be medial so this is one of the example where we performed an osteotomy same osteotomy but the angulation was according to the angulation in the deformity so finally these are the few papers which suggest that uh, reconstruction of annular ligament is not always a necessity you have to assess whether the uh, reduction is stable if radial head is well reduced then you can go away without doing any reconstruction of the annular ligament in summary timely identification of the ulnar fracture is the first uh, fracture uh, first step to identify whether the lesion is montagia or not you have to look at the radio capital line to clarify your doubts reduction retention and reduction of both ulnar and radial fracture is important and in late presenting cases you can go for surgical management and that primarily requires an ulnar osteotomy and radial head reduction which can be done either acutely or gradually as and when it is required thank you very much Thank you, Mr. Mathi, for a wonderful lecture. First question I'll ask you: In late presentation, when you have uh, done osteotomy and everything, and reduce the red head, will you reconstruct uh, annular ligament uh, with the fascia or not? So, so the answer uh, I tried to answer that here also, but probably the lecture was quite very fast. I ran through slides. So the answer is: It is not always essential. You have to first reduce the radial head. and you assess the reduction whether that is stable or not you take the elbow through entire range of motion flexion extension pronation supination if you are finding it is unstable then you have to reconstruct otherwise you can leave it as such and there are many papers even dr atul bhaskar has presented a very large series from india only in he, in which he did not actually did any reconstruction and the, all the elbows they went on to do well so it is not essential the decision has to be done on table after you have done your osteotomy and reduction of the radial Even up when you are reconstructing the uh, annular ligament, then you have to fix the head to the capital level or something like that. No, 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 sir. There is no need. To. If if you are already reconstructing, that means that you have gone to that level where your radial head is reduced. Now you are bothered about the stability of the radial head while you are uh, going the taking the elbow through the range of motion. The radial head uh, reconstruction, annular ligament reconstruction, is to ensure that your pronation supination movements are fine. So it is not not necessary to fix again. And you mentioned the next step. This for residents. So most of the time it is missed in our country. So you should have a clinical suspicion and you should take a proper true lateral view. If you don't take the proper true lateral view, most of the time it will be missed. It's because of the poor quality X-ray or poor not taking some oblique view, you may miss these patches. And another point is for how much angulation you will give, sir. Because how will you calculate how much angle? But if you want to bend the plate, how much you calculate? So uh, actually there is no clear cut guidelines uh, how much you should bend. So what I have in about eight nine cases which I have done, what I realized was that when you measure the angulation, which you can do by measuring line, drawing the line along the two parts at the level of angulation on the ulna, you find out how much it is angled. You double it. So in the first go, I simply double that angulation, and if it is stable enough, that is fine. If not, then you have to further it. So another trick is some people use intraoperative radio capillary wire, and how much the angulation in front of the ulna creates, they will bend and they will remove the wire later. Okay. So that is one fix, and we use just we don't use always over. We use just just the thickness. So, but just is one of the ways in which you can do a gradual one. Yeah, but if you are getting some good lengthening of surgery, exactly. But if it is something which can be achieved acutely, yes, then it is probably plate, more plate. comfortable for the patient. Plate or pins, whatever. Thank you, Doctor Bhati. I think we are running already short of time. Now I invite uh, Doctor Suresh Chen. And Dr. Ravi Chauhan for BBFA fracture in adolescents. Conserve or operate a debate for fourteen minutes.
I think you are taking seven minutes each. Yeah, yeah. I will try to explain. So I'll be talking uh, regarding the forearm fracture in adolescence, and I'll try to uh, justify the conservative approach and its uh, place in current era. So I don't have any uh, financial disclosures. I have shared uh, took some cases from our CES to show here the results of uh, low reduction in adolescence. So this is a 14-year-old child who presents with uh, closed fracture, both bone forearm, uh, shaft of the ulna and radius. And there is no distal neurovascular deficit. And as I mentioned, there is no compounding or any uh, wound. So how many of will uh, think about doing a casting and close reduction and how many will directly go for tens? Cast. I think there are a few friends of mine here who are uh, uh, choosing uh, casting, uh, but uh, most of the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in current uh, phase, most of the teenagers and adolescents are directly undergoing tense fixation to have more predictable results. But I'll try to con uh, convince that there is a role of conservative approach also. So, periodic forearm fractures are uh, quite common in teenagers, and uh, it has been uh, described that the incidence is higher, almost double in uh, the school going age when we compare it to toddlers. So obviously clinical examination is a must and rule out all the uh, compounding injuries or neurovascular deficit and com uh, the compartment syndrome. The uh, neurovascular examination may be tricky in uh, children and a close observation and repeated examination may always be required to rule out the uh, neurovascular injury. The, uh, 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 the representative x-rays are very uh, necessary and as uh, described in previous uh, talks that the proximal joint and distal joint should always be included and there should be a true AP and true lateral view so that we don't miss just the angulation and the acceptability criteria is based on the angulation and uh, reduction is based on the true AP and true lateral views. Here is an example which shows that a true AP and true lateral can have a different picture when we have an oblique or uh, not so perfect picture. So concern regarding the forearm fracture in uh, adolescence is malunion. So, so this is classical uh, picture from uh, the Rockwood that the uh, motion of uh, radius is in a conical fashion over the ulna. So there is a certain arc where the radius moves in the pronation and supination. So if a malunion happens, obviously this arc will reduce more so when the remodeling capacity is less. So this is our first concern. The other concerns are stiffness, probably not so much in children. Osmosis issues because forearm is not much covered with uh, soft tissue and the uh, the ulna is subcutaneous bone, so the osmosis might be an issue. Just like in this case where the radius is too much bone and the patient is worried about the osmosis and the limited remodeling potential in the adolescent. So this is a tabulation from Matthew et al, which shows that how much of range of motion is lost when there is a deformity. For example, if there is 10 degree of uh, deformity left in the radius or ulna. There will be uh, insignificant loss of supination or pronation, roughly less than 3 degrees. However, it, it goes up to 40 degrees of restriction in both planes if there is 20 degrees of deformity in both radius and ulna. So it gives an idea about the approximate acceptability criteria as well as the, uh, uh, the uh, I mean, decision making in adolescent where there is limited remodeling capacity. Also, the ulna is subcutaneous bone, so it is more susceptible to cosmetic issues. And the radius is because it is moving over the ulna or the motion as I shown in the previous slide. So it is more sensitive to rotational problems than the aesthetic issue. So the uh, final decision will be obviously depend on the site of fracture because the distal probably will remodel more. The type of fracture, I mean the transverse will have more stability rather than a comminuted or long spiral fracture. Any soft tissue interposition which is Hampering our uh, acceptable reduction and growth remaining. So remodeling happens at the distal area and if for the radius it has been classically described as 10 degree per year. So after 12 years probably there will be very limited remodeling capacity. That is what we are concerned here. Some remodeling also occurs from the lengthening because the length of bone itself gets increased. So the deformity is, is percentage wise less. So again this is also limited in the adolescent. And intramembranous opposition on the concave side and uh, resorption on the convex side is also one way of remodeling. Again, that is uh, may be limited, uh, although it is not uh, related to physical growth. 
So here is a tabulation of pros and cons of cast and surgical treatment. Cast has benefits of having long term uh, track record without any complication of wound in infection, and it is without uh, probably having uh, too much of surgical intervention. And it has cons of its own having uh, no control over the reduction failure, and the frequent follow ups are always required in adolescence. So if I go regarding the AO philosophy regarding the forearm fractures, they treat adult, adult supracondylar uh, adult forearm fractures as intraarticular fractures, and they uh, recommend articular fixation, anatomical fixation, and they recommend plate fixation in most of the cases. So the uh, the uh, uh, trend is going towards surgical fixation in adolescent forearm fractures as per the AO recommendation for adults. So is there any role of conservative? So. few situation i feel where the conservative is still have a choice and i will try to enumerate them undisplaced or minimally displaced fractures middle or distal half of uh, distal one fourth of shaft or the distal forearm fractures stable pattern like the transverse fractures obviously having a two year of growth left like a 13 year old or 12 year old boy will have definitely better chance of conservative rather than a 12 year old girl and a thin built child having a narrow canal where we cannot put a tens and again a fitness issues for a surgical fixation so what are the points to remember while doing a forearm fracture by conservative approach we should look at the move of radius we should look at the rotations we should look at the overlap of the cones at the fracture site we should look at the angulation and the displacement so radial bow is maximum at the 60% of the radial length and the rotation is uh, uh, described by rang at all that the the radial styloid is always opposite of the bicipital uh, 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 bicipital groove and there is a crossover sign that the in the supination it is crossover at the proximal one third and in the mid prone position it, it is at the distal one fourth and in the supination there is no crossover if there is, is any discrepancy there will chance of mal union or mal reduction which should be seen this is an example where the crossover sign was missed and we have a myelinated forearm which is probably not acceptable in adolescent the overlap is again uh, a small amount of overlap is acceptable and angulation which is roughly estimated that 10 degree in upper 15 in mid and 20 degree in lower is acceptable considering two years of growth remaining is there so if i summarize the acceptability criteria for adolescent where, uh, which is the topic here so 10 degrees of probably angulation and 30 degrees of mile rotation if we can assess and uh, uh, almost 100 percent of displacement is acceptable so tricks to improve the uh, outcomes of casting are well selected case so i am putting very limited indications for uh, close reduction a good casting technique and molding is no replacement for any uh, other thing wedging option should always be kept in mind and compliance and follow up should always be there otherwise we cannot determine the outcome so the principles of good forearm casting are interosseous molding supracondylar molding and the radius so three point fixation should always be there if there should be thin padding a stocky net followed by a, a, a ready made a soft roll cotton roll should be applied but the cast material should be evenly distributed the ulnar border should be straight and the cast index at as described by chess at all should be less than 0.7 so it, the uh, debate will always be between above and below elbow so for shaft fracture there should always be above elbow the elbow should be flexed supination or pronation the volar apex should be kept in uh, the uh, pronation and the dorsal apex should be kept in supination although the uh, the classical teaching was that the proximal forearm should be kept in supination and distal should be in the pronation so these are our uh, common adverse outcomes when we treat the children with the, a uh, close reduction we should keep it this in mind a few articles are there which justify the uh, close reduction and they have described a, fav a favorable outcome without uh, much of issues in the long run so this is the example which i discussed i will finish uh, my talk with this so this was treated with close reduction based on the narrow canal and the tens was not able to uh, there was uh, less chance of passing tens so we just uh, did the close reduction and in the follow up we had very good outcome and the child is functioning very well these are the functional things thank you ha uh, doctor doctor ravi doctor ravi chand thank you doctor
good morning everyone uh, thank you ajay sir for the invitation and uh, i remember in 2019 may i have conducted a post graduate teaching program for pediatric orthopedics and uh, serve as the course director for that program and since then i'm with sir so thank you sir and i'm really thankful to rihan sir and pratik uh, and the whole organizing team for the kind invitation so <coughs> coming to my topic that uh, i think uh, my friend uh, uh, suresh has spoken a lot in favor of me operative as compared to his non operative treatments so my topic will be both bone forearm fractures in adolescents and i will be speaking on uh, operative treatment why why i consider it more factual more reasonable in this adolescent age group so to begin with with a disclaimer that i am not a die hard fan of nailing or a plating in pediatric orthopedics and i do respect biology as much as other pediatric ortho do but with a saying that what is right is not always popular and what is popular is always not right it was rightly said by albert einstein so <clears throat> it's not necessary that whatever is the common traditional and majoritarian view is always right uh, as compared to the other view which is more factual which is more logical so if we speak about both bone forearm fractures in adolescent age group then these are the fractures mainly of the radius and ulnar diaphysis and these are the third most common fractures in pediatric population that's why we are speaking about it and the peak age, unfortunately the peak age of incidence of these fractures is 9 and 14 years in boys and girls more than 9 years this is the age group which comes into the adolescent part so definitely that's an <clears throat> coming to its anatomy there are various muscle attachments proximal and distal ligament attachments and the interosseous membrane and the radial bow these things are very vital for the restoration during our non operative treatment so if we are skilled enough to restore these things then definitely non operative treatment can be a solution but there are chances of fa much failure so definitely the restoration of radial bow as pointed out by suresh also that uh, it has to be restored in a proper way okay so coming to the remodeling potential another thing that uh, suresh has highlighted about that uh, he himself said ki uh, there is very limited in adolescent age group so definitely patient's age is not in favor of non operative treatment in this part and also the fracture pattern which is mainly the displaced and complete fractures in this age group so coming to the decision making how we decide in this the major considerations that are two prime facts one is the patient specific considerations and another are the surgeon specific considerations so what are those important thing which we consider about the patient definitely the age group is more important and fracture pattern and its position position i can consider in the diaphysis but fracture pattern is much more important because the 100% translation and displacement is, is 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 not a good thing for us to consider the non operative treatment and the remodeling potential that is also not in favor in this age group which is very limited and minimal coming to the experience and expertise definitely if there is a both bone fracture and other surgeon is doing and some senior pediatric orthopedic surgeon is doing he can restore those anatomical considerations but if some young surgeon is doing and even the other people are doing that they may not be able to restore the anatomy to that level as compared to the senior person then definitely the surgeon's experience and his expertise come into view of management of these fractures non operative management the whole crux depends upon the accuracy of reduction stability of reduction as well as the remodeling potential i have already pointed out and there were the acceptability criteria that were given by the noonan and price in their landmark paper and <clears throat> you can see in this paper also they have said that more than 2 years of growth should be remaining so if we are considering the late adolescent then definitely that much of growth is not remaining so coming to the obvious reasons for the operative treatment these are the obvious reasons like unacceptable reductions loss of reductions less than 1 or 2 years of growth remaining open fractures and pathological fractures which are relatively new or zero was kind these epicellular humerus fractures means along with the forearm and the humerus fractures are associated in this we are not having any controversy so coming to the adolescent they have less red modeling potential definitely distal is 75% and complete and displaced fracture patterns i have already pointed out so definitely this group of population they are bit hesitant to board the flight of non operative treatment they have the reason for it because of their less remodeling potential and because of their completely displaced fracture patterns 
That's why they are not ready to board the flight of non-operative treatment in the absence of insurance policy of remodeling potential. If you are not having that insurance policy and your accident prone fracture pattern is there, then definitely you will not be comfort comfortable in boarding that flight of non-operative treatment. So let's, uh, and literature is also in support of that. If we see this paper, there's an 11 experience, then in this, you can see that there is an increasing trend towards the operative treatment. And the observations about this paper that <clears throat> the mean age of the patients treated operatively was 11.2 years. That whatever the amount of patients that they operated or the failed to the non operative treatment, maximum of them were the, of the adolescent age group. And therefore, they recommended the low threshold for the operative fixation. Coming to the another paper, that what are those factors that predict the instability in pediatric diaphyseal bone forearm fractures? You can see here that. Age more than nine years is one of the important factor in predicting the instability. Okay, <clears throat> this paper also that non-operative treatment of both bone forearm shaft fractures predictors of early radiographic failure of the JPO. In this, you can see the odds ratio for the age more than ten years is three, proximal fractures is six point eight one. Then definitely age is not in favor of us. It is also supporting that. Coming to this paper, predictors of conversion from the conservative to operative treatment of pediatric forearm fractures. In this also, you can see the most significant predictor of conversion to operative management is the age at the time of age. So definitely, age is not in our favor. Coming to this paper, this has also suggested that increase in the surgical treatment of forearm fractures was seen most drastically in the 8 to 14 years of age group or 15 to 17 of age group. So, and this, this, is, this was one of the important papers that predictors for operative treatment in pediatric proximal third fourth bone parameter fractures. In this also, you can see that the age of the patient, amount of initial uh, fracture displacement are the two important factors that predict the bad outcome in this age group. And <clears throat> uh, similarly suggested by the Walker et al, Moman et al, and Thomas et al, they all predicted the same things, that the initial translation and the age group, which is not in favor. So let's have a balanced approach. Okay, algorithm for both bone forearm fractures in adolescents. If we are having such adolescents in this age group, and so definitely what I follow that I give an initial reduction attempt. Okay, and if I find my fracture to be unstable, or I am not finding my comfortable enough that to reduce that fracture, then definitely I opt for the operative treatment in this age group with a very low threshold for the operative treatment. Even if I find the fracture is stable and acceptable, then I uh, depend on two things, proper counseling and the caution to the parents that I will go for the non-operative treatment. I am more in favor of operative in this age group, but if you want to go for the uh, non as the fracture is stable and ex uh, acceptability criteria I am having, then definitely I, we can go for the non-operative, but with a caution that in coming future, it may be converted to the operative if we lost the reduction. Okay. So during follow-up, if the if I find the stable and acceptable reduction, then definitely I continue with the non-operative treatment. But if during my follow-up there is a loss of acceptable reduction, I go for operative treatment. Okay. So yeah, the art of war, you there is a famous book by Sun Tzu. You all must have heard that if you know the enemy and know yourself. You need not fear the result of 100 battles. Your enemy here is the fracture pattern, is the age, and yourself, your capability of reducing the fracture, your capability of uh, taking out the acceptability criteria. Okay, so to conclude with, I conclude with my disclaimer first slide that though I am not a diehard fan of the nailing and plating in pediatric population, and I do respect biology, but it's better not to hesitate to use your weapons when you know your enemy has no very, no or very little respect for your client attitude. Thank you. And uh, in the last, I want to invite you for uh, this basic Elizabeth of course that I'm conducting in coming September on 9th and 10th of September in Delhi. This is a two day comprehensive uh, Elizabeth workshop, uh, which consists of Elizabeth frames as well as the rail fixators application on TVR as well as the frame. And Dr. Mangal Pahyad will be the course director. Thank you. Now, so uh, I invite both the uh, speakers to on the on the ties, and uh, now it's open for uh, uh, this debate is open for the discussion.
Sir, regarding to implant, if the age is uh, less than nine, uh, 10 years, then I prefer tens. Otherwise, more than that, I go for plate sometimes. Any other question? What about artificial damage in male? Sir, you mean tens? We are not violating the physics. We are just uh, doing it extra physics. So, the entry point is extra physics. Lower third price, okay? Uh, in lower third. I use the uh, integrated uh, part from the proximal part in, radi in radius of Allah. Radius of Allah. In radius, yes. sir, if, in, if it is at that uh, metaphyseal diphyseal junction, then definitely uh, I will use the plate, not the tense. Because tense is not a good idea. Otherwise, in, in an attempt to do the entry point, I may break the further uh, cortex. Any other question? Uh, sir, in both bone fractures, after reduction, how can we decide that the reduction is stable or it is it unstable? After? After reduction, uh, reduction which we have done is stable or unstable. How can we decide it? The thing is that if uh, even if after the reduction, you are not having any uh, during the application of the cast when you are providing the band uh, padding and all, all those things you are doing and you are reducing the uh, acceptability criteria or your reduction then definitely is a stable fracture but especially in comminuted fractures or like that means uh, you have reduced the fracture now you need to apply the cast for that you need to apply the bandage what i follow and even if during the application of my bandage and my cast fracture is uh, uh, reduction is lost, then definitely it may it will not be stable for further. It is not the reduction which is stable or not stable. It is the pattern of the fracture which is stable or not stable. So you have to think about the fracture pattern. If it is from day one, it is uh, a I mean uh, the pattern is uh, is uh, unstable type of pattern. Then you have to keep as very close watch. Maybe after seven days you have to go for uh, uh second x-ray so at the time of reduction every fracture will remain unstable you you can't you can't uh, accept that uh, at that moment it would be stable it is a pattern you have to see uh, i mean few two questions from my side what is your concept because uh we and dr sanjay we are from the old era where there was a concept of osteoclasis do you still believe in the uh, philosophy of osteoclasis or not in uh, in both bone fora fractures? Yes, sir. Um, many times when we have a late presentation, they are in angulation. We always go for osteoclasis and, and, and primarily treated also if I had a very good reduction in initial thing, but I have lost some reduction in my follow up. I can always again go for osteoclasis and we can again put a cast and again uh, for the uh, if he is using the nail also. He can do osteoclasis and put a nail if he's getting a late friend. So uh, my my say to my uh, young colleagues that uh, there is a uh, concept of osteoclasis that which is very well documented and it still hold a position uh, in the management of forum, especially if you are talking about uh, the adolescent age group. If you are managing why uh, what the X-ray uh, I think Suresh showed. In the that was two for the conservative, and after second uh, second week we have to go for a check X-ray, and uh, majority of time if the, if the molding and the cast index is not up to the mark, then there are chances of uh, slipping of the fracture. There is a chance under uh, image intensive where you go and straighten the uh, that uh, angulation, and you will get a very good result as far as the conservative is concerned. Number two thing which I always ask my uh, my colleagues, you are using, suppose uh, uh, you are using uh, nail, if you are not molding it, so the message should be the proper molding of the tense in radius is very, very important. Because if you are losing uh, the bowing of the radius by putting a straight nail, that that is that is again going to restrict your supination and pronation. So it is either you go with uh, for the plate or you go with the molding of the uh, tens. So all the students here must understand that there is a concept of molding of uh, of the tens before putting into the radius.
Dr. Ravi, I have one question. <clears throat> First of all, very good presentation. Uh, there is a uh, there are few doubts for residents. Many people ask us that. Sir, what to fix first? Should we go for various or should we go for what? I, what I follow that uh, whichever bone looks easy to me, I go for. There is no entry point of. Uh, sir, in uh, case of tense, it's extra partial, just uh, proximal no? on the lateral side. Yes, on the lateral. Sorry, lateral on the medial side. Also, also. No, no. So one. Last question. Yeah, uh, sir has mentioned about the molding of the titanium elastic nail, like we prevent it before we it. I would like to, because the conservative uh, management is a dying art. We are gradually losing the technique, we, the plaster molding, which our seniors used to do, we cannot do as good as that because most of it is shifted towards the operative side. Because we don't want to do the conservative and do wants to do surgery. That's why we are, we are losing that art. So technically, if possible, this is a message to the uh, our uh, students. If possible, try to learn the art of interosseous molding in a forearm fracture from someone who is more senior than us. Try to learn that because if you do a proper interosseous molding in the in these type of fractures, most of the time you need not operate. That's what my senior used to say to me, and I was lucky enough to get a uh, boss who, whose orthopedic experience was more than my age. Yeah. I wish you get what is like. That was super fundamental factor, who have a forearm factor. Detection to aapko karna hi padega. Okay, surgery does, what he is taking the surgery, ye op open surgery versus, uh, uh, versus uh, percutaneous yes, fixation ki baat nahi karta. At least the percutaneous fixation, he is including the, in, into the surgery, but uh, what I feel, is a is a extended part of the conservative treatment. After doing the proper conservative treatment, you are not uh, relying only on the plaster, but you are relying on an internal fixation in the form yeah. of exactly. so. For me, that is a extended part of uh, of conservative treatment. Then that conservative treatment will be successful only if you will be getting a good reduction by conservative means. So uh, these boys cannot uh, go away without uh, doing the proper reduction. That, that's a sort of close reduction and in internal fixation. Yes. And as Sir has asked that uh, what about the distal fractures? Sometimes we use the uh, K wires only just to hold that metaphysical part and putting a cast. But application of a cast is in what Sir has pointed out maintenance of that radial bow for Dr. Uh, Vishay has pointed out the uh, uh, interosseous membrane. These are the two important things. You will not notice in the fracture reduction time. Your fracture reduction may be okay, but maintenance of that uh, space is more important when you follow the patient later on, that you may lose the range of motion. Thank you. That's Thank where you. it is. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Suresh. And uh, now, uh, next speaker is Dr. Anand, uh, Anand Ajmera. Uh, to, who will speak on the tips and tricks of the elastic nailing? Sorry, I have said it before. Because he was tip and trick me aata tha molding. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Professor Anand was supposed to be here, but unfortunately, because of the nice of the study, uh, stayed back for attending the funeral. But he has kindly provided the slides for the betterment of all the residents and delegates to join. So uh, let us go towards the tips and tricks of intramedullary nailing for both bone forearm fractures. So uh, if you look the way the uh, these are a comparative slide showing the features of a pediatric bone and the effect they have on the management. So in all of these, what you find is that the bone, even though it, it has got more collagen, it tends to fracture easily, but because of the thick periosteum, it has rapid healing. So there are two counteracting things. And for this purpose, one of the important thing which is uh, which has been devised and used is usage of an elastic nailing principle. And elastic nailing is not only meant for forearm fracture, but also for other long bones. And primarily, uh, the basic principles are they, these elastic nails can be made up either titanium or steel. They follow the principle of three point fixation. One point being the entry, one point being the distal fixation, and one in the middle at the level of fracture. Then. If you have to use two pre contour nails of preferably equal diameter, rather almost always equal diameter, and the diameter of the nail should be 40% of the isthmus diameter. 
maximum bend of the nail should be at the fracture side. Now, if we look at the principle of ESI in, in both bone forearm fracture, there are somewhat little changes. What are this? The radius and ulna come into a special category because you do not use two nails in these bones. Rather, you consider both the two bones as a single unit and use one nail in each bone. So instead of putting two nails in the radius and two nails in Allah, you use one nail in radius and one nail in Allah. Because of the uh, very essential fact that both of them together form a single unit. The pre contour nails are to be placed such that they have a concavity facing each other and that concavity has to be directed towards the interosseous membrane. So the convexity is out, concavity is in, in the nail. Normally, the diameter of nail which is used is 2 to 3 millimeter and instead of 40%, it is preferable that each nail should be two-third of the diameter of the radius and ulna of the ulna medullary cavity at the mid shaft. So, this information has been taken up from this book. I don't know whether it is now freely available or not. Otherwise, there was a telegram channel which was providing you free books. So, important thing is <coughs> you have to prefer to use both the nails of the same diameter. These are the essential equipment. The plier, the nail, uh, definitely, T-handle, impactor and all for making it. How do you do it? First and foremost, patient position. Patient should lie supine. You have to have a radial lucent table, uh, image intensifier coming in from a comfortable position and monitor placed so that you can see without bending your body or neck much uh, more than required. So uh, this was the question, which bone to be fixed first? As Dr. Ravi told, there are one thing is you fix whatever is easy. But the concept which has been given is that even by the AO group is that you try to reduce the radius first. The reason being, ulna is relatively subcutaneous bone, which you can somewhat control the reduction with your uh, fingers and hand. Radius, you, because of the higher muscle bulk, you cannot actually directly control. And then, if, suppose you have um, tried trying to reduce, so the radius is already reduced, but your ulna is not getting reduced because you have initially passed in some part of the nail in between to engage. So you have to withdraw the nail, not completely take it out. Then try to manipulate because then your uh, bone bone forearm will be a bit more, much more mobile than when you have already uh, passed the nail across the radius. So this was what uh, Professor Adhya Singh sir was telling that what is important is proper pre-bending of the nail. This pre-bending has to be done so that you have a curvature, the apex of curvature, which should be about three to four times of the medullary canal at the level of the narrowest part, that is Mr.Mus. And this curves should be smooth a uniform single curve and both the nails have to be having a symmetrical curve. It is not as if I will be reducing, providing one curve at one location and a curve at any other different location. What is important is that you have to use only the length of nail which is going to be inside the bone and you have to bend it accordingly. That means you will be provided a long nail. You need not bend it completely by holding it at the ends. You have to use these nails, use image intensifier decide what is the length of the nail which is going to be inside the bone and then bend accordingly. So as uh, Dr. Anand has very beautifully pointed out, <coughs> so you have taken, you decide this is the amount of nail, you decide these are the two end points, then you bend. This is the wrong way because the operator is holding the nail as, at the end and bending. The correct way is you decide where your uh, nail is going to be in the bone, then bend. The entry point Usually radius, you can, um, the preferred is a retrograde entry, entry from distal. So this can be done radial, proximal to the radial styloid, taking care that you are not damaging the physis. You make the incision, dissect it out gently, then you place the awl, take the awl, initially uh, directly perpendicular to the bone, it should be inserted, then you gradually angulate it and open up the canal. So this is the way you have to gradually open up the canal. Then this is what is provided by the standard manufacturers, the AO set. But uh, in our country, you have to improvise something. So Dr. Anand has very well pointed out the easy way of improvisation. That you tie one gauze piece to one end of the T-handle, standard T-handle. Put in the nail. See that this gauze piece is tied in the same direction where the tip is facing. So this helps you to identify where your tip is directed while you are inserting, even without having uh, these uh, standard equipment. 
So you insert the nail in such a manner that the curved portion is going to hit the opposite cortex. This this curved portion is meant for only that purpose. That it has to slide through through the cortex. It should not be piercing. It should be sliding. So once it slides, you have to gradually negotiate, negotiate, and negotiate. These are the pictures taken from the standard AO textbook. So here. For the radius, the entry has been made. Initially, the all is directed perpendicular. Then you go to an angle of 45 degree. Insert the nail. Standard practice: extend up to the fracture. Stop. Make the ulnar entry. Insert the nail. Extend up to the fracture. Stop. Then you advance the nail on the radius so that you have negotiated the fracture. Then you advance the nail on the ulnar side. In case at this stage you you are finding difficulty, take back the radial neck, uh, nail a bit. Try to re reduce the ulna. Try to insert it further. Once this engages into the cortex, then you pass the radial na uh, nail, then pass the ulna nail. For the ulna, the preferred incision is in the proximal part, but you should not be directly putting an incision, uh, similar to what you do for an adult square kneeling into the tip of oligonon, because there is a growth plate lying there. You should not be directly injuring the growth plate. Rather, it has to be posterolateral incision on two centimeter proximal to the oligonon tip. You dissect it out. Same technique: initial perpendicular, then angulate, and then the same way you have to insert the nail also. The curved part goes in. Then your hand moves up so that you have now brought this curved portion against the opposite cortex, and then this slides down into the middle canal. Finally, the nail has to be cut, and preferred is to cut in such a way that you are able to bury it inside instead of leaving it outside. Because it will take around minimum of three to four months to for it to heal properly, and then by the end of six months you are uh, ready to take it out. So the nail length cut has to be as Dr. Suresh told. It should be such that you are able to take it out properly without uh, without too much of dissection there. So the uh, trip uh, the trick is the trick is you insert the nail under CR, then withdraw about an inch, cut it, then use the impactor provided, then you hammer the uh, nail further in. And you just leave a small portion outside for it to you to remove it uh, comfortably. So successful outcome will be after you have united the nail has taken off successfully. At times even this becomes tricky. So you have to remove the nail at proper time. So finally, you have to pay attention to choose the diameter of the nail properly. Pre-bend only the required length of nail and not the whole length. Follow the principle of ICL sparing insertion technique and leave only minimum required length of nail outside the hole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Before the flexible nails had come, what nails are used in the patients? Before, sir, uh, if you are saying about this, then endless nails were definitely there. Even K wires have been used. And what about square nails? The square nails are there, but sir, the way square nails are designed, they cannot be used in children. So Russian names can be used, but uh, not the square nature. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was also asked a question about uh, removal and keeping it outside. That's a very tricky part of using a titanium elastic nail. Now, I have developed a technique for helping. It's not the foolproof technique, but what you do is when you keep that part outside, Try indenting some part of the nail with a plier or something so that you create some wedges over there before you have introduced. That helps in holding it when you are removing it after six months or when you are. It's a practical trick. It is something which we, which, which I learned over time because removing titanium elastic nail after it has the bone has remodeled in children is a very difficult thing. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. But Pratik has uh, done really well. Yeah, somebody else lecture reading is difficult always. I request Dr. John Santoshi to present on pediatric wrist and hand injuries, diagnostic and management challenges. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairpersons and uh, colleagues. I'll be talking about uh, pediatric wrist and hand injuries. So why are we talking about this? In this population, the assessment can be challenging because the presentations are often innocuous. The injury patterns are often different from the adults because of the differences in the mechanism of injury, the presence of open physis, 
and also patient compliance may be problems. Uh, there are delays in appropriate treatment. There is a risk of long-term morbidity. And we also have a very short period for intervention because of the faster growing rates, uh, healing rates in this population. These are fre uh, frequent injuries. Uh, commonly, we have door crush injuries, especially hand getting trapped in closed doors at homes or in the car. Uh, fractures, tendon injuries, and even burns are common in children. Phalangeal fractures are the most common hand fracture in adolescents. Coming to hand fractures, about 15, they constitute about 15% of all pediatric fractures and almost 2.3% of emergency visits, emergency, pediatric emergency visits. Uh, so there are challenges in eliciting history and also performing physical examination in this population. So there are peculiarities in children. We have been hearing about it since morning. So bone growth occurs to the physial plate, which is unmineralized and which is weaker than the surrounding bone. Following fracture, there is differential growth at the physis. There is remodeling, which can happen uh, at the diaphysis, which can correct after uh, for substantial, uh, correct for a substantial initial fracture displacement. And in the motion of the, uh, there is correction in the plane of the motion. So in the flexion extension plane, there will be correction. So as shown in this uh, X-ray, the even though the fracture is mal aligned, still if this patient was treated conservatively over a period of time, the fracture has uh, aligned itself because the fracture was in the plane of the motion of the adjacent joint. The physis itself is vulnerable to shear forces. It can uh, bear compressive forces. It remains strong. strong. Uh, so most commonly, uh, fractures happen in the shaft. There are limited attempts at flow reduction should be done because there is a risk of physal damage when you do repeated flow reduction. And there can be physal arrest, which can lead to angular deformities or even joint malalignment. So tough fractures are frequently seen. When you have a child who's got his finger in, impacted somewhere in a closed area, so you can have nail hematoma and frequently you can have a fracture of the tough. Now, this is something which is also frequently seen with a similar injury. Can anybody say, what is this? What do you think? Yeah, very simple. Looks like a nail aversion. So what we see here, if you look carefully, the, you see more of the nail, almost the entire nail is seen there. What is required is to take a proper true lateral view. And what do you see now? You see that there is a physical separation. So this the name for this condition is the same old fracture, which is an open physial fra uh, fracture of the distal phalanx. Now this is this important. This history, this uh, injury is unique to children. It has to be differentiated from a mallet injury because the mallet is a aversion fracture at the base of the uh, physis, whereas this is uh, base of the epiphysis, whereas this is to the physis. The treatment for this condition has to be uh, done very carefully. You'll have there is the nail bed which itself, which itself is also injured. So you'll have to open up this, this side, lift the nail plate, repair the nail bed. You have to replace the nail plate again, and then uh, an axial wire would lead, it, lead to a good result. So as we're talking about this, there are strategies which we have to uh, have when we're dealing with hand injuries in children. So history taking is so important. A lot of times you may not be having uh, the history of what actually happened. So if the child has grown up, then he may be able to give history, otherwise it may be an unwitnessed injury. Uh, we also have to look for, uh, uh, also have to keep in mind that there may be instances of abuse, which we have to be uh, careful about. When you perform a physical examination, ask for the child to uh, move the fingers and ensure that there is proper alignment of the fingers. When you bend the uh, flex the fingers, all the fingers, they will point to the uh, tubercle of the scaphoid. So obviously you see that the little finger is uh, going out of plane. X-rays are frequently done. So you may have 
a very long oblique fracture. Ultrasound, the role of ultrasound is growing up in our practice. And uh, if in case you feel that you are not suitable or you're not qualified enough to treat this, then always be prepared to refer the patient to a specialist. So when we talk about pharyngeal fractures, these are the parts. So additional phalanx, we have the tuft. And then for the other phalanges, we have the condyles, the neck, the shaft, the base, the metaphysis, physis, and the epiphysis. So pharyngeal brace fractures, which are fractures which happen close to the physis. So if they are minimally displaced, they have a high degree of remodeling. If they are displaced or they're unstable, so you should be going for a surgical fixation. Pharyngeal neck fractures are classically seen in children. So they have poor remodeling because they are far from the physis. So in displaced cases, we'll have to do a surgical fixation. So see, um, then you have condylar fractures in which you have a double uh, density sign in the lateral view, which is important. And for unstable fractures, you'll have to do a uh, surgical fixation. So what are these unstable fractures that we'll see in the subsequent slide? Metacarpal fractures, uh, these are fractures which can happen in the shaft or in the neck. Usually, head fractures are rare in the metacarpals in children. They are common in adults. In the uh, head fractures, if they are seen, there are sort of heavy type 2 fractures. Usually, the metacarpal fractures are undisplaced because of the thick periosteal hinge, which affords for stability of the fracture. The usual displacement is an apex dorsal angulation. So the AAS maneuver is commonly used for a metacarpal neck fracture, which you're aware that you flex the MP joint and the PIP joint at 90 degrees and push the proximal phalanx dorsally. That will reduce your uh, fracture at the neck. Well-molded casts should be applied for at least three to uh, four weeks. So when we say well-molded, the padding should not be too much. A long arm cast may be required. Otherwise, for a small child, the child can just simply shake the hand and the cast may fall off. So you may have to do a supracondylar molding for these children. Again, for displaced and unstable fractures, KY fixations are frequently used. So when you talk about displacement for a neck fracture or for a sharp fracture for metacarpal, it should be not more than uh, 10 degrees for the second metacarpal, 15 degrees for the thir third metacarpal, and 20 and 30 degrees for the fourth and fifth metacarpals. For the thumb metacarpal, uh, commonly at the base of the prostate line, there is a avulsion fracture of the ulnar collateral ligament, frequently called as the skier's thumb, which is a type three shoulder head uh, fracture. A pseudo skier's thumb is a type one or a type two uh, epiphyseal injury. So this is skier's thumb or pseudo skier's. Pseudo skier's. Sorry, skier's thumb. Uh, scaphoid fractures. They are relatively uncommon in children. Fallen or stressed hand is the uh, most common uh, mechanism of injury, and this is also the most common, common carpal fracture. We have fractures both of the uh, distal pole as well as of the proximal pole and the shaft. So these uh, injuries are seen as they are seen in children. Diagnosis and treatment: you have to understand the ossification and drug supply. So. Less than six, you may have to require uh, you may require an MRI for diagnosis. Treat them as adults. Immobilize when you suspect a fracture. Digital leader fractures are the most common pediatric fractures. Almost 20, 36 percent of fractures in children, which are increasing because of increasing participation in sports and also increasing body weight. So these are metaphyseal fractures. So you all know about torus fractures, Greer stick, and they can also be compression fractures. They are inherently stable, so require a short period of immobilization with a wrist splint or a short arm cast. You have to differentiate between physical fractures and bicortical fractures when you have, as compared to this, incomplete fractures. Uh, these fractures can have significant displacement and will require a growth reduction, which remodels with growth. But this thinning may be required. So this is what is the torus fractures. What is torus? Torus is the is a geometrical mathematical a geometrical figure which is like a uh, donut so it's called torus and this is a, a green stick fracture so there are risk of displacement redisplacement uh, when there is increasing obliquity 
increasing uh, initial displacement and also subvertebral reduction and young children, not only for displacement, but also for other hand factors. Also be aware of tendon injuries. It is a simple tenodesis effect, which we, need, which we do. So when we extend the wrist, the fingers fall in flexion. When we flex the wrist, the fingers fall in extension. So this should be done. Also look for the normal casket of fingers. So if you throw the wrist, all the fingers will be flexing. If the fingers are out of casket, suspect tendon injuries. Also look for mallet finger, jersey finger, and central slip injuries. So mallet finger can be treated with a uh, closed means by a splint or can be treated with A wires and pole erection. Now these are two injuries. This is a on the polar aspect, which is a aversion injury of the polar rim. Whereas this is on the dorsal aspect, so this is a central slip aversion injury. This can be treated with a, a simple immobilization for a short period, about one week, and then mobilize. If you immobilize longer, this the finger can become stiff. Whereas the central slip injury should has uh, has to be immobilized for at least four to six weeks. Dislocations, as we've been hearing, even in the hand, are also relatively rare because the ligament uh, structures are stronger than the immature developing bone. So the joints in the hand are relatively stable, so it can immobilize. You can use body taping for immobilizing an early range of motion, but when they're irreducible, then you have to do surgery. So I thank you for your attention. Any question? Thanks, sir. It was a nice presentation. Uh, as you are a head surgeon and you must be witnessing a lot of injuries, how often you encounter, sir, uh, in case, especially in case of metacarpals and phalangeal in pediatric population, post traumatic uh, facial injuries, deformities? How often you encounter this? We do encounter. A lot of times the injuries are missed and uh, you get the neglected patients or patients who have been uh, missed as referrals. We do see them. Because uh, in hand, we are not that much cautious as compared to the other parts of the body in children, in putting K wires. We put here and there sometimes, and even the normal general pediatric also, general orthopedic surgeons. So that's what I was thinking. So, you want to, uh, what do you prefer? And is there any deformity correction at that part or some? You we, want to uh, we have done a few uh, deformity corrections for angular deformities. Yes. Okay. Whenever you first found it. Yes. Them. And uh, usually, that, that also can be fixed even with simple KY, simple KY of the beginning. And second question regarding the scapoid. Uh, what are your indications of moving into uh, operative in case of the scapoid fractures? And personally, I've never seen a, I mean, I've seen open fractures, open, open injuries with uh, scapoid fractures also, but close injuries in a child with scapoid fracture are not treated as that. Uh, but then what the recommendation is, you treat them as you treat adults. Yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Santoshi. Uh, now, uh, we are opening up uh, the case discussion. First, uh, is the Dr. Vishal. And you have five minutes to present your case. And after that, Dr. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Santoshi. So, an eight-year-old boy presented to us. Uh, with his uh, cracker bust injury over his left hand and he was referred to AIMS Trauma and Emergency Department one day later. So on examination, what he had is uh, amputation of his thumb and uh, avulsion of tina muscles, a lacerated wound over uh, second web space and uh, there was uh, amputation of third and fourth digit distal segment. These were the clinical images at that time. Now the initial radiograph, the radiograph showed that uh, there was an amputation of thumb at the level of base of metacarpal, fracture of second metacarpal at the base level, fracture of neck of metacarpal head of third, fourth, fifth metacarpal. So, vote from audience for reconstructing this. Any ideas? How can you proceed? So the problem here is there is an amputation of the thumb. The amputated part is not available, so you cannot do a revascularization. Second thing is the level of amputation in the thumb is very important for deciding what how you should reconstruct it. So it is at the base or the, almost at the level of the CMC joint. Another thing is thinner muscles are also lost here. 
so the options usually for the thumb is either osteoplastic reconstruction polycization or a free toe transfer so something about osteoplastic reconstruction usually what is done is a tricortical graft is taken it is usually done if the amputation is at the level of the mcp joint you are uh, do arthrodesis then uh, you do a tube in groin groin flap you later on division and insert now for uh, giving some sensation over the flap you neurotize it with the island pedicle flap so this is how it works osteoplastic reconstruction of thumb usually done by orthopedicians another option is free toe transfer now here uh, also uh, what you can do is the great toe you can only take up till proximal phalanx because the ball of the first metatarsal is required for weight bearing so if the amputation is at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint junction then great toe can be taken otherwise the entire second ray can be excised and can be used this requires a microscope and excellent microsurgical experience that is the limiting factor so this case was managed was emergency wound preparation was done then uh, primary polycization of index finger was done along with kvr fixation of third and fifth metacarpal neck fracture and a groin flap at 3 weeks post of the flap division and flap insert was done then at 2 months the kvrs were removed occupational therapy was started and uh, mcp flexor traction was splint was given 3 months post op now because thinner muscles are lost so extensor indices soconus plasty was done and uh, some limitation in flexion was there so third dorsal mcp capsulotomy was done so this was the flexor traction which is applied on the third mcp joint 6 months follow up x-rays the new cmc joint has been found there clinical uh, images 6 months so usually polycization is much more discussed in pediatric population in thumb hypoplasia but uh, for traumatic thumb amputation it is very reward giving surgery and one of the largest case series they described that their mean age was 43 years of age so even very good surgery in adults also take home message is the technique of reconstruction depends upon the level of amputation of the thumb and the damage to the adjacent fingers and soft tissue patient's age occupation and the surgical expertise available the thumb amputation at the cmc joint level is a absolute indication for polycization polycization of index finger not only restores the length it also restores the range of motion stability sensitivity and the appearance in cases where the thinner muscle is lost then uh, it usually requires a secondary tendon transfer for opponent's plasty thank you if there is any query uh, what was the how was the function of the hand after that he had a good function because uh, for the radial club hand in similar situations in children we usually don't uh, advise polycization after a certain age because they are very well adapted and that's uh, what i'm saying yes sir it is 43 years of age mean age they are doing they are uh, the cortical plasticity what you are saying i think so so it is very well adapted actually in our india only in uh, amrita institute they have done two or three hand transplant patient who had had a hand almost four arm amputation five six years they don't have any limb there now they are, they are uh, transplanting a new limb that uh, cortical uh, plasticity again adapts it so there is no issue with that a vishal person from us i would want to congratulate you for such a difficult case it has been managed well sir i'm uh, so proud of you uh, coming up as a young uh, hand surgeon having trained at aims my question is uh, uh, for a lot of us who do not do our hand surgery or for some of us who have the privilege of having somebody like dr john or you to take care of those cases what is the current consensus in our times we used to have a mangled hand injury and the first choice was isko just laga do emergency right and then the patient used to be left alone right so is just still there or have certain modifications happened so that even in a rural setup or in a slightly smaller setup the hand injuries can be managed better sir actually hand injury is little bit different from other orthopedic injury what you need to understand is you need to give function the end result you have to think not only the coverage or how just to fix a fracture 
to the patient end results matter so and most of these surgeries are state surgeries not a single step surgeries so you need to make a plan at the just initial stage only itself how you are going to proceed it till the end if you are able to do all the stages then you do it otherwise you refer him do a debridement and refer him so are we looking at a scenario where like a tumor surgery yeah now they said that if you do not manage a malignancy definitely till the end refer it to a hand surgeon definitely sir because uh, doing it uh, referring it what sir was saying that uh, malunion have you corrected the malunions that is much more difficult and the end result is definitely not that great yes i i agree if you are not able to do it uh, you should refer it rather than making it difficult for the other person thank you very much and now uh, the second case discussion by dr uh, good afternoon to our honorable director sir ajay sir my head of the department dr rehan sir all of the faculties of my department and all the eminent faculties who have attending this session across the country i am presenting the case which was updated in our department last year now coming to the history of our case it was a 10 year old boy who presented with an alleged history of a road traffic accident following which he sustained a close injury to his right elbow on examination finding the boy was conscious oriented with with stable vitals there was a swelling which can be noticed around the right elbow the range of motion of my patient was the painful and there was a no neurovascular deficit now coming to the initial x rays so among the house especially for the junior residents if anyone can identify the fracture uh giving some clues uh we can see on the anterior posterior and the lateral views there was a some fracture around the radial neck the second clue there was some fracture around the coronoid process of the ulna with the subluxation of the elbow so we diagnosed this case as a case of the terrible triad so initially we stabilized our patient while applying the ever valvo slab this was the after applying the ever valvo slab of the patient now what will be our plan if anyone want to volunteer about it so we planned that there was a open reduction and stabilization of the fracture fragments these were the intraoperative findings we used a standard posterior approach and after performing the chevron osteotomy we can identify there was a radial neck fracture we can easily see the radial head fragment on going for that further dissection we can notice there was the osteochondral fragment of the coronoid process of the ulna so we primarily stabilized the osteochondral fragment of coronoid process using the k wires and the ethibon sutures the further the radial head stabilization was done by applying the another couple of k wires followed by the tension bend wiring for the olecranon osteotomy so these were the post operative axes at the six weeks follow up we noticed that our patient pain improved and we can on the follow up axis notice there was some sort of a joint congruity obtained so we make a decision of removing the k wires this is the 6 months follow up my patient so after the 6 month we decided to remove the plant but because of some issues we don't have the post operative after the removal axis so what will be the take home message from this case these injuries are uncommon in the pediatric population a terrible triad injury almost always renders the elbow unstable so making the surgical fixation necessary for such cases the posterior approach has several advantages including it provides a panoramic view in the elbow access to the both medial and lateral aspects of the elbow can be easily done and it precludes the need for a second medial skin incision unlike the adults pediatric patients can tolerate immobilization for longer periods and bone healing is faster in children rather compared to the adults thus pediatric terrible triad injuries can be treated easily with non rigid fixation and immobilization for 6 weeks which allow the healing without major consequences to our ultimate function for the patient thank you thank you very much uh, of, uh, we are already very very late so i would not uh, invite any any further question and i will ask the organizer to go forward for the quiz pd quiz
Okay, sir. Meanwhile, sir, we set up the meeting started. Amendment to the remaining sir, we will be facilitating there. Sir, and yes, please, sir. What you come? Give the amendment to the speaker. First, I will call to Dr. Anurag Tiwari, please. Thank you, Dr. Anga. Now, Dr. Suresh Chen, and you come on the desk, please. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Dr. Pratik Dara, please. Thank you, Dr. Ravi Chan. Thank you, Dr. Zaghi. Dr. John, John Santosi, sir, please. Thank you, sir. Dr. Vishal Champawar. I will invite Dr. Sukla, sir. And we come on the dash, give the nominators to our clear person. Sir, can we announce the results of the poster, please? No, I think there were uh, 10 representations today, and we have gone through them. We have evaluated them uh, on various points, which is overall the visual appeal and quality of the graphics, conciseness, appropriate and relevant content, accuracy and grammar, and affiliation. And after uh, evaluating each poster on these grounds, we have come to the conclusion now. First one, the uh, first prize goes to Mohit Kumar Israni. Presentation on the novel approach of dual dome osteotomy with plate osteosynthesis in a 14 year old adolescent female with failed hemi epithelial disease for bilateral genu vera. Congress Dr. Israel. Second, uh, second prize goes to Dr. Nikhil Ranjan. In case of acute bilateral SCFE, is he there? Dr. I think age, I think age from the elementary college. I think from from the
एक्सिबिशन पे फिल मास्टर पे डॉक्टर मनीष राजपूत एंड डॉक्टर अंकित जैन एंड इट विल बी मॉडरेटेड बाय द डॉक्टर मनीष पे दिस पार्टिसिपेंट टीम 1 डॉक्टर राजेश रतन डॉक्टर हेमराज टीम 2 डॉक्टर मनी बंगा डॉक्टर सिद्धार्थ जैन डॉक्टर हेमराज एंड डॉक्टर राजेश रतन टीम ए टीम ए टीम बी विल बी डॉक्टर सिद्धार्थ यादव एंड डॉक्टर मनी बग्गा टीम सी इज ऑफ अरविंद डॉक्टर अरविंद एंड डॉक्टर स्वाति नाउ रूट्स ऑफ द क्वेज द क्वेज विल बी कंडक्टेड इन द फोर राउंड फर्स्ट राउंड विल बी Uh, the question will be of majorly of the hist historical aspect of the pediatric orthopedics, and the second round into the clinical OT, and it will be a buzzer round. Third round will be an MCQ based, and fourth will be a rapid round, rapid fire. In first round, there will be six question. Each team will be asked two question. Each right answer. Yeah, uh, the team will be marked uh, given pen marks for the each right answer. There will be no negative marking, and question will not be passed, and can be passed to the audience. The second in second round, there is six question. There is a negative marking of five mark if uh, answer is uh, incorrect, then there will be a negative marking of five marks. The question uh, the question will be passed. To the next, uh, next team. If uh, he is not able to answer that question, third, uh, third round of MCQ also includes the, uh, six question, and in rapid fire round there will be six question for each team. Let's start. Round one. <laughs> Yes, question. Some of the questions will be passed to the audience. Example, the final authority. Manisha. 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 What is the main contribution in advanced in orthopedics? The uh, it's the uh, onset technique of uh, casting for right. Uh, right. CTV. Right. Next, next question will be to the next team. 
identify the person tell me now third question to the third team see the team identify the person marking 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 आप लोग रोज करते हैं उसको क्लास से लगाते हो इंडियन टाइम्स ऑफ इंडियन बॉन्ड है बाहर प्रैक्टिस करता नहीं नहीं आप आप नहीं फैक्ट नहीं 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 � Time up. The question will be passed to the audience. Anyone uh, want to answer this question? Any PG? Any PG? Okay. Dr. Sabir, Sabir Pirani. Second part of this question is, what is the main contribution in advancing orthopedics? Batama. Pirani scoring in. Yeah. He has given the modified Pirani scoring to score. It is the objective score of uh, to assess the club for performance. Now. Five 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 now question number four to the team A again. Team A. Team A. Identify the person. Sir, I have to tell you. There must be some time. Yes, sir. 30 seconds. Time up. Time up. Wrong, wrong answer. Any anybody from audience? PG, PG. Any PG? Okay, Asa. Asa. Doctor Asok Jai. The second sub sub question of this question. The founder of this society. Topic. Yes. 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 The question passed to the audience, PG. PG, PG. Any PG? जिसने परसीज किया है वो उसको बता सकता है। नाउ एसआर डॉक्टर बेंजामिन जोशा। नाउ सेकंड। व्हाट इज़ द मेन कंट्रीब्यूशन इन पीडेटिक ऑर्डर? सन्नी आंसर दिया। ठीक है। मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट। मिरो मिरो Next question, 
to the third team, C, team C, identify the implant. Now pass the audience, PG. <laughs> Now, sir. Oh. Most. Okay. Here it is used. More No prompting allowed. Give now the first round completed uh, after that uh, the total scoring of first round uh, team a scored 15 marks team 10 and team c 5 marks now moving to the next round that is The question will be asked on the bar, ward round, clinics and routine. Question number one, is actually A. So, hello, sir. Use it. Uh, I mean, I don't start to open up right now. Less than six months of the year. Think six months of the year. Six months of the year. Okay, Identify the AFO and indication. Question for TV. Flow reaction also. We are ready to use. What is the indication? The incomplete answer. For what? In case of a fracture of bones or ankle fracture, no. It is used in cardiac surgery. Half mass. Half mass. Sir, half mass. That question to the team C. Identify the spleen. What is the use of the thing? Blue pulley that is marked with the blue. Okay. 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 Question number four to the team A. Which nerve is at the risk in this approach? Which nerve? Which approach? Without. Okay. Right on. Later, if you want to finish now, the approach is. Next question to the team. For open reduction, internal fixation of displaced humeral lateral lateral condyle fracture, the section around which portion of fracture fragment should be avoided to protect its blood supply. Okay. So, yeah. so, we will 
Bill out, bill out. Switch on the mic. Switch on the No. Uh, pass to the next team. Post here. Post here, right after. Now, last question for this round for the team C. Identify the disorder. This pass to team A. Pass to team B. Now to audience. PZ. <laughs> <laughs> Any other PG? <laughs> SR? 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 After second round, the total score of team A is 35 marks. Team C is 20. And team B is 10. The third, third round. No negative marks. Now third third round MCQ age question will be asked. There will be no negative marking, and question will not be passed. Question question one to the team A. When assessing an AP uh, pelvic radiograph for developmental dysplasia of hip, which of the following is a term for a line passing through triradiate cartilage? Mm -hmm. Correct answer B. Tangent in the line. Second question to the team B. Vascular sign of Narak is noticed in C. Posterior dislocation of it. Correct answer. Last time. Third question to the team C. Effort to deformity is seen in A. I this description. Correct answer. Plus. Now, fourth question to the team A. In 13 year old male present with left hip pain and inability to ambulate. The initial radiograph is shown in the figure A. Which of the following zone of the guru plate is most commonly involved in this condition? First identify the condition and which zone is involved. Skippy. Zone of hypertrophy. A, uh, B, B, C, D, D, D. Correct answer. Fifth question to the team B. Radi radiological sign of scurvy disease are following accepted. Subperiostial here is vertical thickening, marginal sclerosis, dense metaphyse, fusion time. Which which one? Pass. Wrong answer. One. Very good. Negative one. 
Next, next question to the team C. Which area of the knee is most likely affected by juvenile osteochondritis discipline? Lateral aspect of medial femoral condyle, lateral aspect of lateral femoral condyle, medial aspect of medial femoral condyle, medial facet of the patella. Now, this round completed. Scoring after this round is team A55, team B30, and team C is 30. 20, and team C is 30. Now, team A is leading. Now, final round, right round four. It will be rapid fire round. And what are you looking for? The person who will come here and answer fast. You have one minute to answer. Answer the question. Yeah, B. Why don't you mark? Okay, 30. Yes, sir. Five minutes are just zero. Okay, so zero. Okay, that's over. That's over. That's over. Okay, total. We will ask six questions to each team in one minute. You choose who is coming here. Okay, you have to come here and answer. The round will be started with the team A. Uh, team A have to answer as many as uh, question as possible. The maximum maximum question we can answer is six. There is no negative mark. Rapid fire as many as possible. If you don't pass, you don't pass. You don't pass. You don't pass. You don't pass. Very good. Numerous migration index is used to assess. Yeah. It's location of the memorial. In which disease? That is the Most common classification used in management of uh, Parthian disease now is. Having three pillars. No. 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 No, I have to No, I have to say that. I have to say that. I have Now, question to the team B. Ready. Violator knee radiograph of 10 year old car. What condition is most likely to be? No. Identify the fracture point. No. Most common approach is in open reduction of the DH, including your own child. Because, like, in juvenile Helox ankle fracture, or ligament, osteochondritis, or the right. Which must have most commonly causes a dynamic deformity in the swing phase. Of gauge following concept casting. Six. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
identify techniques and join in what is right answer. Cosmic angle is used to assess the severity of identify the pathology in X. Pass. 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 Final scoring after the TC 80. Now winner is TC and TC winner. So, uh, after this interesting session of quiz, uh, before we break for lunch, I would like to welcome Professor Sanjeev Gosar, becoming a senior minister of physics and so on. And I would like to invite him and Professor Ajayasar to hand over memento and prizes to the winners and the organizers of the quiz. Uh, Dr. Is the winner, winners, uh, Dr. Swasti Prasad and Arvind. So, we are happy to fire around the last question. We asked the rapid fire round, change their luck, and they won by five marks. <laughs> Runners of our Dr. Hemraj and Dr. Rajesh Hassan Goyal. And also, I uh, should give a big hand of applause to the team B. Actually, we had five teams, but the two other teams that could not come, otherwise, it was the total five teams. Then, I would like to uh, request Dr. Manish Rajput to please collect the memento. I mean, to, to Dr. Manish Rajput, please. Then Dr. Ankit Jain. Dr. Manish Devedi for wonderfully managing the scoreboard. Then I will request Dr. Jitain Sikha sir, please come over. Dr. Rahul sir. Dr. Rahul sir, then we have Dr. Pankaj and Dr. V.K. Verma. Dr. Pankaj sir. Last two, uh, Dr. Udit and Dr. Shekhar.
So we want to thank Dr. Uh, Bhav sir and Dr. Ajay sir. Now we will break for lunch and then after half an hour we will gather for the last two sessions followed by the PG interactive case discussion session. The next session will be on fractures around the femoral neck and femoral shaft. After that, injuries around tibia and knee.
I would call Professor Dr. Sanjeev Gaur Sahab and Dr. Jitendra Sukla Sir, please. So after the lunch, we are going to have an interesting session on uh, fracture femur. Talk on neck of the femur fracture challenges and management. I just call upon my dear friend Shivay Shivasa. So at the outset, I would like to thank <clears throat> I would like to thank Dr. Rehan and Dr. Pratik for giving me this opportunity to present my talk. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gorsar and Dr. Shukla sir also, and uh, all my dear friends and colleagues. So, <clears throat> the topic given to me is challenges in femoral neck fracture management. This is a difficult topic. So, let's delve into it. So, this fracture is, is less than 1% of all pediatric. Injuries, fractures. They are called. They are because of high energy injuries, road traffic accident, or fall. And this fracture is known more for its complications than for its occurrence. Size matters. There is a wide spectrum of fractures, right from the smaller kids to adolescent groups, and the management totally differs. So when the child comes to you, there has to be some treatment decision to be taken for managing these cases. What is the age of the child, whether it is a kid, a juvenile or adolescent? What is the location of the fracture from the physis that will be covered in the classification also? Whether you want to do close or open reduction of the fracture? If the child is coming in the late evening hours or mid the midnight, should we do an emergency surgery or do a plant surgery? And what should be the implant according to the age and location of the fracture? And the lastly, how to immobilize the child because only fixation is not sufficient in these pictures. So now complication or the challenges to prevent are first and foremost the AVM, then second is small union, most of the time it is coxagara, non union improper fixations, and premature facial arrest if it is crossed. Then the loss of fixation if the biological principles are not uh, followed. So to overcome these challenges, we have to consider timing of surgery. For me, it is always a planned surgery. Even if it is coming in the late in the evening or night, I would like to do it with the proper stuff, proper OP timing and with the proper implants. I would like to decomplex the capsule so the hematoma is evacuated and that will lead to good perfusion of the head. Accurate anatomy reduction is must. Implant selection for a... Uh, Small children's K wise, four mm CC screw or six point five CC screws, or DHS or sometimes etc. Also, spica I would like to give to smaller kids. Now coming to classification, double classification is time tested. It is hundred year old and now popularized after nineteen twenty nine by Doctor Colonna. So it has got four types. Type one is transpicial fracture, A and B with the B the dislocation. Second is most common fracture, that is trans cervical. Third is cervical trochanteric. Third in occurrence and intertrochanteric fractures around 11%. Coming to case, this child came with a history of dislocation. So it is fixed with the K wire, reduction, close reduction, and fixed with K wire. Now, with all epiphyseal injuries, it is important to follow up the child, even if the reduction seems good. This child was followed and eventually 
the five year follow up it landed with the avian oxavera trochanteric overbook now the same epidural injury the report reputation is reporting nearly 100% of complications but this this is reported two cases for none other than dr gans where they have done where the cases uh, pressure dislocation came to them and they have been they done safe surgical dislocation and the follow up of four months seven months one year and two year they did not report avian but the safe surgical dislocation is a is not a like that you can uh, see on youtube and do it you have to learn and then execute it's a uh, it's a part of learning curve this is another fracture uh, road side accident this is like a type 1 this is it close reduced fixation with 2 cc screw and eventually the results are good so in type 1 treatment for undisplaced uh, fracture spica was advised for undisplaced or displaced fracture previously the spica was advised now following in uh, following 1922 1992 for displaced fracture they have said closed open reduction plus inter fixation by smooth or threaded wires or by cc screw If a dislocation is present, you can take a CT scan. Coming to transcervical fracture, this is most common. Fractures and occurrence most common in uh, complications. So this is a 80-year-old fracture, uh, 80-year-old uh, transcervical fracture. It is uh, close reduction then and uh, fixed with a two CC screw. Then this is supplemented with a spica. This is another fracture. This is two-week old fracture. Close reduction was tried. did not came so open reduction was done by watson jones approach and the head a var was introduced into the head joystick was done and reduction achieved and fixed with 3k wires eventually the child had good functions so type 2 fracture needs proper attention proper implant size and placement like this uh, fracture which is fixed with two cc screws but the screw length were inadequate so as anticipated the screws moved away <clears throat> implant failure was there but luckily fracture healed but this cannot be a norm in this case this 11 is shown fixation length with uh, 6.5 cc screws and fracture gap is still present threads into fracture line this case was uh, known that it will give away and it happens so the screw gave away the certain non union so all these fractures needs a spica supplementation with the spica after fixation but normally in our older kids the spica is very troublesome so for this uh, to overcome this you has come with a you have pediatric hip plate whether they say that you don't need spica the only disadvantage of this plate is its cost is around 45000 in the market So as we are at the number, some of our doctor have developed this plate, uh, side plate construct. Where they put a one inch screw through the plate and two in the shaft, one or two in the shaft and one uh, uh, without going into the plate. And uh, this gives good stability, and you don't need a uh, spica supplementation. So in this fracture, even if transcervical fracture because of known complication, they should be. Fixed even if they are dis undisplaced, capsule decompression can prevent uh, avian. There, though there is controversy in literature for and against, but there is no harm if you do it. Because one study in uh, SCFE they have put a probe into the head through a screw, through a screw, and then they measure when they operated <coughs> the child and decompression was done, the flow was increased. So there is no harm in doing it. adequate reduction and compression should be achieved now a little tip that when you put a screw tighten your superior screw get the reduction in valgus and this prevent varus so it is not like that in if an adolescent kid come to you and you just put a 26.5 mm screw and you think that it will be okay you need to supplement it with a spica or a side plate and always cross physes if you think that the Uh, the stability is jeopardizing don't hesitate in crossing the phases type 3 and 4 fracture they are cervical trochanteric and intertrochanteric a good paper has come for this type of fractures by uh, tj chandigarh where 
they recommend the uh, fracture to be treated with pediatric DHS and a deregulation is screw. And you need not, uh, need not cross the physis in these fractures because they're very much away from the physis. This fracture less in incidence and less incidence complications. So if close reduction is not acceptable, don't hesitate to open reduce it. DHS recommended in type 4 with uh, derotation is true. So what are the acceptable criteria when you see that uh, fracture is reduced? So there's a lower method with a femoral head with the neck from S or inverted as shift curve in any projection in AP and both lateral. If fracture is not reduced, it will produce broken C curve leading to varus and extension. So the various series have uh, uh, come into complication. Various series have uh, reported various complications. Recent one canal is reported even 43%, Coxavara 21%, Pfizer closer to 2%, and non union around 7%. So how what is how to treat AVN? So this is the AVN after a year of trauma, good fixation. So the frequency of AVN decreases as we move bearing type one frequency decreases as we move away from the physis. So in type 1, it is 100% with dislocation, type 2, 50%, type 3, 25%, type 4, 10%, overall 40 to 45%. So there's no treatment available for AVN once it is identified. So all efforts should be made in preventing its occurring. This has been proved in a paper. Also, for another complication because of malunion or epiphyseal injury, you can treat it with a valgus osteotomy. Now, delayed in a non union, they are 6.5 to 23%. These have been reported in hip fraction in children, long term follow up study by Davidson Winston and other by Dr. Ratliff. For non union, there is a good paper by Sanjati Institute where they have given guidelines to treat non unions. So now, basically, they have divided patients into two types failure of fixation and delayed presentation. If there is failure of fixation, evaluate, evaluate whether it is improper fixation, improper implant choice, implant failure or failure to test biomedical and rule out infections. So plan, they say that remove implant, institute of stabilization of lecture site, valgus astronomy and refixation is stable implant. Secondly, they say delayed presentation, evaluate if there is an excess option, intervening fibrous tissue and rule out pathological fractures. Plan is to institute stabilization across fracture, avoid open reduction unless absolutely necessary. Next reconstruction using fibrous stud grafting, valgus astronomy and fixation with stable implant. To summarize, non displaced fracture do better and less complication regardless of fixation. Fixation is indicated in displaced type 1, all type 2, displaced type 3 and 4, and in older children. Anatomical reduction is must. Stable fixation with proper implant. Younger kid needs spica. Adolescent kid needs side weight construct. Cross spices for stability. So, spices grow 4 mm per year, or there is for uh, contribute 13% for overall limb. Length. So don't hesitate if you need to cross prices. If allergy occurs, you can do time by epidemiologists and uh, overcome it. Plan for surgery as early as possible routine hours with proper implant. No, nothing doing in the emergency hours. MRIs of little use in fresh cases. Thank you so much. Most of your cases uh, you have put uh, across the epidemic. There's a there's selection of cases just uh, giving messages. Okay, but what is now rule is what is can you, you have to cross above the epidemic? Yeah, yeah. Stability, you have to see the stability. If, if you see if you think the step uh, which is not getting a stable, cause the crisis. So but always better uh, stability will be achieved if you put it. Good. But then in the younger kids, you have to do with the KOS and older kids by the CCS group. And still older, then you put a side plane type 3 or type 4. Even type 2, you can put a side plane. Yes, yes, sir. Two questions. One is that uh, those pins which were initially introduced, one was one here also, more spin and novel spin. And you have shown one fixation with KYR also. So why with the spike of a spike of augmentation, you cannot use those pins. First, the most spin and novel spin. Most spin, I, I don't have any experience. I have told you that time also. Uh -huh. But uh, even Dr. Ryan and we were done 
we just at the same time we, we never used to know some more spin or more spin or more spin and we and, used to put a spider and your choice of uh, this thing can you look at it use 4 mm or 6.5 mm so recommendation is below ats 4 mm above ats 6.5 mm but then you have to see the size of the neck also and how many number of screws spider uh, suffice to depends on the age fracture and uh, Uh, neck width, I think two are sufficient. Big just just a small query. I think, uh, and also to the other panelists who are here. Uh, inevitably, you will get some patient who land up with AVN, right? They are ten years old, twelve years old. Then what do you do with them? I put a slide. There, there is no treatment of AVN. It is better to take every precaution to prevent them. No, but uh, now you have treated a patient, and the patient has finally landed up with AVN. You have taken all prevention, preventive method. The child is critically immature, right? So there must be something. I am treat na karein, but manage to karein ki usko. So what is your protocol? How do you counsel the patient? What do you do? Do you see? Then, it, bed then, bed then it depends on the symptoms. Just not the X-ray. The range of movement is good. You can wait for some time. Then it's. AVN has got three types. Whether it is whole head is involved or patchy scars is there. Now some people have said that in a pre-AVN stage, you can put a you can give a trial of zolentric mass in intra-articular in in the head only. So that that you can try. Ravi and other panelists and Dr. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? So uh, actually, it depends on uh, uh, whether it's partial or total collapse and. uh how much area of the head is involved and which part of the head is involved so for partial there are different types of osteotomies uh, mentioned like uh, valgus and derotation of osteotomy so that you bring the normal uh, part of the head under the weight bearing zone if it is total collapse and patient is really symptomatic then either you can go for pelvic support osteotomies or you can wait and do a thr later Do the parietal okay. procedure. There is no direct treatment of AVN. You have to put a good cartilage head into the under the weight bearing area. Okay, to add something over here, uh, I have uh, I have seen two or three cases of pediatric AVN recently. So I'm doing a bit of hyposcopy also. So one we had a bilateral AVN which was evolving in the adolescent age group around uh, that. The male child, age around eleven or twelve, they gone gone all over India to get it treated, but it was neither a CP or a Burkitt. It was a pure alien, as mentioned, not related with neck or femur. So what we did was uh, we did a hip arthroscopy, a bit of ERP or the stem cell which is available in CCD and that, and we did a proper capsulotomy with a bit of different. So somehow, like we don't have any arthroscopy. Yeah, two scope here, yeah. but somehow the entire thing improved. The pain improved on the other side. Maybe the AVN was related with some other metabolic disorder, something. The other side, the AVN gradually disappeared, and the and the right side, which was the most affected side, we ended up having a functional lift for the time. He might need a DHR at a later date, but uh, this is what no, I have been. There is no published reports of no, treating AVN. Personal experience may be different for certain yeah. children. Uh, usually, basically, I have the single team. I have there are few cases that I have seen in my practice, and uh, those are basically I mainly consider them as the late presenters or early presenters. Late presenters, I am sure that I may go for the pelvic support as the uh, way is pointed out. Pelvic support. If the attendants, uh, our parents are ready for the pelvic support, otherwise I counsel them just to wait for the THR and early THR and all those things. And if problem arises when they are early, basically. In that, so there are some osteotomies that have uh, this type. I have not seen that much of experience of those osteotomies because they are the complex osteotomies. I have tried few things like the endo and acid as well said, and uh, in some of the cases, I have also tried the sinovectomy and the capsulotomy. And uh, there are four or five cases, and I, I tried the distraction by using the fixator and the distraction at the hip side. So I have seen like that uh, pain relief is there. But that's not the permanent solution. You mean this arthrodiastasis? Yeah, arthrodiastasis. This actually is a good answer.
I have seen few of these uh, pediatric avian. They are not very symptomatic. Yes. So they can pull on. There is no method which we are practicing. The rotation of the tummy is only in the books. Yeah, yeah. They don't only, take a call only, so they go for TSR, wait for TSR to get in there. Yeah, but if you get at age six years, an uh, avian and the big question, you will only do a TSR when he's 18 or 20 years old. So how to pass that's the question of uh, uh, Rehan. So in, in my experience, they are not very symptomatic. They have some deformities, but they can put on, walk around, sit around. And uh, you wait. The osteotomy which only works is valgus osteotomy, where the normal cartilage can come. And the rotation osteotomy, I have not done. Uh, not many people are doing it. Initially, they don't have that much of pain. But uh, in two of my patients, they were uh, one of them from the Nepal. And the, what I have noticed that through the time, basically that child developed the avian at the age of around nine. And that child, during the course of the time, though he was not having pain initially, but later on developed a severe stiffness around the head. And that, later on realized that, that stiffness, why that was. Maybe because of the local inflammation or because of the pain, he was not moving like that. So there was some pathology. He had developed the, uh, that stiffness. The stiffness is a big problem in the, in the follow up. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vivek. Thank you, sir. For such a nice presentation. Now I will call upon Dr. Spanshu. Bari. How do I manage femoral sharp factors in a spider? Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank our answer and Pratik Bhai for inviting me here. So, periodic orthopedics cannot be in, uh, complete without speaking about spica, be it in trauma or be it in cold orthopedics. So, I'll be telling about the what is the role of spica in femoral sharp fractures. So, by the end of this lecture, We'll be having clear view about when to use spike and femoral sharp fractures, how do we apply it, and when to consider initial traction, when to relate spica or early spica, and what are the possible complications we should keep in mind while using this method. The brief introduction it comprises around 1.6% of the periodic fractures in common in males. So, our aim of treatment in a femoral sharp fracture, or for that matter, any fracture, is to maintain the length, alignment, and rotation. If you follow these three things, our outcome is going to be good. Initial management, patient presents to the casualty, follow the ATLS protocol, airway, cervical spine, breathing, ventilation, circulation, and emerge control is necessary. And after this patient is stable, go for the secondary survey and do a complete musculoskeletal examination, rule out other fractures, other injuries of other joints. We have thorough neurovascular examination, don't miss out on any um, distal venous deficit. Splintage is essential to give pain relief as well as reduce anxiety of the child and the parents. Younger child, you can give a high groin slab or a D slab. A little bit older child, you can use a Thomas print. And radiographs, as I've been mentioned since morning, always one joint above and one joint below. Don't forget. General principles, primary management should be such that we do not need a secondary procedure. That should be aimed. We do a single procedure and that is it. That's it. If you're aiming for two procedures, that means some, there is something lacking in your management. And the perfect anatomic re re reaction is not essential in pediatric femoral sharp fractures. And with younger age, there is more chance of remodeling. And the al alignment of the fracture fragments is more important than actual position of the fragment. So patient presents to you. When do you think of spike up? Patient is less than 5 years. Patient is less than 50 kgs. How do you do know that? Because, because patient is in the stretcher. So you eyeball. You have been seeing child children from childhood. So we know we can make out what's the weight of the child. Less than 48 kgs, go for spike up. Shortening up to two centimeters, you can check the telescopy, but it's a painful procedure if you can do it. Otherwise, by make, looking on the radiographs, you can make out whether the shortening is more than two centimeters or not. And isolated injury. So then comes the fact what spike at table we use. That is a question when I became a consultant, I started asking everybody what spike at table we use. So there are various variations. I got some pictures from Chacha Nero Delhi, KGMC Lucknow, and the um, First year one is there, which is six to eight lakhs rupees, which I don't think anybody in India will be having. So basically, you need a bar. That's the basic funda. You have to have the bar to support the trunk and a uh, trunk table. And you can have variations. You can make up stainless steel. You can make up cardboard, uh, uh, supply anything, and make it. This is jugar for all this. So now the patient is in the OR. So what to do? Now I do not prefer uh, putting a definite speca in the casualty or the injury. Always take the patient to OT because in casualty you have a lot of other factors just on which you do not have control. In OT you are in charge. 
you can uh, you are in complete charge in there in the casualty there are a lot of things in which you do not have control heavier child go for ga top ten anesthetist either mass short ga or iv ga but in indian scenario sometimes ot slots are not available the anesthetist is not ready so go for conscious sedation either with promethazine or pediclorin 5 to 10 ml and there is no issue in that and how to decide whether i have to give sedation or anesthesia approximately lighter the child more use of a sedation heavier the child go for anesthesia application the technique is universal place the child on the spiker table the hips should be abducted as we all know the pull of the forces there is an effective barrier thing at the fracture site so and there is a um, controversy regarding whether the foot should be included in the spiker or not ao recommends not including the foot but what i have learned is include the foot in the spiker and i follow that and always give a valgus molding to the shaft so that to prevent future valgus collapse so and then you put the bar to prevent any so how do we position the limb flexion at the hip of 30 to 60 degrees knee 50 to 60 degrees abduction at 30 degrees at the hip external rotation of the 20 degrees depending on the best look on the cm view the more proximal the proximal the fracture you have to be more hip flexion because the illosus will be pulling the fracture proximal fragment so more proximal fracture more hip flexion and less knee flexion it leads to least loss of reduction because your quadriceps all the vastae they act as internal splint the more you flex the more stable is the fracture reduction so this is the position of the child i include the foot in the uh, spike the acceptable reduction is shortening up to 2 cm is acceptable up to 30 degrees of valgus valgus up to 2 years 15 degrees after 2 years up to 30 degrees of ap angulation on up to 2 years 20 degrees up to 5 years and when you take the check x ray the ap of the hip and ap of the knee should match that shows you that the rotation is intact so you cannot know on the cm you cannot make out the tips and tricks just see the hip x ray knee x ray they should match after care the patient admit always admit the child for 24 hours because your trunk is involved in the spica check the neurovascular status check the radiograph explain to the parents how to take care of the child in the spica because that is important they do not want the parents to come back with a broken spica which is very common in india how explain to the child how to make the patient supine how to make the patient grow <coughs> without undue pressure at the joint of the hip where the uh, trunk and the hip and always tell the patient to report whenever there is a crack or weakening at the hip joint this was a hip spica stroller which has been devised by the Ahmedabad group in which it, it's uh, it's easier for the children uh, for the parents to mobilize the child during the treatment the protocol after you finish the spica check x-ray ho gaya uske baad you always take a repeat x-ray at one week you see if there is any deviation if the criteria is being met if it is not met always be ready for a wedging we either on a various valgus or for an ap angulation subsequent x-rays at third week and then at sixth week Spiker removal, simple formula, the age of the child plus three weeks, you, uh, you don't have to worry about three of the art of the three age of the child plus three weeks. So when do you be ready for wedging? You have sent the patient after the initial treatment, but you have to be prepared key, what, if the patient would need wedging at the first week x-ray. So uh, increased age of the child, a low energy fracture or oblique fracture. These fractures may need wedging, so be prepared. So how much remodeling to expect? There is no rotational correction. Up to two centimeters of overgrowth has been reported in literature, and significant angular deformity is correct correction is there if there is enough uh, uh, growth potential because usually we use spica for less than five years, so there is a lot of chances for the deformity correction. And because the plane of the motion is there in the AP plane, if the correction is more than the various factors correction. So when do you expect more than two centimeter LLD? Increase age of the child, increase weight of the child, and the longer period of immobilization. This has been seen in the studies. Now, delayed spica. When do you consider initial traction before applying the spica? So, if there is shortening of more than two centimeters, unstable fracture patterns like spiral fracture, long oblique, and comminuted fractures, polytrauma and open fracture. Polytrauma and open fracture is doubt is control is again debatable because you can again go for external fixative, which makes the rehabilitation of the child uh, beneficial. But if you're talking only about spica, they should either go for a delayed spica application. There have been studies which have compared the early and late spica application for femoral shaft fractures. So early, it has been shown that it has reduced hospital stay, better patient and parent satisfaction. But in early, there's always increased chances of revising the cast either in the form of wedging. So be prepared for that. Complications, overgrowth and shortening both can occur. Overgrowth of the two centimeters has been reported in patients who are less than 10 years of age. Shortening up to two centimeters is acceptable. 
skin complications as we all know is common and should be looked after yeah. and lastly parents in the pediatric orthopedics we have two patients one is a patient themselves second is a parent so parents view also has to be taken and explained to them they have difficulty in hygiene of the child because there is a caste the child is uh, increased in weight so carrying them is difficult and there is always a loss of pay for one patient parent because one parent has to stay home so these are things has to factor when you speak to the child, parents and the order so summary use spiker when the child is less than five years or less than 45 kgs initial traction when the short thing is more than two centimeters or a bit unstable pattern technique of spiker application read each time and in always include team members because spiker application is not a one-man job and wedging is always handy in loss of reduction and up to two centimeter short thing you should not be worrying thank you thank you dr so this is open for discussion if you rather ask i will ask you one question There is, there is a technique in which they apply initial uh, traction and then in the how much spray and convert the take how much into plaster or top of the plaster. Uh, and I think this successfully done in England when I was some time in order a hospital. So what, what is your opinion? Uh, sir, I have read about it, but I have personally, um, I have never used it. Maybe senior people can say. I have never used it personally. It is a good method yes. because the initial two weeks is to give attraction. In the younger child, they are in the hospital and uh, sir, the anyways, lead, lead plaster incidence will go down. Sir, including Thomas Plain, you know, sir. And first... uh, the other advantage of that is the child can sit up. Okay. The other question is if uh, you get a uh, patient from uh, labor room with such a sharp femur. How do you teach? Do so, you if it is a new, no, no, just new and just take a cardboard piece or something and then you immobilize with it. If you get a public harness, that's also fine. Uh, no need for an extensive immobilization in a younger child, in a new A cardboard piece also is enough for the immobilizing the female. Why cardboard? Why can't it can be public. No, sir, slab because uh, first of all, uh, the skin of the new is much more sensitive. So, I would not like to go to sleep at night thinking what will happen to the child. So I would be happy with just applying this minimal splintage than to spoil my sleep at night. So the method described, they strap it to the abdomen. Have you heard about it? You uh, it? So, yes, sir. But usually if you just give a public hand, which effectively flexes the uh, uh, femur to around 90 to 90 degrees. So that effectively means you are flexing and touching the abdomen. Basically, Tobra was used for transportation of the patient. That is the reason why Tobra was devised. So that is one thing I would like to tell you. But definitely treatment, I don't know, in Tobra. Secondly, I think we are uh, immobilizing the foot. If we are giving flexion at the hip and flexion at the knee, now the thing is not acting as a single unit. So you can very well leave the foot aside. You can leave the foot there. But if you are giving more extension, then there is a likelihood of rotational uh, thing transfer into the part uh, of the femur. Then, then you can have to go for it, into, uh, using the foot as you know, enclosing the foot in the plant. That is my opinion. I mean, uh, for foot is that, sir, I have learned that way and I don't want to change what I have done because learning new thing is difficult. So I am continuing doing that. You mean to say, sir, in the shaft femur, you need to include the knee as well as the foot. Yes, uh, so AO what recommends the foot, we don't input the foot. See, but uh, but what I better to include the foot. Yeah, better to include the yeah, foot. I do that. Better to include the foot. No, I do that. I said, said it is better to include the foot. Yes. And I am telling that if you are giving flexion at two stages, at the two joints, at the hip and at the knee, now the limb is not acting as a single unit. If it goes, that is why you can leave the foot aside. In that, in that scenario. In that case, we can say, but uh, sometimes we don't give 90 yeah. Yeah, not 90, not 90, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, because I have seen surgeons operating at two years. 
So that's what I'm asking you. It's six years. The chef being attracted, they put something. So there has to be an age. So age below which, like six years. Age cutoff is five years, sir. So yeah. Cutoff five to six. Is five years. Five or six. Some some literature says six. But A O says five years. Okay. And five to six is a grey area. You see the size of the child. If it is heavier child, be a uh, taller child, go for the elastic. Yeah, even in four year child, it's heavy ah, child. It's heavy child. Yeah. So age more, more than the age is the weight. So if you see it's a heavier child, go for elastic. Any other question? You want to make comment? Yeah. Uh, we should be a little bit from my own experience. We should be a little bit more careful in that uh, borderline age group. And we are operating, say, like normally four years or five years. I think in the borderline, this thing four years, a bulky child, we will be operating. I recently had a case in which the child was around four and a half. So again, the borderline, this thing. It took almost three months for the fracture to join. And I was, I felt that if we would have done a titanium elastic nail in the first place, it would, it would have been mobilized a little bit earlier. Okay. So that is the message from the. I have seen a lot of complications. Of young patient, pediatric age group being sick. I've seen a lot of complications, infection, other problems. So previously, it was said that don't operate less than eight years. Now they have come to six years. And you are saying four years because weight is more. So, so in expert, listen, so. in expert hand, the treatment is different. Here we are general population. So you cannot advocate a treatment to general orthopedic surgeon. You have to keep separately for the specialist. In your hand, four years is fine. But if you get infected and get osteomyelitis, you can treat in uh, spica, it may have some deformity, some torsing, it becomes all right. So I think I have an objection to younger age groups, and I don't operate less than eight years. This is my personal view. You may have a student, so that was yeah. a victim. The yeah. student, that was the victim. That's, that's how we. So with, with time, the indications for the surgery is. Uh, yeah, ages, ages with you. <laughs> I think whatever you do, you do it safely, right? Right. That is, and you need to know how to do it. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> uh, we will have Doctor Ritesh Pandey and Doctor Pratik Bera. I think it is a discussion. Between uh, titanium nail and steel nail. So, we are uh, topic is elastic nails for the femoral shaft fracture, whether you will use titanium or steel. So, first, Dr. Ritesh Pan. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, for this debate, I will be speaking in the favor of a titanium elastic nail. So let me explain the controversy first. We all have been using a stainless steel nail in the form of rush pins and enders nails since long time. However, titanium elastic nails are widely used now for pediatric femoral shaft fractures. And there is another group which favors stainless steel elastic nails as they are claimed to be stiffer, cheaper and easily available. So this debate will end if we are talking about a remote area where titanium nails are usually not available or if there are financial constraints in the family. So I assume that both the nails are available and affordable and then why I use a titanium uh, nail instead of a SS nail. Also if we are talking about this stainless steel elastic nail, I doubt about its easy availability. I am working in a tertiary care center and still it's not easy for me to get this nail so easily. So the only point which stands in favor of a SS elastic nail is that it is, it is stiffer and it makes a stronger construct than titanium. So let's compare these two implants uh, in different aspects. First, serving the purpose. Now here I have simulated uh, a titanium nail with bends only because it is more expensive as compared to a SS nail and both these cars serve the purpose of transportation. So do the nails, both are effective in managing pediatric femur fractures uh, successfully. 
and it is supported by literature well this randomized control trial reported similar clinical functional and radiological outcomes and a similar rate of complications for both the implants this is another rct again similar outcomes however the incidence of rupturing the yeah, rupturing the opposite cortex while inserting a ss nail was significantly higher and this could be because of the fact that ss nails are stiffer this is another systematic review again uh, mentioning similar outcomes so we can say that both titanium and ss elastic nails have similar treatment outcomes okay now coming to the comparison of features we know that titanium is a metal and ss is a metal alloy so how does it matter well it makes the titanium less dense and hence it is lighter in weight titanium is more elastic and hence we can bend it without undergoing permanent deformation yield strength is more and so it is more durable however tensile strength is less but we can see the difference is not very high now this study has uh, reported less tolerance for titanium nails to the torsional stress but there is more tolerance to the axial load this is another study which has now uh, mentioned equal tolerance to the rotational stress here the bending stiffness for titanium nail is less but it can be improved by using a cs configuration as shown in this figure so both the nails enter through a common lateral entry point one is going in c other is making a shape of s so that is how to increase the bending stiffness so now we can say that there is a biomechanical advantage for titanium nail torsional and bending stiffness may be less but it can be improved by a cs configuration now coming to the safety in terms of biocompatibility and tissue tolerance so what does this mean biological tolerance depends on the amount of soluble implant material which is released in circulation and toxicity of this released material and we all know that nickel and chromium which are components of stainless steel they are more allergenic and are less tolerable to the soft tissues than a titanium and the same study has mentioned this positive points for titanium they have better adherence to surrounding tissues uh, better adherence of surrounding tissue to the implant which makes them resistant to infection they are more resistant to corrosion and hence less corrosion products are released and hence less toxicity then the corrosion, corrosion products uh, which are released are well tolerated and hence less chances of allergy then titanium are mri compatible and there is better osseo integration and so implant loosening and migration is less now let's compare the complications actually this was the first study which has compared complication of a titanium and uh, stainless steel elastic nail and this study has mentioned significantly uh, high number of malunions with a titanium construct but then similar successive studies have uh, they didn't report any uh, difference in the rate of malunion in fact as discussed this study has reported more chances of uh, violating the opposite cortex with a ss nail and this study published in injury journal they have not found any case of malunion by using a titanium nail few minor complications were reported which were uh, more associated with the surgical technique and surgeon's learning curve and it has nothing to do with the type of implant material moreover the complications are more related to the mechanism of injury the weight of the child and his age and as we can see they are not in the control of the treating surgeon and has nothing to do with the type of implant also if i am worried about a road traffic accident which uh, in our case is a malunion what will i choose i will choose some other mode of transportation rather than choosing any other car and so 
for obese children and elder children with i expect uh, more risk of malunion i will go for some plate or fixator or any other mode of of fixation so i favor the titanium elastic nails because they are effective safe and has acceptable rate of complications the strength of the construct can be improved by following standard technique and i will go for other mode of transport uh, other mode of fixation uh, especially for obese and elder children and i will say that if one has some disadvantage that does not uh, make the other one perfect there is always scope for improving and making it be uh, better thank you very much So my dear friend Ritesh has made a valid point, and actually he has quoted many papers which I am also going to quote. And while quoting that, you will come to know that the way you have to interpret a paper depends on the way you have you have gone into thinking about it. So the same papers which he has interpreted in a different way, I am going to interpret in some other way, and then you will know that not all papers are perfect. And for while you are reading and analyzing a paper. you have to keep an open mind and think objectively so first of all i must acknowledge that this idea of debate was not mine basically it was dr rahul's and he suggested this debate in month of january we were planning for uh, the uh, pediatric femoral session in the meeting of boss at that time because of time constraints we did not proceed but uh, i must thank him for bringing out this important topic so th these are the common type of nails which are used for fixation in femur fractures in children of these our point of primary discussion are on the left hand side right hand side of the screen both of them are the straight ones and one more nail is the old ender nail which has been there since past 40 50 years though not classically an elastic still it has elastic properties and many people consider it to be an equivalent of an elastic nail so basically we have to understand what does a implant do for any sort of fracture so it only purpose is to retain the reduction till the fracture is united and one more preferable option will be to allow for early um, mobilization for better functional outcome so the debate about a perfect implant or ideal implant material has never been settled and while these are the properties which are expected and if, if you go through the textbook which uh, almost everyone must have read during their residency there are multiple expected things but the end result is that the, such a material which can be considered as an ideal material for implant is not available what we are using are stainless steel alloy and also titanium alloy not pure titanium still we are using the titanium alloy they both have some advantages some disadvantages dr ritesh went into it very great detail and if you look titanium is preferred as he also told because the mechanical properties are much closer to that of bone than steel and the corrosion resistance and potential of toxicity and soft tissue damage is much lesser with titanium than steel however that being said if i uh, make quote in the year 2021 there was a systematic review as to what implant material is better before we delve into the details of titanium nails and steel nails what implant material is better they found that the results are inconclusive two areas which they have noted where titanium can be favored over steel that are use of a distal femoral locking plate in distal femur fracture because you get early and more callus and less stress shielding and in tibia nail nailing because you have less breakage of the interlocking bone but overall the stainless steel is equally good as titanium for any other location but this paper did not discuss the point which we are going to discuss so in my quest to get an answer i refer to this age old textbook that what they are recommending does ao recognize stainless steel yes ao recognizes that when you use a nail whether titanium alloy or stainless steel they have adequate strength to maintain the reduction till the fracture is healed so our purpose is getting solved we are going to obtain reduction we are going to retain that reduction and that can be done till fracture is getting united so there is no clear statement that steel is worse than titanium now i am discussing the other way around steel the steel is not worse 
than titanium. So this paper Dr. Ritesh quoted, and this paper was one which actually suggested that titanium had some better properties than steel. But after that, I did, so this is the same paper. Just two years after that, one more paper came, and they studied biomechanical comparison of stainless steel using an titanium flexible nail and external fixator. What they used was ender nail, not classically that uh, uh, SSEN, but they found that the ender nail was superior to titanium in control of sagittal plane angulation, but it was not statistically significant, and that a smaller diameter ender nail was better than a larger diameter titanium, or 3.5 ender was better than 3.5 titanium for bending stress. So again, there is no clear statement that stainless steel are worse than titanium. So this is the same paper which Dr. Ritesh has quoted, and this paper actually came out with 56 uh, children, and they treated with titanium elastic, 48 with steel elastic. They noted the major complications to be almost twice with titanium than stainless steel. Malunion rate was almost four times in titanium than stainless steel, and minor complications were similar, but the cost was one fourth for stainless steel than titanium. So then I went and uh, read few more papers, and what they found was this is a stainless steel nail, flexible nail made locally in a poor country, Colombia, and they found that for a period of 24 months after they followed up the children, the results were almost similar the uh, like that for titanium. All major and minor complications were similar. They concluded that the results with stainless steel nails are as good as titanium nail with a shorter follow-up as reported in the literature. Then the same paper from UCMS GTB hospital, both similar, no complication, no major issues, but stainless steel was cheaper. Finally, this paper with Dr. Ritesh is also quoted. Cost of stainless steel was one third. There are no clinical radiological difference between the two groups at one year follow-up. These are for ender name. This is from US. This is from India, SMS Medical College. No difference, nothing, same results. So with all these things, finally this result, which was, uh, this was also again quoted by Dr. Ritesh, that they used a systematic review and what they found that there were five studies they reviewed out of those the nail removal time was less for titanium nail in only one paper two paper two studies had higher rate of malunion with titanium elastic nail and there was no difference in the rate of delayed union or infection in the two groups they concluded there is no consistent evidence to suggest that one type of nail is better than the other so still now we have uh, cannot say that yes you have to use titanium only Steel can also be used. So then I did a market survey. So in Bhopal, of all vendors, only three were able to provide stainless steel nail. New Delhi, only one. Zero in Chandigarh. Indoor, only one. So almost everyone has titanium nail. Some have ender nail, but almost very limited people have stainless steel nail. So the reason is why? My understanding, I don't know why this has happened. While this, there is a possibility that the awareness is relatively lacking that both are similarly effective. We are preferring titanium, but probably we can get the thing done in a relatively cheaper rates. Unavailability, as just discussed by me. Misconception, probably, probably marketing ploy by the manufacturers that titanium is always better than stainless steel. And a lack of hard hitting evidence at present about one being better than the other. So we have come to the situation where we are in the clinical equipoise and Dr. Ayan is smiling because it is one of his favorite terms. So we are in a stage of clinical equipoise. So what do you do next? Till we get an answer to resolving this clinical equipoise, I searched the literature and I found the guidelines, the steps for performing the nail from Synthes website and they have found out that titanium alloy implants merge high mechanical stability with elastic properties but they recommend stainless steel implants have higher mechanical requirements. So those situations where the mechanical requirements are high, they are recommending stainless steel. This is the synthesis group, not me. Then when you read the discussion by Dr. Thakur, it is a surgeon's choice at present because there is clinical equipoise, you don't know what has to be done. Stainless steel is stronger with a higher tensile strength. Stainless steel, but they, this has not been assessed for ender. Stainless steel has the strength uh, of TEN one size larger than itself. That means if you are using a two millimeter stainless steel nail, it will have an equivalent strength that of 
titanium uh, millimeter, three millimeter diameter. TE and elasticity and handling characteristics are very suitable for a child's diaphysis. This is the statement from this book. But what they find that stainless steel can be preferred if medullary canal is disproportionately small. That means you have to use a nail if you are using a titanium, a thinner nail. So in that scenario, you use a thinner steel nail rather than a thinner titanium nail. And if you are considering it for a heavier adult source. So in conclusion, uh, nothing can be uh, written in black and white. And as Dr. Ritesh told that you have to choose between Mercedes Benz and uh, Suzuki car and you look for Vande Bharat. I think we have to go somewhere in between because being a resource constrained country, if we have availability of similar mechanical properties and we can get uh, similarly functioning implants at a relatively fraction of a cost, then we can actually prefer stainless steel. And I would like all my colleagues to plan out in collaboration with us, in collaboration with other orthopedic surgeons, a relatively larger study where we can compare the stainless steel elastic nail and titanium elastic nail and try to break that clinical equipoise. Thank you. I think uh, the session is open for questions, and uh, we would also like to uh, also like to have comments of uh, other faculties who have come uh, to comment on it, please. So, if any question, so not a question, but just a comment because uh, the randomized control trial which was published in, from UCMS. I was a part of uh, that group when we were doing that thing. The genesis of that study was they had initially done a study on titanium elastic nails and they found that the malunion rates were increasing. So, Sarkari Hospital had kya karna hai yaad malunion for it. Then we started putting in casts to a tense nail and some sort of an immobilization just to reduce the malunion rate. But then also problems were happening and therefore Dr. Aditya, who was the lead author in that paper, he said, yeah, let us do a review of literature. Let us see what, what is it that we can do differently. And then he found some studies where it was saying that stainless steel is actually doing better than the tense nail. And then he designed this randomized control trial to do the stainless steel and the tense. And honestly, after they started doing stainless steel, the rates of the malunion actually reduced. Maybe it was heavier childs which they were choosing, or maybe the age was more. I really don't know. But we have to look at that paper and say that yes, there is definitely a role of stainless steel. That is what I would want to say, especially in the heavier children and the older age. Stainless steel is uh, the plastic nails are magical, more magical. So I think I've never used the elastic nails. Stainless steel has been much better. I I also have similar uh, opinion as uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. It is technically Intraoperatively easier to put titanium nail than the stainless steel nail because more rigid and perforates the opposite cortex so it doesn't go flying. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I think I agree with uh, Rehan's uh, observation that titanium uh, nail patients have more bending or malunion than the stainless steel. Observation actually, what you were saying, malunion regarding what the answer said. He, in literature, also malunions are uh, basically specified with tense nail. But uh, if we go through that, then we have to see three things one is age of the patient, that the answer is pointed out, another is the weight of the patient, and third and most important is the technique, whosoever is doing. Because tense nailing is a tense or even elastic nailing is dependent on some principles, biomechanical principles. If whosoever is doing it, if they are doing it in a proper way, with keeping the apex at the flexor site and all those things, then definitely the malignant rates can be increased. So age, weight, and the technique, these three are important things, I think. Otherwise, no doubt, uh, steel nails have, have more strength. And even AO, what uh, Pratik has referred, uh, they have clearly mentioned that if the weight of the child is more, and even the, even the configuration is a fracture pattern is bad, then better to use the steel. Even in that 
uh, though they produce tens of right? I say, respecting the encourage the incorporate a longer contact area in the tens of If you're using a smaller contact area, then it will fail. And if you're seeing a longer heavyweight child, more, older age child, you can supplement it with the extra also. Tens of are wonderful result, and uh, I don't, I didn't have any problem over. More than I, I also use tens, I don't use steel, but it depends on technique, I think, and what we are choosing the patient better. Actually, yeah. Because sometimes if I find my factor unstable, regularly I supplement with fixator. Dr. Vani, that is what I am trying to say that uh, you, me, Dr. Abhishek, and everyone yeah, should put it together it. and uh, in do a proper randomized trial all over the country. Because yeah. if you look at the availability, Delhi only one vendor no, I could no, find. No, it's not Bhopal, it is three. No vendor in AIMS is supplying for you. Actually, the point is that because the demand is not that much. Yes. That's so so it, it was my colleagues from GMC who actually called up different vendors. Whoever vendors I knew, they all said, no, we don't have. They called up Dr. Vishal, Dr. Manish, and when they called up, they found some three people at the <laughs> so uh, those who are whatever we are using we should keep on using that and uh, let's see what uh, comes up uh, with the later study which dr vera is uh, suggesting now i call upon dr ravi john tips and tricks of elastic nailing for lower limb fat. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really thankful to Rihan sir, to Tik and Rajas sir, and all the organizing team for the invitation. So, regarding the tips and tricks of elastic nailing, actually, uh, Pratik has already explained in uh, morning some of the important tips. Now, I'm moving further. And as uh, just now we have discussed that uh, indication, age, weight, technique, and the fracture pattern, these are the important things in elastic nailing other things are of no use so before beginning we should consider that these this pediatric population we should consider them that they are not small adults they have different anatomy different physiology different surgical principles govern them and even the implant requirements they do have different requirements so coming to elastic nailing it's a minimally invasive elastic and stable osteosynthesis as we all know definitely the debate was going on that about the titanium and the steel you all know coming to the biomechanical principle of elastic nailing that is much more important and we should follow it while we are putting a nail okay so there are three important things double secant construct because what it is actually we need to construct the elastic frame intramedullarily so if that frame is stable then that fracture will be stable that frame should be that much stable that it should provide the stability to that bone. Okay. It, it uh, provides the symmetrical bracing action of the two elastic nails that are inserted into the metaphysis proximally and the distally. And there is a three point fixation. It should be better achieved. The three points are at the entry site, at the apex site, and at the distal or the proximal, depending on the entry point, metaphysical site wherever we are impacting the nails. So maintaining this symmetrical bracing and keeping the three points in fix three point fixation in mind, our technique will be okay. So we should follow these biomechanical principles while the application of the elastic nail. And uh, because of this three point uh, relationship, you can find out, you can see that in the picture that uh, it provides the flexor, axial, translational, as well as the rotational stability. So almost in all planes, our fracture will be stable if we provide this three-point fixation to our inside frame, what we are putting in. Coming to indications, which is much more important, selecting our patient. So patient and limb specific considerations, as I've already pointed out, age, weight, and soft tissue envelope sometimes, because depending on soft tissue envelope, we need to consider retrograde or anti-grade and or medially or laterally sometimes. So most important is age and the weight of the child. Another is the fracture specific consideration, means fracture location and the pattern. 
it is also much more important as as uh, along with the age and the weight so ideally it is suited for the transverse fractures in advanced cases like in the comminuted fractures or more distal or more flexible fractures no doubt these elastic nails can be done but it require a bit of experience for that so better to begin with transverse fractures only if you are uh, gain with your experience as you gain then start putting it for distal and proximal or sometimes comminuted fractures because in case of comminuted fractures or other bad fracture patterns you need to augment it some uh, sometimes with the external fixators as well okay so i am not moving it into it so for the femur length is stable fracture in middle 60% of the diaphysis in a child of 5 to 11 years whose weight is less than 49 is the ideal candidate for the tense name okay similarly for the tibia 5 to 14 year age old child with unstable fracture compound fractures or polytrauma patient secondary loss of reduction these are the indicated which are referred in the literature for tibia these are the various configurations for femur as well as the tibia nail depending on their retrograde entry depending on the antegrade entry and similarly in tibia we usually prefer the antegrade uh, from the proximal to distal we usually don't go for distal to proximal sometimes an experienced person can do that but usually it should be avoided okay so coming to the technique patient should be positioned as you can see in the femur supine and uh, in the tibia also supine with a bolster under the knee joint fracture reduction part is very important while doing that elastic nailing there are three uh, four uh, points where we need to do the fracture reductions initially just before the surgery in order to have an idea of reduction maneuver and the check for reducibility by the close means while uh, during the surgery so initially just try to reduce it and have an idea how you can reduce this or how you need to reduce it at the time of tens nailing another is the intraoperatively to facilitate the nails to cross the fracture another one is at the end of the procedure that is also very important that to facilitate complete reduction by the precise rotation and orientation of the nails and another is but not the least just before the nail trimming final impaction is done at the fracture site under the uh, sometimes even uh, in the proximal femur if i am impacting the nails i use the siam just to see the ap and the lateral views so that i am impacting at the right angle right orientation right rotation okay so at these four points you need to reduce this fracture value there are different modalities of fracture reduction this is the common f tool it comes with the uh, tens set this is the way how it should be used for the reduction another is uh, you can use the tens itself as an indirect mode of reduction the fracture site during its application you can use a sand spin or sometimes in rare cases you need to open it for the reduction implant selection which is also very important that's why i said the technique is important both the nails should be of the same diameter your entry point should be at the same levels so i coming to it and nail size inner canal diameter you should measure it in 2.4 means your whole uh, you should measure the diameter of the canal and 80% of that diameter should be occupied by the tens nails what i do because there you can also find the difficulty of the resolutions of x rays what we do okay there are different resolutions so in order to get the accurate idea what i do because i usually uh, cover my siam with a style drape a style transparent drape so uh, i just take a siam shot and put a put my tens nail over it and just have an idea the 3 mm 4 mm or 2.5 mm depending on the width of the size so that is the actual basis of how i do okay coming to the usual size femur is usually 3 to 4 mm tv are 2.5 to 3.5 mm or what we usually require entry points which is also very important in femur when we are doing the retrograde nailing both the entry points they should be away from the physis almost around 2 to 3 cm they should be symmetrically at the same location and while doing the incision just start at the entry point and move distally not proximally because your nail will go distally otherwise the skin macerations and all those things infections bursa formation these complications will occur okay in case of the anti grade nailing you should avoid the greater trochanter physis plate okay keep it 0.5 to 2 cm away 0.5 to 1 cm the proximal hole and the distal should be at least 2 cm apart in both ap and the lateral views so that the in intervening vertex should not be broken okay in the tibia similarly it should be away at least 2 to 3 cm away from the proximal tibial physis 
and in this while you are giving the incision your uh, incision should go from the entry point distally because nails now will go upper side that's why they should not impact the skin this is the how we should proceed with the all first it should be perpendicular to the entry point and then with the screwing movement just move 45 degree almost 45 degree incline it so that the, our whole entry point will be made in the that in that direction this is the pre bending of the nail it is very important because this will provide us the second arc formation or the symmetrical bracing okay and uh, as uh, pratik has pointed out in the morning that our bending should be done in the length of the nail and the length should be selected depending on the length of the femur or the tibia in which we are putting the nail if the size of the femur and the tibia is short and we are just bending the nail of full size then the apex will be at different side as compared to the fracture side so we should take that much part of the nail which is the size equivalent to the size of the tibia or the femur whosoever we are doing okay and this diameter bending should be three times the diameter of the nail okay coming to the insertion point while doing just uh, put it on the nail inserter nail or you can use the your chunk and after just insertion your it should be perpendicular to the shaft until it reaches the far cortex and once it reaches the far cortex that turn it 120 180 degree just to have the curved end over the distal cortex so that it should not penetrate our bit and then advise it further without further movements don't rotate it beyond 180 degree okay the and after once it reaches for uh, first nail once it reaches the fracture side then take the another nail and get it up to the fracture side that also and then simultaneously move further now after uh, after this once you pass the fracture side then both move both the nails together and after passing out once you achieve the reduction and everything then the final point of fixation is the impaction into the metaphysis distal or proximal depending on the entry point that fixation into the metaphysis should be checked and after the rotation confirmation as well as the length so at that point of time also before that impaction your fracture reduction should be accurate this is the corkscrew effect why this occurs as i have already pointed out that don't rotate your uh, this uh, tense nail or elastic nail beyond 180 degree if you continue rotating it like that then these nails will rotate around each other and this will further impede your this will affect your biomechanics totally absurd biomechanics then and it will it will not also move further it will also impact your further advancement of the nail also okay so avoid this corkscrew effect another is avoid penetration into the femoral neck i have not i have faced this in my one of my patients and since then i started taking the frog leg view while impaction into the neck area i have penetrated the anterior cortex once okay assessment of the rotation this is very important clinically as well as the radiologically clinically by uh, having the normal range of motions and radiologically what we can do lesser trochanteric profile okay just have a siam view in our picture you can see there is the internal rotation and in this the external rotation depending on the how much the size of lesser trochanter this is the how we can compare the two lesser trochanters and this is the another method of uh, the rotation assessment vertical congruency assessment across the fracture side vertical thickness and the shaft diameter they should match to each other okay coming to nail cutting nail cutting is also very important because it will avoid the further infections further skin macerations and further complications okay so nail should be cut in a particular manner that it should not be large enough that it will affect your skin and it should not be small enough that it will affect your further removal of the nail okay so and after and how you can do do the trimmer there is a nail cutter in the set or you can do with the wire cutter as well avoid too much bending of nails just a bit of bending not too much because it will mess your skin okay and caps usually i don't use it but uh, in literature also and in one or two cases i have used it that it provides the axial stability and also protect the soft tissues and also aid in further removal as well okay so axial stability means means if you are having a fracture pattern of the comminuted pattern and if you use the uh, these end caps then it will pro uh, protect further collapse of the fracture site okay compartment syndrome especially in the tibia fractures have a high index of suspicion increasing pain is the first sign and compartment syndromes can develop because of your complete again and again manipulations and all those things implant removal 
it is very important after six months at least and before one and a half years don't keep the nails for too long otherwise it will not be possible for you to remove them okay so implant removal is also an important part so better to make the proper decisions that is more important depending on age weight size of the patient and depending on your entry points and all those decisions are more important the much more than your incisions okay and develop your skills and in the last i would invite you for the basic elizoro course i have already pointed out in the morning it's on 9th and 10th of september this year okay thank you Now we will. I think we will skip the questions and uh, in this instance, we'll go to for case presentation. Uh, Dr. Manish Rajput to present his case. Thank you, everyone. Now I am presenting a case of fracture sort of humor in a eleven-year-old female. This was the X-ray. Here is the history of fall. The injury was closed, and no other associated problem. What will you do? Any PG? Do you want any other X-ray? One joint above and one joint below. In this, uh, unfortunately, I don't have X-ray of the knee, but it is normal. Now, what will you do? Yes, weight of the child is thirty-five kg. Size of the child is small for it. It's not uh, eleven year. Uh, 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 PG, uh, yes, any the resident. Uh, PG, uh, any resident. What implant you want to use in this? It is stable fracture or unstable fracture? Length unstable or length stable? Yeah, it is a, a spiral type of the fracture. That's why it is unstable fracture. What will you do now? For stable fracture, we can uh, very uh, very easily go with the tiles. Intramedullary fixation. That's ideal indication, actually. Yes. This also, like, but that's why I said depending on your expertise and experience. Yes. <laughs> stainless steel. <laughs> yes, yes. We can also go through the uh, stainless steel implant. Any worry about uh, nailing it? Any complication which is evident there? Can occur. Yes, sir. Any nail? Careful when you approach the proximal side. Yeah. Very, what is there? There is a there is a fracture line which is going up. Yes, yes. You have to be very careful, otherwise you should separate on the butterfly. Yes. yes. This was a fracture line. Very long spiral fracture. Now what? According to the AAOS guideline. In the age of the six to eleven year child, we can divide the patient into two category. One is the length stable and length unstable. It is length unstable in part, and the weight is less than less than forty uh, nine. Then we can also do stainless steel implant as well as the tiles nail. We can choose, but we can also do a some muscular plate, some muscular plate, or we can also do. Uh, intramedullary fixation along with the external fixation still of this now what we have it it was done somewhere else not in our center the surgeon choose the open method what he used in this uh, what implant he has used any rigid He has used small DCP. 
very small it is not crossing the fracture also ideally it should be three times the fracture configuration and the fixation is not appropriate and there is a not good reduction now these are the problem the fracture configuration is not fixed properly and there is a non uniform Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, there is a non union and implant failure. Now, what will you do? Yes, yes, yes. We can, we can prevent the non union after the fixation by providing good time work. We can give yeah, a yeah. Yes, yes. We can augment. <laughs> it can unite. Now, what will you do? Now, three, three months down the line, what will you do? Three months. No infection now. It will heal. Okay. <laughs> we need to intervene. We need to remove this extraordinary implant. Okay. We have to remove this implant. We have advised the removal of resurgery. But but the patient went to the same surgeon. Right. So for problem guys, again and again. Yes. Again again and again. You are violating the principle. Yes. And you are putting everything on the implant. Then it's wrong. Yes, yes. Why not just immobilize? Even, right even initially, in 11 years, plate can be done. Yeah, plate can be, plating can be yes, done. Yes, But the plate length should be okay. It should be done in a proper way. Or then, it then can the, be augmented. Then the the result should have been much better. Yes, yes. Even if you are not, if you are not comfortable with the tans, go and use the plate. No issue. Yes, sir. But yes. use it properly. Yes, sir. Principle matters. Decision making is right. Right. not the skill, but is the decision right. according right. to the research. And never you especially in a female. Uh, even an interlocking nail can be done. Yes, uh, yes. but actually it can be done. Uh, not by the pharmacy, but it can be trochanteric entry nail can, can be used. Uh, can uh, we can also infection. Why not we just put a spike on it and wait? Give it a try. Uh, yeah. It's actually yeah. enumerated all the defects in the uh, last section. Yes. I, was, I was going to ask the juniors and them to uh, just you know just yeah. to know what, what all principles have been. Well, yes. Violated here. You can put other X-ray also. There is other one thing over here as well. Now, anyone can point out, Anyone can point out what all the principles have been violated here. Anyone? Anyone from the juniors? I have one more comment. I have one more comment. If you look at the distal femur, you find that there is some irregularity there. Like somebody has tried to make such a nail in the Sir, he, he must have tried the tense bit. And then it has been. Yes. Sir, you have noticed. There are entry points. There are entry points. There are entry points. Then he puts it between the. And then he has. I have noticed. He was not ready with the plate of that size or whatever. And in this also, he has. That's the experience. <laughs> now what, I think what wrong in this configuration? Doctor is second Doctor has placed this two at the fracture side. Will it unite? No. There are a lot of issues. What is wrong? The implant selection is not good. <laughs> yeah, nothing is right in this. Number of screws are too much. And there is an infection. And knee is stiff. <laughs> Refer to Ravi, sir. <laughs> Pediatric orthopedics are 
Actually, that's why na, that's why what Barsas was saying. See, if you are not comfortable with the technique with the implant, it's better to leave in attraction. Yes, sir. <laughs> then go. Then go. Avoid this bad complication. That's why those things come. Now there is a infection. Yes. Now implant is exposed. Now we have to tackle three things. One, what is the infection? Non. Second is non-linear and knee stiffness. What will you do? Let me say. Yes, sir. No. Then, then we have operated in Amelia. Amelia was operated. Yes, sir. We have thoroughly divided the uh, uh, wound and remove all the dead, dead portion of the bone and we are fixed with uh, LRS and distal corticotomy was done to the bone transfer, bone transfer. This much portion is, was removed and corticotomy, the bone is transported. This was the follow-up X-ray. Now here is a union. This is the last X-ray after the implant. Good, uh, good job, Manish. Manish, you did a good job, but uh... Why have you not used patients in this proximity? Uh, there wasn't any reason, Madam. Don't. The bone is small, that's why I. Uh, yeah, but uh, if you have used two things, you can use one thing in between because that provides the more stability. I think yes. that should be the principle. Yes. Otherwise, the job is excellent. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Last call up back. We should have Dr. Vivek Tiwari for his case of Bulletin and Dr. Vivek Tiwari. Dr. Vivek Tiwari has to. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to the esteemed chairpersons and the esteemed faculties and all my colleagues. First of all, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, Dr. Rehan sir and Dr. Patik for giving me this opportunity to present the case. So uh, I'm working at Apollo Sage Hospital. So regarding the case, a 12 year old boy came to the uh, OPD with history of road traffic accident. He had complained of pain in his right hip as well as in the right ankle. And he was uh, obviously he wasn't able to walk. On examination, there was tenderness in the right hip region as well as on the in the ankle. Active SLR was not possible. The right hip and ankle movements were painful and there was no distal neurovascular deficit. So these were the x-rays which we got. So as we can see on the left hand side, he had got a delbet type 2 fracture of the neck of femur. And on the ankle, he had a tri-pain fracture, a supination inversion injury and that's the type 3 Salter Harris injury in the distal tibia. So this is what was done, the post-op x-rays, uh, close reduction and internal fixation was done for the fracture neck or femur. Uh, before progressing further, I would like to comment that this was operated after a week, around seven to eight days after the injury due to some financial constraints and some other factors. So the golden time was somewhat delayed. So close reduction and internal fixation was done for the neck of femur, two cc screws and uh, ORIF was done, open reduction had to be done for the ankle and fixation was done with screws and K-wires. And then unfortunately the patient was lost to follow. He didn't comply with physiotherapy. Uh, he came straight after one year, uh, one year of the index surgery. And now his complaints were he had limping on the right side. He wasn't able to squat. There were no complaints in the ankle at that time. And when we examined his right hip was totally stiff, it was fixed in 30 degrees of flexion and 30 degrees of adduction. So these were the x-rays after one year of follow-up uh, when the patient came again. So as we can see, there is a non-union of the neck of femur. There is AVN as well, it has set in. The implants have protruded out. On the right hand side, the ankle fracture has however united. So now, the uh, confusion, what to do, what should we do in this, what should be the further plan. So when we refer to the literature, 
This paper was published in HIP International regarding the non-union pediatric femoral neck fracture treatment without open reduction. So they concluded that the non-union could be successfully treated by a valgus intercutaneous osteotomy. So that is one of the best options for this. Another paper which uh, Vivek Shivastas are also discussed, which was published a very beautiful paper in JBJS. So they concluded that in patients with a delayed presentation, the intervening fibrous tissue and resorption of the neck does pose challenges. In these patients, in addition to performing a valgus osteotomy, uh, also in situ stabilization with fibula, it adds to the bone stock and is recommended. And so these are the two literatures which we refer to and uh, that uh, make us uh, uh, help in the further plan. However, you can also refer to such papers if you want, where they treat them with extracorporeal shockwave therapy under navigation published from China. So unless you want to resort to this, obviously what we did was valgus osteotomy of the right proximal femur, fibular grafting was done. At the same time, implant removal was done from the ankle and a hip spica was added this time uh, for added stability because we didn't uh, want to do it that way. So these are the post-op x-rays. Uh, the implant was used, angle blade plate, pediatric angle blade plate was used, a fibula was also, uh, grafting was done on the superior aspect. And these are the one year follow up x-rays now, the neck union, uh, the neck femur has united, the head has become of a mushroom shape. Uh, however, on the ankle side, now there is something else uh, which we can notice. There is growth arrest of the medial distal tibia and it's going into varus. Also, there is shortening of around 2 centimeters on that side, around 16 degrees of ankle virus is there. And this is the final functional outcome. Uh, he can now squat and uh, his, his, ankle, his hip is doing satisfactorily. However, we can see clinically there is a virus at the ankle. There is deformity at the right ankle. So now retrospectively, when we think why he developed virus on the, on the ankle, so this paper is their recent injury uh, paper about growth arrest and its risk factors of the physical factor of the distal tibia children in adolescence. They say that the degree of initial displacement, this was the only significant risk factor for growth arrest after physical factors of the distal tibia in children. So we can notice that there was significant displacement in our case in the distal tibia. It was reduced in a satisfactorily manner. However, this was the outcome. Similarly, this was the another paper which was published very recently about incidence of growth disturbance after distal tibia physical fracture in children and they also uh, concluded that the Salter head is types 3 and 4 fractures. They are very prone for developing physical arrest, growth disturbances after distal tibia physical fractures. So, our, so was the distal tibia uh, Salter head is type 3 injury and uh, probably this increased, increased the risk for the growth arrest. So now we are planning for doing a supramalleal osteotomy with, a, with an external fixator with an ELISA row to correct the lengthening, to correct the shortening as well as the uh, virus deformity. Thank you for your attention. Other questions? Dr. Vivek, uh, nice case. Uh, we are not concerned about the hip. I'm just asking uncle. Uh, after how much time you have removed that medial wire? Actually, unfortunately, as I told, patient was lost to follow up. So we removed it after one year when he came back. Actually, problem was uh, just uh, it uh, may not be the reason of the fracture. Just because of that wire, <laughs> you, it could have developed a virus deformity. Because that wire was acting as a permanent anti Right. Okay. Point where it is one it, of the factors. If it yes. retained for one year, then definitely that, that virus deformity, because that virus deformity is typical. That's only in the coronal plane. Right. That was not in the serratal plane. Yes, so if it is in the coronal plane, then it's a very one plane deformity and one plane deformity acts. Maximum chances are just because of the medial growth arrest. Right. Yes, sir. I agree with you. It could be one of the factors. It could have been because of the fracture, then it could have been different things. Two planes at least. Right. Point right. Regarding the first uh, initial management of the neck femur itself, uh, you have used only two screws. So that itself, there is a sufficient space for a third screw. Yeah. yeah there was so it is a unstable construct to begin with. But even, it was a very good reduction. So even if you are leaving it two screws, then probably you would have gone for a spica at the first stage itself. So all this yeah. might have been prevented. We would say that. Yes, I agree. That could have been one factor as well. Yes.
a nice question to say. I agree with you. The spiker should be given at the first place, and uh, I reuse angle plate a lot. So because the advantage is you don't remove any core core. If you use DHS, you will remove core bone from the neck. But in angle plate we don't use that. Uh, there is no need for spica after applying angle plate because it's a very strong implant. That is first one point. And you use a double angle plate. So if you want to give valgus, there is no need to double angle because you have to lateralize the cell. If you go on to the new virus, then you use the double angle plate to minimize the cell. That is the two points. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, second, anyhow, this patient will mostly land up in uh, this PHR, PHR. Uh, later day. But right now we have something called the neck lengthening surgeries. So that could have been attempted during that. It's definitely a specialty. This we have, we have we are also like learning the trade now how to do it properly. But so the next uh, part and is probably yeah. It can, work. It, it can work like it prevents the need for an early THR or we can give them far more years of disease free life. What's the age of the patient right now? He was 12 years old when he first came. So after two years, right now he's 14. 14, 14 years. That he last follow up is 14. There is not much growth, not that much is remaining. Yeah. Because uh, you can just, uh, use the media risk too just for that. Whereas not that virus is not that significant. Because 16 degrees virus. Sir. So much shorting as well. Two centimeters shorting is good. I think these are always the best for me. I think we should uh, now wrap up this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Dr. Pankaj. Uh, uh, now it's uh, time to show our gratitude to our speakers. I will call upon the Dr. Gaur sir and Dr. Sukla sir to give them a mentor to the speakers. Uh, Dr. Vivek sir, please. Thank you for the operator. Now it's for to Dr. Shikan Subari. Thank you, Dr. Vare. I will call you Dr. Vivek Tiwari. Thank you, sir. Not much. I will call you Dr. Vahan Ullap, sir. Please give them a minute to Dr. Gautam. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now we will move to the next session. It will be judged by the Dr. Raghi, the PBPS chairperson, and Dr. Vijay. <laughs> So, I think the last session, uh, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Rehan. Sir will be speaking on uh, ACL injuries in children, a different ball game than adult ACL injuries. So, please. So, a very good uh, afternoon to all of you. I think the last session of the scientific deliberations, the attendance is already becoming thin and I would not want to keep you waiting from going home, right? So I have been feeling like a fish out of water for the last two days. There is a group of pediatric orthopedic surgeons who are going hammer karte hai, pediatric orthopedics here, pediatric orthopedics me. For a young, uh, for an adult hip and knee surgeon like me, it was like a harrowing experience. And I was thinking, why am I sitting in this hall? But then Ravi said, the chairman said, sir, this wala avian ho gaya next femur mein, ab hum kuch nahi kar sakte, you need an arthroplasty. So that emboldened me, yes. I have a role here and probably this talk is also needed over here. So what I'm going to talk is to talk of pediatric ACL injuries and just before 
we actually have to talk. May I have a show of hand of how many of the seniors, like all of you who are pediatric orthopedic surgeons, would see and do an ACL injury? You will do open. You will do open, right? And for the younger crowd, how many of you have actually seen a pediatric ACL injury and have thought about managing it, right? Just a show of hands. Let us be true about it because that makes my job very easy. It helps me to moderate my lecture to the level where it is actually needed by the crowd, right? So I think a very uh, rare injury and my job is easy. Right? Uh, so the objectives will be why are pediatric ACL injuries important? Why am I talking about it when even the senior people who are sitting on the front benches have seen very few of them in their uh, academic careers? Why are they different from the adults? Ravi has already said a very important statement. There was a time when I used to do a bit of pediatrics work and I had a slide where I used to say that children are not uh, miniature adults. And I had a very good skeleton also which just used to grow in size, right? And people used to be, uh, people used to see that side and think, yeah, yeah, answer ko bhi kuch aata hai. but yes, the statement is still true. Children are not, uh, uh, pediat pediatric patients are not miniature adults. They need to be dealt very differently. I'm going to talk of the treatment options, a bit complex topic, but I'm trying to do justice to that. I'm going to talk of some technical tips and tricks because I do a bit of arthroscopy work and some of the, uh, these cases need to be tackled arthroscopically and last but not the least, we are going to talk of the preventive uh, pediatric ACL injuries. I think a very new and a very interesting topic because we as orthopedic surgeons are always thinking of ourselves as people with a knife and we are going to treat everything with a knife. But remember, there is prevention is always there and like we were talking in, during AVN, prevention probably is the best cure for a lot of things. So. Why are pediatric ACL injuries important? Because the incidence is increasing. And why do you think the incidence is increasing? Anyone? When Gaur sir has PG, I don't think that there will be MRI in Bhopal or somewhere else. Right? Now, if you see in the city, there may be 20 MRI centers. So every knee who will come to an orthopedic surgeon, he will not be carrying an X-ray, he will be carrying an MRI. Right? So if you have a higher sort of an investigation, naturally you are looking at the patient more diligently and therefore you will get more ACL injuries. The next reason, when we were kids, we used to go out and we used to play, right? Abhi kya hota hai? My wife will say, yaar, mere ko beti ko na badminton mein enroll karwana. I tell her, yaar, badminton mein kya enroll karwana, let her play. So people are becoming more competitive. They are not playing just for fun. They are playing because they want to get into some position. And so when they are, when in, you are into competitive sports, the injuries are more, right? The second thing is why I'm talking about it. I've already covered management is completely different from adults. Why I'm talking about it is because decision-making is more complex. And last but not the least, like we have been seeing since the morning, unlike in the adults, in the pediatric population, whatever you may do, the complications are always, always and always higher. And these patients tend to live with those complications for a longer duration of life. So number one, how are they different? What do you see on this X-ray? I think my PGs will be able to answer this. If they don't answer it, uh, I think I have somehow failed in my duties as a teacher. So what do you think? Aisha is one of my most intelligent senior residents. Aisha, what do you think on this X-ray? I have given you a clue, right? Yeah. And what do you see here? Do you see a normal, this thing? Yeah. And this is a disrupted one. And in your six years or seven years as an orthopedic surgeon, have you seen this one or have you seen this one? Right. So what she's trying to suggest is that bony avulsions are always more as compared to mid substance tears or what we call as the peel offs. So in a pediatric patient, because the bone is much more softer and the ligament is almost of the same strength as an adult, it will come out as a tibial spine avulsion fracture. And that is what you will see 80% of the times, only 20% of the times you're going to get an ACL injury, which is mid substance or which has come out from the femur. So treatment options, tibial spine avulsion fractures, I think a very wonderful classification already given by Mayers and McNeevers. Type 1, almost undisplaced, kuch nahi karna hai. you can put the patient in a cast. Where will you put the cast? Either in complete extension, which is 0 degree, or maybe go down even to 20 degree based on what is the size of your fragment. 
just to keep the uh, time, I'm not going to talk of when to put it in zero and when to put it in 20. When it is type two, the posterior hinge is intact. So you can try to do a close reduction. The technique of close reduction, I think the only indication in my practice where I'm going to aspirate a heme arthrosis today would be a type two mares and neck nevers. I'm going to aspirate the knee joint because I want to decompress it. I'm going to take the knee into complete extension so that this hinge sits down and then maybe apply a cast, right? For type three and type four, the treatment will definitely be to do either an open reduction, like you said, or maybe do a closed reduction arthroscopically and then fix it. So this is, as arthroscopy surgeons, we have n number of techniques, but this is something, a schematic diagram of what you're trying to do. So this is the crater that you have, the footprint of the tibial spine is there. You have put in two wires on either sides. This is a normal needle through which you can pass in a PDS sort of a suture. This is a nylon suture on both sides. Get your ACL footprint in its place. Pass in a needle over here and then just pull it down. So this is the sort of reduction. I think if it was, we had more time, we would have had a video also. But the idea is you have to do a reduction, whether you do an open reduction or whether you do a closed reduction. After you have done an open or a closed reduction, you have to fix it. Either you can fix it with the threads because you don't uh, want to get too much through the physis, or you can put in a small screw which stays only in the epiphyseal part. The treatment algorithm for mid substance tears, I think, more complex, but I will run you through this. So, the first thing is to do an MRI, right? I said the MRI is the gold standard today. A child comes to you who has got knee pain. He has got a tense effusion. You have got an X-ray done. You find that the X-rays are normal. The next step is don't uh, worry. Kindly get an MRI. And in this group of patients, probably waiting for three weeks or four weeks as of today is not recommended. What is recommended is try to do an early MRI. You may over this thing, but then you will be able to treat the child better. Once you've got an MRI, if it is a partial ACL tear, especially of the anteromedial bundle, there is definitely a role of conservative treatment. So try non-operative conservative treatment. If it is a complete tear, then you have to go back to your pediatrics. Anybody knowing what is tenor's staging? Manish, you are faculty. You not Postgraduates, any idea about tenor's staging? So tunnel staging, uh, you would have read in your pediatrics, one, two, three, four, and five. One and two are pre-pubercent, three is pubercent, and four and five are post-pubercent, right? So if it is one or two, you have to spare your physis. So do any surgery which does not disrupt the physis. So these are physial sparing surgeries. I'm just going to talk of two surgeries which are commonly done. However, if it is tanners four or five, you can go through the physis and treat the patient like an adult, like a normal ACL reconstruction that is done. The three is a gray area for me. I will do something like one or two, but three is a gray area. You can treat it either way. So conservative treatment, I'm not going to talk of it, but bracing, activity modification and rehab. The reason why conservative is not very popular or why it fails in children is because of non-compliance, right? So you have a child, he's a sportsman, he has injured his knee, you want to brace it, you want to tell him you don't have to play, he's not going to listen to you, and then he's going to have recurrent instability, he will have recurrent chondral injuries, he will have recurrent meniscal injuries, and then you have lost the knee, right? So probably one reason why people have started moving more and more towards operative management of these difficult injuries. So what is the treatment? This is, I think the people from the senior generation would know you used to have an ACL injury, but we used to treat it by an extra articular procedure. This is still valid for pediatric ACL patients where you are using an iliotibial band and you are creating the anterolateral ligament like this and then bringing the ligament into the knee from the over the top position, bringing it through the intermeniscal ligament, right? and then coming down, removing a little bit of periosteum over here and then stitching it. So what you are actually trying to do is you have actually protected the physis completely. You have not breathed the physis. The second thing is you have not taken any grafts. So your hamstring is intact, your quadritus femoris graft, your quadriceps graft is intact. 
all other grafts are intact, right? So even if you, like I say, there is a very high failure rate of ACL reconstruction in the pediatric age group, even if this procedure fail, the knee is almost a virgin knee, you have all the ligaments, you can go back and do a reconstruction. These are the steps of the surgery. I think I'll just skip it. When you come to the next group, right? So you don't want to do a non-anatomic procedure when you have an anatomic choice, right? So you're going to do an all epiphyseal ACL reconstruction. That means I'm going to put my fixation. I'm going to make my tunnel through the epiphyses only not crossing neither the femoral physis or the tibial physis, right? So the tunnel is much higher and here it is much down, right? So this way you can protect your physis. The fixation device you can use suspensory on one side and you can use uh, interference on both sides or you can use suspensory on both sides. So fixation does not matter. The key principle is that you are not violating the physis. You are keeping your implants only in the epiphysis. This is the more easiest of the one that is to be managed. So you have a patient you find this is a pediatric patient, 14 saal ka ladka hai, 13 saal ki ladki hai, you will do a tanner's grading and mind you, this is the only group of patients where I actually have done a tanner's grading 5 or 6 times. It's not a very huge experience, but you will have to see these patients. So 4 or 5, you can actually treat them as an adult. So you can see that the tunnel is going through the tibial physis and it is also going through the femoral physis. The only trick is try to keep your tunnel a little bit more vertical, right? So if you keep the tunnel more vertical, naturally the physial damage that you're causing is less. And then you can use the fixation either like the one which has been used here, or you can use a metaphysial fixation. Last but not the least, I think a very interesting area of research which is coming up is prevention of ACL injuries. It is increasingly being recognized that young female athletes have almost eight times more chances of having an ACL injured while they are into an activity like uh, sports, especially football and other contact games, right? Why it is happening? Uh, people have started researching it. They have started identifying number of factors. There are hormonal factors, there are anatomic factors, and then there are uh, mechanical factors because of which uh, the neuromuscular control has been identified to be different in female athletes as compared to male athletes and therefore the current concept is that you should go for year-round training you need to do a proper warm-up you need to learn landing skills you need to improve the agility and last but not the least work on muscle strength and neuromuscular coordination especially if somebody is going to a level one or a level two sports activity so what are my key take-home messages? I think this is, I've directly picked up from a paper and this is the level of evidence, the grade of evidence that is there. Number one, the MRI should be done in all patients when you're suspecting an ACL injury. It has to be done early. A trial of non-operative treatment can be done, especially if, if the ACL is injured less than 50% or only the intromedial bundle is injured and the patient's age is less than 14 years for the males, young 13 to 12 in the females. If it is a complete ACL tear in 2023, the inset, you have to do a reconstruction. However, you need to know how to do that reconstruction. One thing I missed out, there is no rule. In India, honestly, we don't have allographs, right? So we are always dependent on autographs, so not very important for us. But in the Western literature, there's a wide use of allograph. And therefore, in the pediatric age group, don't use an allograph because allograph has much more higher failure rates. You're going to use an autograph. Physial sparing ACL reconstruction when the tanner stage is one or two. Transphysial ACL reconstruction for stages four and five. I would say four and five for me because for three, I will do physial sparing. And last but not the least, ACL injury prevention and neuromuscular training protocols must be used to prevent ACL injuries. Thank you. Question? Yes, one or two points. Yeah. yeah, please. First, I have experience on autoscopy. Most of the time, the internal medical ligament will come in between the fragment and the crater. So, yeah. you have to clear that uh, before the And also, and also in the late presenting or neglected ourselves cases, you have to deepen the crater to put the fragment into place. If the fragment is not put, put exactly into the place without deepening the crater, 
it may cause infringement during the extension. So you should take care of it. Next, there is another reconstruction called hybrid reconstruction. So SARS-CoV in panel three, I will do in between like this. Right. So hybrid means you will do transfacial in the tibia, tibia. and all infusion in the tibia. So like a SARS-CoV, you will have to go more vertical tunnel and more central areas. So the third point is there is a three or four fold increase in the graft re-rupture rates in pediatric age group and also, also contralateral age group. So in these cases, the graft choice also matters. So the, the recent papers are coming up with quadriceps or Right. Because in children, the quadriceps is having a high collagen content and the diameter of the graft is around more than eight centimeters. So it is, it is not, there is no grade A recommendation, but it is a moderate level recommendation. The quadriceps autograph may be better than hamstring autograph. And return to sports should be not less than nine months. Just, just a point where, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karthi. I think just adding on to that intermeniscal ligament thing, uh, when we were initially doing arthroscopy, we always thought that it is the intermeniscal ligament which is always there. But now, if you look at the more recent papers, it says it can, most of the time, it will be the intermeniscal ligament, but it can also be the medial meniscus and also the lateral meniscus, which can be the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus or the medial meniscus. And there is one paper which says that the medial meniscus is more common. So, yes. When you are trying to do it, you will have to take it out and only then you have to reduce it. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. uh, I do arthroscopy and I have experience of almost seven cases. Right. Uh, first of all, I was very happy to see the pull through technique, right. which you did. Yeah. And the message I've been giving surgical tidbits uh, more than the uh, this thing theoretical model. The screw thing which sir you have mentioned, so have you any experience of the screw backing out and after that you shifted it over to the full screw? No, I think I was initially trained in this technique uh, only although these are not my own photographs. I do it a bit differently. I put in these needles and then I pull in the suture from the intermedial portal and then take it. But I was never trained in doing the screw technique. I've always been using the cross uh, uh, Fiber wire sort of. Who should not be attempted. So right. My my uh, boss used to do that. The screw. First of all, it is. It looks very easy to put a screw through sure. the supravertebral area, but uh, it is one of the most difficult tasks to do. Right. And second yeah. thing is, it invariably backs out. The fragment breaks. It will back out, and you will have some issues. No. Your your comment should not be should not be done at all. This is what you are saying is true. I'm a great fan of this group. I've done more than 70 cases. I've done 26 what cases of PCO fixation. I have developed a different system. It's a more cancerous threat than the cortical threat. Okay. So don't say it is, it is not to be done. Preferably not to be done, you can say. That's what I'm saying. You may have a you may have not have a good experience with it, but I hardly have done pull through since I've developed that system. It's a five millimeter system with guide wire of 6.5 screws. And it is all threaded screws. So it doesn't break back out. And it has a water. Yeah. So the technique is modified. I think pull through has its own role where there is a combination. If there is a combination, you cannot use a screw. If there is a combination, you have to use a pull through system. Okay. If it is a one big chunk of uh, fragment, then you can use the screw with good hold. So I think we are moving from the domain of pediatric orthopedics to adult orthopedics yeah. and arthroscopy. So we bring this discussion to an yeah. end and then. I have done few in pediatric age group. I have done in older. I was not knowing how old fracture you can evolution you can fix. But up to eight weeks, I fix this pediatric old age group with the screws with good results. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker. Uh, there will be debate. Both bone leg fractures in children. Either we should convert, conserve them or operate them. And the speakers will be Dr. Saurabh Sena and Dr. Sitanshu Bari. So first of all, Dr. Saurabh Sena is coming. Uh, and uh, he is advocating the conservative. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. And I would like to thank all the organizers, Rayanulak sir and Pratik Vaira sir, for having me here. So my, uh, I will be speaking uh, for conservative management in uh, pediatric diaphyseal fractures in children. 
so i'll begin with the basic knowledge from the textbooks and then we'll build up on the discussion so it is one of the common uh, long bone fractures in children and with an annual incidence in one in 1000 children with a male uh, predominance and most common fracture uh, pattern being the spiral type of a fracture so almost 70% of these fractures are isolated tibial fractures and only 30% being associated with the uh, uh, associated fibular fracture and the most preferred treatment is uh, close reduction and casting so coming to the biomechanics the muscles which originate from the fibula and they insert on the uh, medial longitudinal arch like the tibialis posterior or the ehl these muscles are the de uh, deforming forces and when the fibula is intact as we can see in the first x ray here they turn to pull the uh, displace the fracture into a varus but when the fibula is also fractured the same muscle forces pull the fracture into a valgus uh, alignment then in the pediat uh, pediatric age group we have to be wary about the plastic deformation and the green stick fractures so we have to look for the plastic deformation and green stick injuries in the fibula because that will determine the molding which we need to do to reduce these fractures and to prevent uh, re displacements so the basics of the casting me casting method would be to have a uniform thin uh, cast padding a three point molding is very important so that the fracture alignment is well maintained so when you have a varus uh, fracture then you have to have a valgus mold and vice versa secondly to control the rotational alignment you have to have a 30 to 45 degrees of flexion at the knee and it also helps to keep the child non weight bearing thirdly uh, an apex posterior angulation is absolutely not uh, accepted so to control that 10 to 20 degrees of flexion at the ankle is also accepted lastly re uh, uh, loss of uh, alignment is very common in the first two, two to three weeks and the use of uh, recasting or cast wedging techniques is very important to have successful outcomes as exemplified here we have a valgus uh, redisplacement and with an open uh, cast wedging technique we are able to get back the alignment so uh, the acceptability criteria for younger children less than 8 years uh, it's uh, more relaxed so up to 10 degrees of uh, varus uh, alignment is accepted 10 degrees of apex anterior angulation is accepted and a shortening of up to 10, uh, 10 millimeters is accepted but more older children just 5 degrees of uh, angulations are accepted and apex posterior angulation is absolutely not accepted only up to 5 millimeters of shortening is accepted so what are the indications for this treatment so all non complicated tibial uh, injuries should be given uh, a casting uh, treatment the contraindications would be if you are unable to uh, achieve the alignment uh, in our primary reduction then obviously it's a straightforward uh, contraindication other contraindications are the open fractures presence of swelling or the risk of compartment syndrome and polydroma children and ch children with floating knees these these are uh, uh, relative and uh, contraindications to the use of uh, casting lastly children with the higher body weight usually more than 50 kg 50 kilograms or ob obesity or to some extent adolescents they are now being taken as relative contraindication but this is where i would like to build my discussion so what is the world doing when it comes to uh, uh, tibial fractures so i would like to uh, summarize it with the help of this meta analysis which was published uh, in the european journal of pediatric surgery in 2020 so they took 1118 1108 fractures out of which 75% of these were treated with casting 24% of uh, loss of uh, fracture reduction was seen so that's a very high number but with remanipulation and use of wedging of the cast a large number of patients were able to achieve a satisfactory alignment and at the end just 5% of the patients had to had a treatment failure with respect to a uh, casting and they were managed with operative methods when analyzed further when they looked at the displaced fracture group, the patients who had a displaced fracture to begin with, there we saw that the uh, percentage of casting reduced. 
so the the people were more trend, uh, uh, trended to go for operative treatment secondly again when we looked at the age comparing between the operator the flexible nails and the casting groups we saw that the nailing group had a higher uh, age mainly adolescents and the uh, casting group had a lower mean age that is the smaller children so again there was a bias towards operating older children thirdly when we looked at the presence of a fibular fracture that is a fracture was present or it was an uh, intact fibula we found that when the there was an associated fibular fracture again people avoided casting 50% only whereas when the fibula was intact 80% of the patients were managed with a cast again loss of alignment in the presence of fibular fracture 38% versus just 21% so taking these three factors we'll just see what further evidence we have so i wanted to i explored the literature i wanted to see what the what is the effect of weight and age with respect to the treatment of uh, tibial uh, fractures and i found this paper by rivera et al luckily we still have contemporary literature on casting this paper came out in jpo in 2023 itself to help me so in this paper they uh, compared esin versus the casting group both the in adolescents so both the age uh, age groups were adolescents they were comparable both the groups had weight more than 50 kg so again they were comparable so out of the uh, 141 cases here what i would like to point out is that there is no difference with respect to malunion in between the two groups secondly when we see look at the radiological healing the healing in the casting group is at a faster rate compared to the tibial nailing group we see that by 6 months 95% of the fractures have have a three quarter radial radiological union whereas only 77% in the nailing group had a three quarter three quarter union also when we look at the time lag they have reported that this, there was a 7 weeks longer time duration in the nailing group for radiological healing and finally when we looked at the time to uh, full weight bearing that it was the difference was only one week so the casting group took one week longer to have full weight bearing compared to the nailing group then i uh, proceeded to look at the effect of fracture displacement and fibular fracture how this impacted the treatment so i found this paper by kinney et al and this was also a retrospective review and in this there were 57 patients who underwent uh, close reduction in casting again this was in the adolescent age group and this in the adolescent age group we found that there was a very high uh, failure rate with respect to loss of alignment so it's 40 up to 40% so they did a multivariate analysis to look at the risk factors that were associated with uh re displacement of uh, fractures and they found out two factors the first one was fracture displacement on, as seen on a lateral x ray and they noted that if the displacement was more than 20% the odds ratio of having a re displacement was 6.9 secondly if the fibula was also fractured then again having a loss of reduction was and with an odds of 5.5 then coming to another paper here we looked at 137 cases with a mean of 10.2 years here again we had a similar uh, loss of, uh, loss of alignment of 21% here again we see as in the meta analysis that when cast wedging and remanipulation was used a lot of these reductions could be salvaged and at the end yet again only 5% to failure rate is present and only two patients had a malunion which needed further treatment uh again in the same paper in the patients who had a weight of more than 50 kg the loss of reduction was no more than the mean itself that was 21% and this only 20% so there is no increased loss of uh, fracture uh, alignment 
so with this uh, i have a very short message to give that is most of the uncomplicated tibial fractures should be and could be managed with reduction in casting but we have to have a very good evaluation of the risk factors we have to be careful when we are using this treatment in our sense in the presence of a fibular fracture and when the initial displacement is larger there is a high chance of loss of alignment 24 to 40% as already evidence but with close weekly follow up these can be picked up on time and can be managed with open wedge the casting or if there is a higher loss of uh, alignment we can remanipulate these fractures into a better alignment casts lastly with careful treatment we can have as much as 70 95% success rate with this treatment and therefore i would like to, uh, to conclude by saying that the casting even in adolescents and in children who are heavier can be taken care of by this method thank you thank you dr sora so now i call dr sikanshu Uh, he will be speaking uh, uh, regarding operative treatment of both bone leg fractures. Actually, Saurav has made my work easier now. He has told what are the indications for uh, conservative management. What are the contraindications? What are the contraindications and the indications for operative treatment? There is nothing, no controversy in that. And he told four factors: age, weight, initial displacement, fibular fracture. These four factors, same factors, will decide whether you go for conservative treatment or operative treatment. So we'll be seeing what are the indications and what are the options for surgery. Pulse examination, high index of suspicion to rule out child abuse, multiple fractures, metaphyseal corner fractures should be seen. Other uh, syndromic and metabolic causes should be ruled out because tibia is one of the common sites for bowing and uh, fracture. And open fracture, innocuously looking open fracture might have severe internal leg loving and severe internal injury, so that should be kept in mind. And friction bones fall from bike are common, therefore should be. Manage appropriately. Growth perspective briefly: the tibia grows around six mm per year, approximately uh, with five mm per year distally. And the typical pattern of fascia closure is that for the tibial epiphysis, and posterior to anterior for the tibial epiphysis, the tuberosity is proximal to distal. Remodeling guidelines: as the age is less, more remodeling is possible, as we all know. In the plane of joint motion, metaphyseal fractures they commonly remodel better because they are closer to the physis. Rotation. Less correction, overgrowth, not as predictable as femur. Reduction, he has already mentioned. Eight years is the cutoff. More than eight years, your uh, coronal angulation, the uh, accessibility reduces. When to operate? Absolute indications. When there is inability to maintain the accessible reduction, open injuries, suspected impending compartment syndrome, and polytrauma. Relative indications: multiple long bone fractures, floating knee, that is lateral femur fracture. Associated with spasticity like a CP child or a head injury child and manipulation of bleeding disorders. This is the patient in which you are reporting me. So, ideal for management with a uh, operative management for better care and as well as uh, better rehabilitation. Operative options they can be pinning and casting, external fixation, flexible nailing, a plate or a rigid nail. Pinning and casting more commonly for distant metaphyseal fractures, proximal metaphyseal fractures usually they heal even if there is a valgus because of poison standing. They recover with the growth and it is rarely needed in the proximal fractures. External fixation it is uh, you can use for both open and closed for a length unstable fractures you can use it and and with polytrauma and open injury cases and they can be converted to cast once the wounds are healed and once you are sure callus is forming they can be converted four to six weeks. Flexible lanes for open and closed, same indications as in femur, length stable, length stable fractures, age less than 10 years, lesser weight child, weight bearing may be allowed at three weeks depending on how much callus formation is there. Initial protection with the cast can be given and removal around 9 to 12 months can be planned. Weight osteosynthesis is also for a length and stable fractures and uh, you can either go for anterior medial with a minimal invasive technique, anterior lateral you can use open technique, but they have their own uh, complications, own complication chances, and increased OR duration for the child. Rigid nailing for closed physis and early wet bearing can be done. So summary is, as Saurav said, the indications for operative and non-operative both are clear. Age of the child, weight of the child, fibular fracture, 
displacement. These four factors will help you guiding. So if your four factors positive, it will go more in terms of your operative treatment. If you have two factors, so basically then it comes to a surgeon uh, decision making, surgeon's choice. But all yeah. suppose it has a fracture displacement more than fifty percent. You have a fibular fracture. Age of the child is more than 10, 10 years. Weight of the child is more than fifty kgs. Go for X fix or go for a uh, submuscular plating, depending on your choice. So operative intervention rarely needed. Hardly as sort of said, 98 percent go well with conservative management. Hardly five percent needed. There are clear indications, so there is no room for confusion and debate. And the external fixation and flexible and common options for uh, surgical management. And rare cases, plate and rigid nail can be used. Thank you. Uh, anybody having any question? Regarding the both like fractures treatment, whether to go for conservative or operative. I think both of you teamed up initially only, right? Both of you are from the same institute. Uh, absolute, absolutely decides. zero, sir. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's an zero. absolute zero. Both of you decided it was <laughs> only Bolna Paya Bolna, right? So I think wonderful this thing harmony between the two speakers. The only thing which I think very interesting is the uh, uh, wedging of the cast, right? So can you just tell us a bit of the tips and tricks because it's quite difficult to do, right? Yes. Based on the x-ray and where you want to make the cut, whether it is going to be open with or yes. closed with. And I would also want the senior people to some, uh, give some opinion about cast wedging. So when we uh, think of doing a wedging, the level of the cut that we make in the cast is at the level of the fracture side. Now, how much of the uh, wedge we need to open up? It is determined with the uh, post reduction x ray. And we uh, look at the angulation at the fracture site. And in the orthogonal plane, we have to make the cut and uh, do a correction based on the measurement from the x ray. Thirdly, a closing wedge in the cast is absolutely not recommended these days. And only an open wedge, uh, wedging of the cast is recommended because we don't want to impinge on the soft tissues and uh, cause further problems for the patient. And when we do an open wedge correction of the cast, we also gain length of the bone. So any uh, collapse of the fracture also uh, is improved. So these are the things. And also, uh, even though AO promotes all types of fixations in so many types of fractures, when you go to the AO's website and the guidelines, they have a section where they have shown how you have to do a cast wedge. You have a two plane some degree of coronal plane deformity and some degree of sagittal plane deformity. So how do you plan your open wedge? So it's uh, absolutely similar to how we, we do a surgical planning. We have to uh, uh, get the oblique plane, trace out in which oblique plane the deformity is occurring and the wedge has to be opened in that plane. One more uh, additional comment regarding this. So uh, right now there are available blocks similar to what you do for your HDO, yes. there are blocks available for performing your open wedge uh, with you. Yes. So you can initially make out the plan, but ideally it will be good if you take the patient to the OR under a CR image intensifier, no anesthesia, CR image intensifier, you make the cut, you can then wedge, yes. fit in the wedge, have a look at the alignment. If you have gained the alignment that you are looking for, you just wrap around another class. The wedges are now available, ready made. Wedges are wedges also provide extra stability. Yes, exactly. Putting so, in between the blocks. Block. So that put a block. That are keeping the cast distracted. Yeah. And then you wrap around it further uh, in the bandage over that cast. Okay. You think your wedge to calculate the apex. Yes. Wherever is the apex, that should be the open wedge. Yes. Whichever area. And the, and the degree you want to correct, suppose you want to correct 10 degrees, you take 10 millimeters. And uh, we used to use, we don't have the value, but uh, we used to use the wooden uh, sticks, yes. and we used to pack them in different uh, uh, lengths and diameter. Wood, wood is taken because it will prevent it from collapsing the plaster. You have to cut it half circle, otherwise, it will not break. So, to do a half circle, cut it, open it. If you are taking, generally you don't have the image facility in the OP, but if you have uh, uh, image facility, then you can check out the image facility, put a wedge and complete it. And it's a very good technique actually when you're taking 
We are we are getting lazy. That is why you have ready-made block operations. You can very well prepare it with a plastered POP bandage also. Or same bit, and you can make it to your liking. You don't have to wait that somebody is going to bring that block. Isn't it? And you can correct the wedge wedges. You can make one into layer and put to layer. Okay. Make an open wedge as well. Yes. Doctor, we are asking to plan deformities. You have all the flexibilities of bringing it and go like this, of making it into medial and then opening it that way. You are opening anterior more medial less. So that comes with the experience. Close wedge, as he has said, is not in use. See, if you consider, I always consider it a wedging is like a putting a hinge in the zero. Yes. So, in the zero, then we do those who are doing like the base and the and those who are doing the zero, they must be knowing that how to correct the OB trend deformities. So finding out the angle in between and that putting a hinge at that point. So, similarly, the wedging is also that much important and it's a very good technique. One more I would like to, one more, sorry. One more point, sir. Yes, one more point I would like to add that uh, those reduction and casting you have shown in some studies that yes, uh, later on revision is required 40% or some of yes. redo is required or some degree is required. Redisplacement. Redisplacement is very yes. 40%. Yes. So the cast, the principle of casting is that when you primarily cast it, you have to keep the patient under observation. Yes. See for displacement. And if you find there is displacement, you correct either by wedge correction or by redoing the cast. Yes. That is why I am saying we are getting this. Onto a PTD cast, right? So, because the normal protocol has initially given long like yes. cast, yes. then at six weeks or something. So, what are the things that you're looking at when you convert it into a PTD? Uh, when we, uh, there are two things we look for. One is the duration itself, it has to be at least four weeks. So, four to six weeks is the duration. Secondly, we look for signs of initial radiological union. So, if there's a bridging callus that has started to form, then we can definitely go for a PTB. And secondly, the location of the fracture. So if it's a proximal third fracture, then PTB is not a very suitable uh, uh, method. But mid diaphyseal and uh, distal third fracture, which are, which are more common, definitely PTB has a very good role uh, beyond four to six weeks uh, because it helps in compression and it is uh, helps in ambulation for the patient. Thank you, Dr. Saurav, Dr. Sitanshu. So next, I would like to call Dr. Karthi uh, for his speech on pediatric foot and ankle fractures. So after a good discussion on tibial shaft fracture management, we are coming on to the last picture of the day, that is pediatric ankle and foot injuries, how they are different from adults. So the learning objectives of the talk here, ankle physical injury classification and how we evaluate these cases. What are the imaging modalities that is required to diagnose and plan for treatment? So what are the tre general treatment principles when you will do conservative medical management and when you will go for surgical management? So what are transitional fractures? Tilox fracture and triplane fractures I will touch upon. And finally, I will touch upon pediatric talus and calcium. So what is a pediatric ankle? So it ranges from distal end of the tibia and fibula from metaphysis to the epiphyseal region. It covers the pediatric ankle region. So it is the most common facial injury in the lower limb. Overall, distal end radius is the most common facial injury in our body. But in the lower limb, ankle fracture is the most common facial injury. So the peak incidence is between 8 to 15 years of age. Boys are more involved than the girls because of more sports participation. In children, the collateral ligaments attached below the level of physis are stronger compared to the physis. So the, phys the weak physis link causes the physis injury rather than the strong collateral ligaments. So it may lead on to premature physis closure in 30 to 40 percent of the cases. The parents should be counseled for them. So you should also, also know what are the fracture mimics. So there can be all, all sub tibiale or sub fibulare or it is like a Poland scum or cum scum that is the starting of the asymmetric physical closure that person on the anteromedial aspect. So whenever you are having a doubt, you take x-ray of the opposite side to compare whether it is a fracture or it is a fracture mimics. So Salter Harris classification is a wonderful guide to help in managing, to plan the management. So yeah, as we all know type 1 is a trans facial separation, trans type 2 is a metaphysical fragment, is physical injury, that is the thruster follow fragment. Type 3 and type 4 are intra articular fractures because the, the fracture line extending into the epiphysis. 
and type 5 is a crush injury. So Mercer Rang described a type 6 injury, that is a pericondral injury, and type 7, that is described by Ogden et al. So that is an avulsion fracture of the intrafacial region. So this is more uh, is specifically seen in the ankle injuries, whether it's an avulsion of medial myelus or lateral myelus, it is very specifically seen in the ankle injuries. So another classification that is similar to large class, large handsome classification in adults, that is Deos and Taxan classification. Here, the most common type is supination inversion. In adults, the supination and external rotation is the most common injury, but in children, it is a supination inversion injury. Whether you have Salter Harris type 1 in the uh, fibula physio level or Salter Harris type 2, type 3, or something like that in the vertical, more of a medical fracture pattern in the medial mandibles. So, in the pronation and external rotation injury, you will have a type 2 salt Harris with a lateral fragment in the coronal, in the coronal plane. In the tip, distal tibia, in the supination plantar flexion, you will have a again type 2 salt harris with the metaphyseal fragment in the posterior metaphyseal region. In supination external rotation, it is a spiral fracture that's run along the distal tibia metaphysis. So, how will you do clinical evaluation? As a routine, you will look for the skin swelling. You have to take the history because what is the position of the foot at the time? If the parents are able to tell what is the position of foot at the time of injury, what is the direction of force, it will help in the mechanism of injury. So you should look for swelling, ecchymosis or open fractures. And as I told, compartment syndrome, although it is rare compared to adults, so you should look for three A's. Sometimes the displaced fragment may compress the deep peroneal nerve, may cause extensor retinoglum syndrome, causing weakness in the two extensors or the numbness in the first web space. So the ankle sp sprains or diagnosis of exclusion in children less than 10, 10 years should be differentiated from the subtle physical injury because physis is the weaker link. So imaging modalities, you have to get a ankle trauma series, AP, mortis is very, very important and lateral use. So one should know what is Ottawa ankle rules. The child is not able to put bear weight and not able to walk four steps. Otherwise, the patient is having any tenderness in the medial or lateral medial steps. Then it mandates the need for taking an X-ray. So in the radiographic appearance, you have to look for tibial incisora, tibial clear space, medial clear space, because the medial clear space may be up to 6 to 8 mm in children. So always you compare with the opposite side. Because more than 4 mm is abnormal in adults, but in children it can be up to 6 to 8 mm. So the CT scan, so in pediatric ankle fractures, especially in the adolescent age group, transitional fractures or triplant fractures, you should have a low threshold for getting CT. MRI has only limited role. You have to look at the, if there is a doubtful physical injury, or if you want to look at any ligaments if you want to see, or any osteochondral fragments, only in that, those cases you can have a role for MRI. So what are the treat, general treatment principles? The main goal is the alignment, physical reduction and alignment, and the articular congruity. So the un undisplaced fractures or displaced fractures after close reduction can be managed very well with conservative treatment. Intraarticular fractures, articular step or displacement less than 2 mm, 2 cm, 2 mm is acceptable. If it is more than 2 mm, you have to reduce and fix it. So we are fond of using orthogram pediatric orthopedic surgeons. So sometimes you can do close reduction and can confirm the articular congruity by using orthogram itself. If you are not used to orthogram, you can go for mini open incision and so you have to look up the joint congruity. That is very, very important. The joint should be reduced. So coming on to salt Harris type 1 injuries, it is forms 15% of all distal tibial physical injuries. Once you reduce, if it is stable, you can apply directly cast. If it is unstable, you can fix with smooth cavers. So salt Harris type 2 injuries, this is a very common injury, forms 32, 32 for 50% of 58% of injuries. If the post reduction gap is more than 3 mm, there is a high rates of premature physical process. So this is very important. And in follow-up, about 40% might have premature physical process. So the parents should be counseled for the same. So type 3 and type 4, as I already told, it is an intra-articular fracture because it's a fracture line passing through the epiphysis into the joint. So either using uh, orthogram assisted or mini open technique, you have to reduce and fix it. So this slide is very, very important because you should know the sequence of distal tibial phase closer. <laughs> So the physio closure starts from the anteromedial aspect, it goes to the medial, then it goes to the posterior aspect, last is the anterolateral aspect, is the last one to close. So that's why you will get the tilox fracture, because anterolateral aspect of the tibia is the last one to close. So what are transitional fractures? Because the injury occurring to the transition from a child to adolescent age group, due to the asymmetric closure of the distal tibial phases. So tilox fracture is an Intraarticular fracture, it is actually an avulsion of the antero inferior tibiofibular ligament. Triplant fractures, it can be either extraarticular or intraarticular. The mechanism here is the supination and external rotation. So, juvenile tilox fracture, actually, uh, this is a Paul Tilox from France. 
he described his fracture but in the initial he didn't describe whether it is, he was describing the adult or pediatrics because there is no mention on the original paper so that's why some people used to call it as a juvenile tear off fracture so as i already told it is an avulsion fracture of the anterolateral tibial tibial epiphysis due to the avulsion of antero inferior tibio fibular ligament it is a biplane injury this also has a type 3 injury so sometimes you may miss this injury in the standard ap view so mortis view is very very useful otherwise ct scan if required sometimes if you are doubt suspect you should have a low threshold to take for ct scan so if it is the articular step is less than 2 mm you can manage conservatively with bilony cast if it is a displaced fracture you have to fix it the reduction can be joystick assisted or mini open again or orthogonal assisted so the most important thing is the direction of the screw because you have to put screw in the lateral to medial direction and also in the sagittal plane from the anterior to posterior direction so the ct scan will help very much helpful in identifying the plane of the fracture line that can very much help in planning the direction of the screw also if you if you put screw perpendicular to the fracture line you will get a good compression outcomes are usually very good so what are triplane fractures because the fracture line passing through the three different planes that is why it is called triplane fractures so you can see the ct scan here in the epiphyseal fracture is in the coronal section that is in the a figure the metaphyseal fracture is in the sagittal plane that is c and d and transverse plane through the physis so the fracture line passing through the three planes that's why it's called triplane fracture it can be two part triplane three part triplane or four part triplane so most of these fractures are intraarticular fractures so you have to take ct scan and you have to plan surgery accordingly you have to look at the fracture pattern and most of the time it needs open reduction or orthogonal assisted reduction because all intraarticular fractures you need to achieve the articular congruity or gap less than 2 mm this is a two part triplane fractures it can be lateral or medial lateral is the most common and a coronal fragment in the posterior lateral aspect is the most common type this is a three part and another one is a four part fractures in all these fractures ct scan is mandatory and you should have a less threshold to take a ct scan for planning So the primary aim is again restore the articular congruity with no step or gap that is less than two mm. The factors that need to be evaluated in assessment are whether the fracture is intraarticular or extraarticular. Tilak fracture is always intraarticular, but in triplane it can be intraarticular or extraarticular. So what is the article? If it is intraarticular, what is the articular step? Of? So this is a 13 year old boy having triplane fractures. We did a CT and the fracture gap is more than three mm. So you go for open reduction. by using screws that is one intra that is only the intra epiphyseal screw and another is the metaphyseal screw without crossing or damaging the phases so this is a treatment algorithm proposed by dr vengradas et al from gaga hospital so you have to take x ray all trauma series of x ray if you are having any fracture seen then you have to classify according to the salter harris so salter harris type 1 and type 2 if it is undisplaced or stable fix stable after close reduction you can manage conservatively with the bilony cast if it is unstable after close reduction you can put smooth cavers If it is a type three and type four, it is an again intraarticular fractures. So you again, the articular congruity is important. So if the gap is less than two mm, you can manage conservatively. If it is more than two mm, you have to fix it. So the transitional fractures, you have to go for CT scan. Again, the articular fracture, articular space is less than two mm. You go for conservative management. If it is more than two mm, you have to go for fixation, surgical fixation. So next, I am coming on to the pediatric talus fracture. Pediatric talus and calcaneal fractures are very rare compared to adults. The incidence is zero point zero eight to zero point. one something like that the mechanism is axial load on dorsiflex foot pediatric neck fracture is the most common so av as as similar to adults av is the most common complication following a pediatric neck fractures and displaced fractures you can apply cast mobilization from 6 to 8 weeks displaced fractures needs fixes this this is a case of a 12 year old boy having talus and medial malus fracture so this is actually a fracture of uh, talar neck along with the body fracture so this is a soft tissue condition because in foot and ankle injuries the soft tissue condition is very very important to plan for surgical intervention so we go for dual approach antero medial and antero lateral approach so this is a ct scan you can see some fracture seen on the antero lateral and anterior aspect of the anterior lip of the distal tibia also so we fixed using uh, tension band wiring for medial malus and uh, herbert screw for Talus fracture through antero lateral and antero medial fractures. And since the medial malleus is already fractured, it makes our job very easier. So this is a follow after one and a half years. Uh, can anyone tell what is Hawkins sign? Any resident from the group? Any junior resident can tell what is a Hawkins sign? Bonus? Ah? 
So what it signifies? Is avian its source avian? No. So again, you are right. It is a radio latency on the subcondral bone. If the sign is present, it is a good sign. It shows that the vascular is established. It is not avian. If there is a radio dense, then it is a avian. Okay. Akin sign shows that the blood flow is intact. Radio latency on the subcondral region. It shows that the blood flow is intact. It's not avian. So coming on to the pediatric calculating factors, it is also rare compared to the others. It is 0.05%. So the, most of the time it is a fall from height. So you have to rule out the spine injury also. Most of the time it can be bilateral calculating factor to spine injury. So you must rule out spine injuries. So why it is very less because of the large cartilaginous component, it may be resilient to trauma. If it is a more osseous, it may get fractured. If it is more cartilaginous, it may get less injury. So again, clinical evaluation, you have to look at the soft tissue condition. What is the compliant? And you have to roll out spine injuries, open fractures, blisters, swelling, something like that. And this is a case example of 13 year old boy having a depressed calcaneum fractures, intraarticular depressed calcaneum fractures. You have to draw the angle of Gizane and Bowler's angle. Okay. So this is altered here. So you have to elevate the posterior facet to bring back the angle of Gizane and Bowler's angle because it is an intraarticular displaced calcaneum fracture. So most of the time you can achieve using percutaneous methods. There is no need to do extensive lateral approach. So you had done extreme percutaneous approach, sinus truss approach, you can use that. And if you fix with KOS, this is a follow-up very excellent outcome. And you can look at the axial view. There is no heel, valgus or varus. But some cases may go into subtalar orthosis later on. That is not in our hand. This is another case of... You can fix the sustentacolon tail fracture, the sustentacolon tail fragment, and the maintain the bowler center by elevating the posterior facet. So most of the time you can achieve using minimally invasive surgical approach. There is no need for extensile approach in pediatric cases. <coughs> so most of the calcaline structures can be managed non-operative by four to six weeks of baloney cast. Only the displaced intraarticular calcaneal fractures in the adolescent age group needs some fixation. So take home messages, pediatric ankle fractures are common and Salter Harris classification is a very good system to guide the management. Transitional fractures form separate groups in the adolescent group because due to the asymmetrical closure of the physis. So you should have a less threshold to get the CT scan, articular congruity and radius and the displacement should be less than 2 mm is the goal. Premature physis closure can occur up to 40% and parents should be counseled for the same. Pediatric talus and calcaneal fractures are rare compared to adults and most can be managed conservatively using the cast and non weight bearing protocol. Thank you. Any questions? All injuries around the ankle joint. Excellent presentation, Dr. Karthik. Any question from the audience? Uh, Dr. Karthik, uh, I have one query <coughs> that uh, regarding the ankle injuries, if uh, suppose you are, there is no uh, as such quick uh, fracture of this on the ankle. X-ray. So, what you suggest uh, is X-ray okay with you, or depending on the clinical scenario, you go for higher imaging in one instant, like Sir, uh, just after X-ray, go for CT or. No, I yeah, always correlated uh, radiology with clinical findings. Okay. So, if there's any tenderness, swelling, and in X-ray, if I'm not able to find anything abnormal, yeah. I will uh, go for CT scan. Okay. Look, look at some of the various tenderness. And what, what are the possible indications of MRI in X-ray? Uh, that's what I'm telling you. Sir. Sometimes you will have undisplaced physical injuries, undisplaced physical injuries yeah. that can be picked up with the MRI, and sometimes osteochondral fragments. So, uh, in case of the undisplaced physical injury, what are those patients? How you suspect actually just for the residents and all those? So, I have seen one patient. They suspect uh, hmm. there is a uh, physical injury. I have seen one patient of uh, salt Harris type one in distal fibula fracture. It was undisplaced. So it has tenderness directly over, just above one centimeter above the tip of uh, yeah. lateral malleus, there was a tenderness. Clinically, it was a very suspicious fracture, but x ray is normal. So I suspect salt is type 1 fracture injury. So I went so for a. Because it a diacent axial classification, if we go by that, so in then uh, facial injuries, no doubt, that occur in distal uh, fibula. So for every case, you go for MRI or just x ray is more than enough in that case. So not for every case, it's just not recommended. Yeah, yeah. Not for every case. Yeah. 
if uh, required clinically, if required, it can go for it. Otherwise, you can just immobilize with the. So you should clinically call it. Where is the tenderness? If I am telling if it's a distal fibula, so it may be salt rise type one, you can manage conservative. Yeah, but yeah. if it is the anterior joint line tenderness or it is the anterior aspect of the distal tibia, then you have to go for further intervention. It can be osteochondral fragment or it can be again uh, aversion like pillow fracture or something like that. But in that case, you go for CT first. CT first. And then if required, then go for MRI. Yes. MRI has limited role. Exactly. And uh, do you have any experience about the ligament injuries with periodic population around the ankle joint? Because the literature uh, says no doubt it's... Uh, so in adolescence, yeah, not less than 10 years of age, but sometimes in around 13 years or 14 years, uh, I do as have... We, as we speak about the transition fractures in yeah, that age group. Yeah, yeah. So, so at that age group I had, but I don't go for MRI, just I embrace with the cast, uh, it heals. For how much duration? Uh, means if you are three weeks. Ligament injury. Three weeks. Three weeks and then mobilize. Yeah. Weight clearing or just... So three weeks, uh, if I applied a uh, lightweight cast, I will start weight bearing after five days. So in uh, one, of my, one or two patients of mine, basically, when the parents are not poor, then I have noticed that even after the removal of the cast, then the patient do have some pain during walking. So now what I started doing, maybe because of corporate factors or what you can say, that uh, now after three weeks of class, I move into the air mood. Oh, yeah. And then continue with two to three weeks with the air mood, and when the child is comfortable, then continue with that. I think uh, MRI has a role in uh, isolated fibula fractures, the uh, distal ones, uh, where you are suspecting a deltoid ligament injury because uh, the bone has bone on the median side has not uh, given way, so there are more chances of a ligament injury on the medial side in isolated fibula fractures. So what I do is to do a stress test and see you can get an X-ray also. Uh, if put in uh, uh, under the influence of gravity and take a uh, x-ray and see how much opening is there on the medial side and if that is indicative of a ligament injury then yeah the, in that case you will have a medial tenderness also yeah so clinically if there isn't then i will correlate so always clinical correlation if, if you doubt x-ray is normal then you go for further any other questions are there any other questions I think we should wrap up this session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, now, thank you, Chairperson, sir. Uh, now I call Dr. Sanjay Gupta, sir. Please felicitate our speaker of this last session. So I will call to Dr. Rehano Lagbos to take a memento. Thank you, sir. Now there is call for Dr. Saurabh Sina. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now the last test. Uh, part of this session, so uh, I call to Dr. Anurag to give the nitty-gritty of the MS and BMP examinations to show uh, all the faculties, all the delegates will moderate this session. All the faculty will be moderated. I want to request the postgraduate students because this is meant primarily for you. Please come to the front and be active in this session. Dr. Anurag, Dr. Anurag has prepared very painstakingly the common scenarios which you are going to get in your exam. What's the problem?